Wispy Tales presents Lord of the Mysteries 2, Circle of Inevitability. Written by Cuttlefish That Loves Diving. Translated by C.K. Talone. Synthesized by Wispy Tales. Chapter 1 Foreigners A price is always exacted for what fate bestows, adapted from Zweig's Mary Queen of Scots. I'm a nobody, with no time to notice the brightness of the sun. My parents couldn't help me, and I wasn't highly educated. I had no choice but to make it on my own in the city. I'd applied to many jobs, but no one ever hired me. Maybe it's because I'm not good at expressing myself, and I'm not the best communicator. I guess I just haven't shown enough ability. Once, I'd eaten two loaves of bread over a three-day period. Hunger kept me up at night. At least I paid a month's rent in advance, so I didn't have to face the cold winter wind outside. Finally, I found a job at the hospital's morgue, keeping vigil over the dead. Nighttime in the hospital was colder than I could have ever imagined. The corridor's wall lights were out, leaving everything shrouded in darkness. I could barely see my feet, and the only light seeping out was from the rooms. Mon Dieu, it reeked of something fierce. The smell of death lingered in the air. And from time to time, we had to help move the bodies into the morgue. It wasn't the most glamorous of jobs, but it put bread on the table. Plus, the free time at night allowed me to study. Few people ventured to the morgue, but when they did, they were there delivering bodies or taking them away for cremation. I had to make do without books, as I couldn't afford them, nor did I see any hope of saving up enough for them. But I had to thank my predecessor for leaving so suddenly, as it allowed me to get this job. I dreamed of working the day shift. Sleeping during the day and being awake at night made my body weak and my head throb. One day, a new corpse was brought in. From what I'd heard, it's the body of my predecessor who suddenly left. I was intrigued by the mysterious disappearance of my predecessor, and as soon as the others left the room, I pulled out the cabinet and quietly opened the body back. He was an old man, with bluish-white skin and wrinkles covering his face. The poor lighting only served to make him look scarier. He didn't have much hair. Most of it was white. He had been stripped of his clothes, not even a piece of cloth was left on him. As a dead man without a family, the movers couldn't resist the opportunity to cash in on the guy. I saw a strange mark on his chest. It was bluish black. I can't really explain it. The light was too dim at the time. I reached out and touched the mark, only to realize there was nothing special about it. Looking at my predecessor, I couldn't help but wonder if I'd end up like him when I grew old. I promised his body I'd be with him on his last journey take him to the crematorium and then to the nearest free cemetery. I couldn't have the bureaucrats throwing him in the river or some forsaken land like trash. I knew I was gonna ave to sacrifice some shut-eye, but Dieu merci it was Sunday the next day. I could catch up on my lost sleep then. After saying that, I zipped up the bag and shoved it back in the cabinet. The room went darker and the shadows lengthened. Since that day, every time I close my eyes, I'm swallowed by a thick fog. Something tells me I'm not alone. Something not quite human is coming my way. But nobody will listen. They think I've lost my mind in this job, they say I need a doctor. A male customer sitting at the bar looked at the narrator who had suddenly stopped and asked, and the narrator suddenly stopped his tail, causing a male customer at the bar to take notice. This mid-thirties chap sported a drab duffel coat and pale yellow strides. His hair was slicked back, and he had a rough dark bowler hat by his side. He seemed run-of-the-mill, like the rest of the punters in the alehouse, with dark locks and piercing blue peepers. Not particularly handsome, but not repugnant either. Nothing about him screamed for attention. The narrator was a strapping lad in his late teens, with long limbs and chiseled features that could make any lass go weak in the knees. His short, jet black hair and bright, blue eyes only added to his appeal. The lad looked wistfully at the empty wine glass in front of him and let out a deep sigh. And then? 
Then I quit my job and returned to the countryside so that I can tell you this bullshit, the lad responded with a sly grin spreading across his face. The male guest was taken aback. Were you just pulling our leg? Ha ha. Laughter erupted around the bar. However, the laughter was short-lived as a middle-aged man looked sternly at the slightly embarrassed customer and remarked, You ain't from around here, are ya? Lumian spins a different yarn every day. Yesterday, he was a penniless bloke who got dumped by his fiancée, and today, he's a watchman for the dead. Aye, he talks about spending 30 years east of the Serenzo River and then 30 years to the right of it. He's full of hot air, that one, added another regular at the tavern. All the men were farmers from the village of Cordu, wearing drab-colored tunics. The black-haired lad, Lumian, leaned forward on the bar counter and rose to his feet. He flashed a cheeky grin and proclaimed, As you all know, I ain't the one making this up. My sister pens these tales. She's a writer for some column known as Novel Weekly or Other. With that, Lumian turned around, spread his arms wide, and beamed at the foreign customer. Looks like she's crafted quite the tale. I'm sorry you misunderstood. The unremarkable man in the brown tweed shirt smiled and stood up. What an intriguing story. And how might I address you? Isn't it common courtesy to introduce oneself before inquiring of others? Lumian replied, returning the man's smile. The foreigner nodded. My name is Ryan Koss. These are my companions, Valentine and Leah. The last sentence referred to the man and woman sitting beside him. Valentine, a man in his late twenties with powdered blonde hair and piercing blue eyes, wore a white vest, a blue tweed jacket, and black trousers. It was evident that he had put considerable effort into his attire, as if he had been priming himself for a special rendezvous. He had a rather chilly look on his face, not even sparing a glance for the farmers and herders around him. Leah, on the other hand, was a striking young woman with long, light gray hair tied into an elaborate bun and a white veil perched atop her head. Her eyes matched her hair and she regarded Lumian with an open smile, clearly amused by their exchange. In the glow of the gas lamps inside the tavern, the woman named Leah showed off her sharp nose and stunningly curved lips. She was definitely a stunner in the countryside like Cordu. She wore a snug white pleated cashmere dress with a small off-white coat and a pair of Marcelin boots. There were two tiny silver bells fastened to her veil and boots. They jingled as she walked into the tavern, drawing the attention of many, especially the men. In their eyes, this was the kind of fashionable getup you'd only see in the big cities, like the provincial capital of Bigor or even the capital city of Trier. Lumian gave a nod of acknowledgement to the three foreigners. The name's Lumian Lee. You may address me as Lumian. Lee? Leah blurted out. What's the matter? Y'all got a problem with my last name? Lumian asked with a curious look on his face. Ryan Koss took it upon himself to explain on Leah's behalf, your last name is downright frightening. I nearly lost control of my voice just now. Observing the bewildered expressions of the farmers and herdsmen around him, he continued, Folks who have crossed paths with sailors and sea merchants are familiar with a saying that's making the rounds in the five seas. I'd rather come face to face with pirate admirals or even kings than run into a bloke named Frank Lee. That person's last name is also Lee. Is he really that scary? Lumian inquired. Ryan shook his head in response. I'm not exactly sure but if such a legend exists, then it can't be far from the truth. He switched topics and said to Lumian, Merci for the story. It merits a drink. What do you desire? A glass of La Favert. Lumian didn't beat around the bush and settled back into his seat. Ryan Koss furrowed his brow. La Favert. Absinthe? I must remind you, absinthe is harmful to the human body. Such alcohol can lead to insanity and hallucinations. I didn't expect the trends of Trier to reach here, Leah chimed in with a grin. Lumian acknowledged her comment tersely. So the people of Trier also enjoy La Favert. For us, life is already tough enough. No need to fret over a little more harm. This drink can calm our minds. All right. 
Ryan leaned back in his chair and turned to the bartender. A glass of La Fay Verde and another glass of Carapis. Carapis was a renowned fruit based spirit that had been distilled to perfection. The thin, middle aged man who had exposed Lomian's lies piped up. Give me a glass of La Fay Verde too. After all, I was the one who told the truth just now. I can even tell you the truth about this kid's situation. He glared at Lumian, daring him to object. Foreigner, I can tell you still have your doubts about the authenticity of that story. Pierre, you'd do anything for a free glass of alcohol, Lumian retorted, scowling. Before Ryan could even respond, Lumian added, Why can't I tell my story and get an extra glass of La Favert? Because no one knows if they should believe you, Pierre smirked. Your sister's favorite story to tell kids is the boy who cried wolf. People who lie all the time lose their credibility eventually. Lumian shrugged and watched as the bartender slid a glass of light green alcohol in front of him. C.A.V.A., he said, unbothered. Ryan turned to Lumian. Is that all right? Sure thing, as long as your wallet can handle it, Lumian replied breezily. In that case, another glass of La Favert, Ryan said with a nod. Pierre's face lit up with a smile. Generous foreigner, you should steer clear of this one, he said, gesturing to Lumian. He's the most mischievous bloke in the whole village. Five years ago, his sister Aurora brought him back to the village, Pierre continued. He's been here ever since. Can you imagine? He was just a wee lad of thirteen at the time. How could he have made the trek to the hospital to become a corpse watchman? The nearest hospital is in Dirige at the foot of the mountain. It would take an entire afternoon to get there by foot. Brought back to the village? Leah inquired, her voice tinged with suspicion. She tilted her head, causing her bells to tinkle. Pierre nodded in confirmation. Aurora moved here six years ago. A year later, she went on a journey and brought this lad back with her said she found him on the road, a starving, homeless child. She planned to adopt him. Then, he took on Aurora's last name, Lee. Even his name, Lumian, was given by Aurora. I don't even remember what my name was before Aurora gave me the name, Lumian, unfazed by the revelation, flashed a grin and took a sip of absinthe. It was clear that his past did not bother him in the slightest. Chapter 2, Prank Ryan apologized politely to Lumian. Forgive me, I did not expect such a situation, he said. Lumian chuckled. Are you suggesting we need another glass of La Favert? Without waiting for Ryan's response, he changed the subject. What brings foreigners like you to Cordu? Are you here to buy wool or leather? Many of Cordu's residents made their living as shepherds. Ryan breathed a silent sigh of relief and seized the opportunity to explain their true purpose. We came to visit the eternal blazing sun church's padre, Guillaume Benet, but he seems to be absent from both his home and the cathedral. Pierre, who had enjoyed Ryan's free absinthe, kindly reminded him that there was only one church in Cordu. The other locals around the bar counter were all drinking, but no one answered Ryan's question. The name seemed to represent some kind of taboo or authority that couldn't be openly discussed. Lumian took a sip of drink and thought for a few seconds before offering his assistance. I can roughly guess where the Padre is. Do you need me to take you there? Leah didn't stand on ceremony. If it's not too much trouble, she said. Ryan nodded in agreement. Once you've finished your drink. All right. Lumian raised his glass and finished the light green alcohol. He put down his glass and got to his feet. Let's go. Merci beaucoup, Ryan expressed his gratitude and gestured for Valentine and Leah to stand up. Lumian's face lit up with a smile. It's no problem at all. You heard my story and I enjoyed a complimentary drink. That makes us friends, N.S.C.E. Pa. We. Oui. Ryan nodded. Lumian's grin widened, stretching from ear to ear. He opened his arms wide, beckoning the other party in for a hug. Ah, it is good to meet you, my cabbages, he exclaimed with fervor. Ryan, who was about to be enveloped in a bear hug, froze. 
cabbages? His expression was a mixture of perplexity and embarrassment. Valentine and Leah mirrored his expression. It is a term of endearment we use for our friends, Lumian explained with innocent sincerity. Everyone in the Dirige region is aware of it. It has been a tradition for centuries, believe me, my cabbages. Leah couldn't help but glance around, producing the tinkling sounds. Pierre and the others nodded in agreement, assuring the newcomers that Lumian's words were true. However, the grins on their faces hinted that they were pleased to see foreigners struggling to comprehend their affectionate greetings. Lumian stroked his chin thoughtfully. Don't you fancy it? Then I shall opt for a different option. It can also be used for friends. My dear bunnies, my darling chicks, my lovely ducks, or perhaps my adorable lambs. Which one tickles your fancy? But Ryan's expression was as stiff as a board, and Valentine's brow furrowed in confusion. Leah let out a sigh, a mix of exasperation and amusement. Let's just stick with cabbage, shall we? At least it sounds normal. Phew. Ryan let out a quiet sigh and gently grasped Valentine's elbow. He gave a slight nod and remarked, they all seem like precious treasures in the family. Without awaiting Lumian's response, he swiveled his body and addressed the bartender, how much will it be? Two verl d'or, replied the bartender, eyeing the glasses lined up on the counter. Ryan settled the bill, and Leah shifted the conversation to a different subject. Lumian is an uncommon name. At least better than names like Pierre and Guillaume, Lumian countered with a grin. If you were to call out Pierre in this place, a third of the people would turn their heads. Call out Guillaume, and another third will respond. As for this gentleman, he gestured to the skinny middle-aged man sipping his free drink. His full name is Pierre Guillaume. Leah flashed a smile, skirting the topic of cabbage. As they departed from the tavern, Lumian turned around and surveyed the surroundings. What's the matter? Leah inquired with curiosity. Lumian pondered for a moment and replied thoughtfully, it's not just the three of you foreigners who came to the tavern today. Another person arrived earlier, but I don't know when they left. What did they look like? Ryan asked with a serious expression. Lumian took a moment to reflect. A lady. Very sophisticated. You can tell she's from the city with just one glance. I can't describe her appearance. Why don't I sketch her for you? Do you know how to draw? Leah queried, aware of Lumian's idiosyncrasies. Lumian chortled. I don't. In that case, let's locate the Padre first, Ryan decided, drawing the conversation to a close. Cordu was a place devoid of street lamps at night, yet the twinkling stars above provided a faint glimmer that allowed the four of them to navigate the road. The yellowish light emanating from the windows on either side only added to the ethereal ambience. As they approached the eternal blazing sun cathedral situated in the village square, the grandiose structure appeared somewhat blurry in the darkness, as if it was merging with the night. We've been here before. There's no one here, Valentine grumbled with a frown. Lumian smiled and said, no one at the front door doesn't mean there's no one elsewhere. He then proceeded to lead Ryan and the others around the front of the cathedral towards the cemetery, where they found a dark brown wooden door. Lumian didn't wait for Ryan to knock. Instead, he reached over and fiddled with the keyhole before opening the side door with a creak. That's not very nice, is it? Ryan frowned. Leah nodded in agreement, her bells tinkling. We're here to visit the Padre, not to fight him. All right, Lumian acquiesced. He closed the wooden door and knocked lightly. Hey, is anyone there? I'll come in if you don't answer he muttered in a low voice that was barely audible in the night. There was no response from inside the cathedral. Without hesitation, Lumian pushed open the door and gestured inside. Go on in. Ryan hesitated. He looked at the darkness behind the door and glanced at his companions. Okay. He took a step forward, slow but firm. Leah and Valentine followed closely behind. The four silvery bells adorning Leah's boots and veil were eerily silent. The environment was dim and eerie as the four of them made their way forward. 
Out of nowhere, Ryan came to a halt and muttered in a low voice, What's that noise? Yes, I heard it too, Lumian agreed. Without wasting any time, he forcefully pushed the door aside, and it opened with a loud clang, revealing what lay beyond. The dimly lit space resembled a confessional. A beam of starlight shone through, revealing a naked man in his prime, lying atop a fair-skinned woman. The scene stunned everyone, including the man and the woman. Suddenly, the man sat up and bellowed at Ryan and his team, Sacred Blue. You've ruined the Holy Church's plans. Amidst the reverberating roar, Lumian, who had quietly approached behind the group, waved his hand and spoke quickly, Ah, it seems we have discovered our padre. Au revoir, my cabbages. Before anyone could react, Lumian dashed towards the side door, leaving his words to drift away in the wind. As the team stood in shock, Leah, Ryan, and Valentine couldn't shake the words of the middle-aged man, Pierre Guillaume, from their minds, that you should steer clear of this one. He's the most mischievous bloke in the whole village. Lumian sauntered down the country road, hands tucked in his pockets while whistling a tune under the stars. As expected, the Padre is having an affair with Madame Poilis. Mon Dieu, these foreigners exude an air of prestige. The Padre would never dream of crossing them. He must pay an exorbitant sum to keep his sordid dalliances under wraps and preserve his standing within the cathedral. Humph, he only has himself to blame for lusting after Aurora. I have been biding my time for this chance. As Lumian muttered to himself, he returned to his abode on the outskirts of the hamlet. The structure he called home was a peculiar semi-subterranean two-story affair. The ground floor doubled as both a kitchen and a lounge. A hefty oven and a grandiose stove dominated the room. Aurora! Aurora! Lumian hollered as he trudged up the stairs. No reply. The upper story was divided into three chambers and a lavatory, all the doors stood open. Lumian peeped into each room but couldn't find his sister. He mulled it over for a moment, then marched to the end of the corridor and clambered up the ladder that led to the roof. The roof was a fiery orange, painted by the twilight sky. In the center sat a figure, holding their knees and staring contemplatively at the sparkling stars. This was an exquisite woman, exceptionally so. Her long and thick locks were a shade of gold, her eyes a pale blue, and her facial features were intricate and refined. Her gaze was fixated on the cosmos, her countenance serene, akin to that of a statue. Lumian remained silent. He shifted to her side and sat next to her. He lifted his head, gazing at the dense forest in the distance, absorbing the susurrus of the wind blowing through the trees. After a while, the woman raised her arms and stretched, paying no heed to her appearance. Aurora, I don't understand why you come up here so often. What's so interesting about this view? Lumian commented. Call me Grande, sir. Aurora scolded playfully, tapping Lumian's head with her finger. Aurora sighed and thought to herself, a philosopher once said that there are only two things worth revering in this world. One is the morality in one's heart, and the other is the cosmos above one's head. Lumian noticed his sister's slightly melancholic expression and flashed a grin. I know the answer to this question. Emperor Roselle said so. Pfft. Aurora laughed. She took a sniff and raised her beautiful golden eyebrows. You've been drinking again. This is called socializing. Lumian took the opportunity to recount what had just happened. I met three foreigners. Aurora could not help but laugh. I'm really afraid that the Padre will have a heart attack. Her expression then turned serious. Lumian, don't provoke the Padre anymore. It'll be troublesome if we get a new one. But I can't stand his face. Lumian complained before Aurora stood up. She looked down at her brother and smiled. All right, it's bedtime, my inebriated brother, Aurora said with a smile as she threw out some silver dust. Aurora flew down from the roof like a bird and entered the window on the second floor, leaving Lumian behind. Lumian watched this quietly and shouted anxiously, What about me? Climb down yourself. Aurora replied mercilessly. Lumian pursed his lips, his smile fading bit by bit. 
He watched the silver specks of light disappear in the night sky, sighed softly, and muttered to himself, I wonder when I'll be able to possess such extraordinary powers. Chapter 3 Dream Lumian lingered atop the roof, reluctant to descend just yet. His visage was a picture of stoicism, betraying no emotion. Gone was the mischievous young man who frequented the tavern, always ready with a grin and a jest. In his place was a composed and resolute figure, unrecognizable to those who knew him before. Since discovering Aurora's magical powers by chance, Lumian had been obsessed with obtaining them. But Aurora always warned him against it, citing the immense danger and agony that came with wielding such abilities. She refused to divulge the secret even if she knew how to grant them to mere mortals. Lumian couldn't force her to reveal the method, so he resorted to pleading and persuading her at every turn. After a few seconds of contemplation, Lumian sprang to his feet and made his way down to the edge of the roof. He climbed back to the second floor using the wooden ladder. He strolled to Aurora's room, only to find the brown wooden door ajar before peeking inside. Aurora sat at her desk, scribbling away with a champagne fountain pen, dressed in a sky-blue gown. What is she writing so late into the night? Is it related to witchcraft? Lumian placed his hand on the door and quipped, writing in your diary, are you? Who writes in a diary, honestly? Aurora replied without looking up from her writing. Lumian wasn't satisfied with her answer. But didn't Emperor Roselle keep several volumes of diaries? Roselle, the last emperor of the Intus Republic where the siblings currently lived, had brought down the Sauron dynasty and assumed the mantle of Caesar, thereby declaring himself emperor. The man had made countless strides in the fields of science and engineering, having been credited with inventing the steam engine. Not to mention, he had charted the sea route to the southern continent and sparked an age of colonization. He was the embodiment of his time, a symbol of a bygone era over a century ago. However, in his twilight years, he was double-crossed and assassinated in the White Maple Palace of Trier. In the aftermath of his death, his diary pages were disseminated throughout the world, yet they were written in a tongue that nobody could decipher, as if the words didn't exist in this world. That's why Roselle ain't no honest man, Aurora, her back turned to Lumian, scoffed. So, what are you scribbling there? Lumian queried. That was the crux of the matter. Aurora responded with a shrug, her voice dripping with indifference, a letter. To whom? Lumian couldn't help but scowl. Aurora paused, laying down her exquisite golden champagne fountain pen, intricately patterned, to review her words and phrases. A pen pal. A what now? Lumian furrowed his brow, thoroughly perplexed. What the hell was that? Aurora chuckled, running her fingers through her lustrous golden hair as she began to enlighten her brother. That's why I keep telling you to read more and study more. Quit wasting your days drinking and carousing. Look at you. What sets you apart from an illiterate? Pen pals are friends who become acquainted through newspapers, magazines, and other publications. They've never met and rely solely on letters to keep in touch. What's the point of having such a friend? Lumian asked, rather concerned about this matter. As he withdrew his hand from the door, he scratched his chin, deep in thought. Aurora had never had a boyfriend before, so he couldn't allow her to be fooled by someone she had never met before. Meaning? Aurora thought about it seriously. First off, emotional value. We, I know you don't understand the concept. Humans need to connect with one another but some things and emotions cannot be shared with the villagers, nor with you. I require a more private outlet to release my thoughts. These pen pals, whom I have not met in person, are perfect for that. Secondly, do not underestimate my pen pals. Some of them hold great power, and some possess extensive knowledge. For example, a pen pal gifted me this battery-operated lamp. Kerosene lamps and candles are too damaging to the eyes and not ideal for writing at night. Without waiting for Lumian to ask another question, Aurora waved her hand behind her. Get some rest, my inebriated brother. Bon Newt. All right, Bon Newt. Lumian replied, trying to hide his frustration. 
Aurora instructed, don't forget to close the door. It's positively frigid in here with all the windows and the door open like this. Lumian slowly shut the door made of brown wood, then headed to his room where he removed his shoes before sitting on the bed. In the dimness of the night, Lumian could make out the wooden table beside the window, the slanted chair, the small bookshelf against the wall, and the wardrobe on the other side. He sat still, lost in thought. He knew Aurora was a woman who kept her secrets to herself, and there were things she had not revealed to him. Lumian was not surprised, but he was worried that her secrets might put her in danger. And when reality hit, his options were limited. He was just an ordinary person, with a robust body and a sharp wit. Thoughts came rushing him like waves crashing on the shore, and just as quickly they receded. Lumian took a deep breath and made his way to the washroom to freshen up. Afterward, he removed his jacket-style brown coat and collapsed onto the cold bed. The April air in the mountains was still nippy. In the midst of his fugue state, Lumian perceived a murky mist, enveloping his surroundings and erasing everything in sight. He trudged through the haze in a daze, yet regardless of which direction he took or how far he went, the fog always led him back to the same place, his bedroom. The room was fashioned with a white four-piece bed, a wooden table and chair poised in front of the window, bookshelves, wardrobes, and the like. Phew. Lumian's eyes flickered open with a start, the morning sun casting a light through the thin blue curtains. He sat up, staring blankly at the room, feeling as if he was still trapped in a dream. The same dream he had been having for days, the gray fog that refused to clear. He raised a hand to his temples and muttered to himself in a deep voice, it's getting more frequent. I have the same dream almost every day. Lumian's calm demeanor belied the fact that this dream hadn't brought about any negative effects, but it certainly had also failed to yield any positive outcomes. I pray that hidden in this is something propitious, Lumian murmured, as he rose from the bed. Lumian opened the door to the corridor and was immediately met with a sound emanating from Aurora's room. What a coincidence. Lumian smiled. But then, a sudden thought hit him, causing him to take a step back and stand at the edge of the door. When Aurora's bedroom door creaked open, Lumian quickly raised his right hand and began to massage his temples with a slightly pained expression on his face. What's wrong? Aurora noticed his discomfort. Success. Lumian cheered inwardly as he tried his best to calm himself down. I had that dream again, he replied in a deep voice. Aurora's golden locks of hair cascaded down her shoulders as she furrowed her brows with concern. The previous method didn't work, she murmured to herself before suggesting, perhaps. I should find you a hypnotist, a real hypnotist, and see what caused it. The kind with magical powers? Lumian questioned deliberately. Aurora nodded lightly in response. One of your pen pals? Lumian couldn't help but ask. Why do you care about this? Think about how to solve your own problem. Aurora retorted without hesitation. Isn't that what's on my mind? Lumian muttered inwardly. He took the opportunity to say, Aurora, if I become a warlock and gain extraordinary powers, I should be able to unlock the secret of the dream and end it completely. Don't even think about it. Aurora replied without hesitation. Her expression softened as she continued, Lumian, I won't lie to you. This path we're taking is dangerous, painful, and downright treacherous. If I had any other choice and if the world wasn't spiraling out of control, I'd be content with being a regular old writer and living a peaceful life. Lumian didn't hesitate to interject, then let me shoulder the burden of danger and pain. I'll protect you, while you do what you love. Those words had been repeating in his head for quite some time. Aurora went quiet for a couple of seconds before a grin spread across her face. Are you discriminating against women? Before Lumian could say a word, she added with a serious tone, it's too late to turn back now. Ain't no going back to what we had before. Fine, I get it. I'm gonna go wash up. You study hard at home today and get ready for the college entrance exams in June. You said it yourself, the world is getting more dangerous. What's the point of taking exams? Lumian muttered. He believed that the key to success was strength not some paper degree. 
Aurora just smiled and said, Knowledge is power, my uneducated brother. Lumian had no response, so he just watched Aurora walk into the washroom. In the afternoon, in the bustling town square of Cordu, Raimund Gregg caught sight of Lumian Lee crouched under an elm tree. His thoughts were shrouded in mystery. Shouldn't you be holed up at home with your nose buried in those books? Raimund approached him, his voice dripping with envy. Raimund was Lumian's confidant, standing at a moderate 1.7 meters, with brown hair and brown eyes. He was an ordinary-looking fellow with a slightly flushed complexion. Lumian looked up at him and offered a charming grin. Did Aurora not fill you in? Even the hangman deserves a respite. I've been cooped up for so long, I needed a break. All morning, he had been ruminating on the possibility of acquiring extraordinary powers without Aurora's assistance. This required him to seek out clues and take the initiative to investigate. Eventually, he felt that the rumors of magical powers circulating throughout the village held some truth and leads, so he purposely waited for Raimund here. If I were in your shoes, I wouldn't rest for more than fifteen minutes, Raimund drawled, leaning casually against the elm tree. We don't have a sister who's well read enough to teach us. I plan on learning how to herd sheep next year. Lumian paid no attention to Raimund's remarks and spoke reflectively. Recall the tale of the warlock for me. Raimund couldn't quite understand Lumian's intentions, furrowing his brow in confusion. The one about the warlock? In the past, there was a warlock in our village, but he died later. On the day of his burial, an owl flew in from outside and perched atop his bed. It only departed after the coffin was carried out. Then, the coffin became unbearably heavy. It took nine bulls to pull it. Lumian pressed further, how long ago was this? Raimund's expression grew increasingly perplexed. How should I know? I heard it from my father. Chapter 4, Shepherd Lumian sprang to his feet, his eyes flashing with determination. Then let's go to your father. He had always been a man of action, and he knew that investigating the village legend couldn't wait. If he dallied, his sister Aurora would surely catch wind of it, and she would never allow him to proceed. In Aurora's eyes, delving into the realm of extraordinary powers was tantamount to playing with fire. How can I not know that there's danger? Aurora wouldn't lie to me about this. But even if the world is ablaze, I have to keep walking. I can't let Aurora face this alone. As he got up, this thought flashed across Lumian's mind. Every time Aurora mentioned that the world was becoming more dangerous, the seriousness and worry on her face couldn't be any more genuine. Raimund Gregg looked at Lumian with confusion etched on his face. Why are you looking for him? Lumian fixed him with a withering look. Ask him how long ago the legend of the warlock took place. Why is this guy struggling to comprehend such a simple matter? Perhaps I need to find some time to test his intelligence. Raimund still looked baffled as he gazed at Lumian. Why do you need to know such details? Ah. Uh, should I bother trying to explain it to this clueless fellow? Or should I simply come up with a plausible excuse? He weighed his options. Lumian's mind raced as he considered his next move. He knew that he couldn't keep his investigations a secret from his friends, but he also knew that pursuing the truth about the legend was a risky move. However, he quickly came up with an idea. He flashed a grin that he usually reserved for moments when he was about to deceive someone. Dot. Raimund took two steps back, sensing that something was amiss. Spill it. Lumian adjusted his dark-colored shirt and linen jacket before smiling. I believe the legend of the warlock is worthy of our attention. What's so important about it? Raimund asked after some thought. There was indeed a warlock in our very village of Kordu in the past, Lumian said with a serious expression. Think about it, my friend. When I lie, I don't provide specific details like the time, place, and background that anyone could easily verify. However, this legend mentions a warlock who lived in Kordu, and if it were a fabrication, it would be too easy for someone to expose it as such. But that was ages ago, Raimund countered. 
I'm also referring to the people who were around when the legend first started circulating, Lumian explained, his smile widening. They could have easily confirmed whether or not a warlock lived in Kordu at that time. And since the legend has been passed down through generations, it's highly likely that it's based on a real event. Raimund remained unconvinced. But when you make up stories, you often use phrases like more than a hundred years ago, centuries ago, long, long ago, to make it impossible for anyone to verify. That's precisely why I need to confirm it with your father, Lumian replied, a sly look in his eye that said, you see where I'm going with this, don't you? That's true. Raimon nodded slowly, accepting Lumian's explanation, but he couldn't shake the feeling that something wasn't quite right. As they left the square and delved deeper into the village, Raimon had a sudden epiphany. Manju, why do you want to confirm if such a legend is true? Warlock, Monami, that's what we're searching for. If we can confirm the house where he lived and the place where he was buried, we might uncover his secret and gain magical powers that go beyond mere mortals, Lumian replied, his truthful words dripping with deceit. Raimon's expression turned skeptical, don't tell me lies. Monami, most of those tales are created to scare little children. How can they be true? And on top of that, anyone who seeks the power of a warlock will end up in the Inquisition. The Intus Republic lay on the northern continent, where the Orthodox deities were the eternal blazing sun and the god of steam and machinery. These two churches divided the faith of almost all the people, and they didn't allow the Church of Evernight Goddess, the Church of the Lord of Storms from the Lowen Kingdom, the Church of Earth Mother from the Fainapotter Kingdom, the Church of the God of Knowledge and Wisdom from Lenberg, and the Church of the God of Combat from the Faisak Empire to come in and preach. The Eternal Blazing Sun Church's Inquisition was feared by all. Countless heretics had been locked up and subjected to unimaginable torture. Lumian laughed. Why are you fretting now, my friend? You said it yourself, most of those legends are false. The chances of finding a warlock's remains are slim to none. Besides, even if we do stumble upon the remains of a warlock, we don't have to take on his forbidden power. We can give it to the church and get a handsome reward. Oh right, a warlock's grave is sure to be overflowing with treasures. The church that Lumian spoke of was the Church of the Eternal Blazing Sun. The Church of the God of Steam and Machinery wasn't found in Kordu, instead it was usually located in large cities and places with factories. Seeing the temptation growing in Raimon's eyes, Lumian couldn't help but click his tongue in satisfaction. Do you really want to be a shepherd, my friend? The shepherd here was not talking about the romanticized idea of a pastoral shepherd that city dwellers often had. No, this was a profession. Every morning, they would have to lead a flock of sheep out to graze and watch over them. Kordu was located in Dirij, Ristan province. Being a shepherd was a profession here, a tough and lonely profession. They worked for sheep owners, herding dozens, even hundreds of sheep back and forth between the mountains and plains. This was known as a herding. Every autumn, the mountains around Kordu would wither, and the shepherds would lead the sheep out of the mountain pass to the warmer plains far away, sometimes crossing borders into Fainapotter, Lenberg, and other countries. By the beginning of May, they would have brought the sheep back to various villages to shear them and wean the lambs. In June, they would trek up the mountains and into the tall ranges. They'd live in shacks and make cheese while grazing the sheep until the weather turned cold. The shepherds spent their entire lives on the move, traveling from place to place. They only had a small window to return to the village, which made starting a family nearly impossible. Most of them were single, and the few widows who had no choice but to herd sheep for a living were highly sought after by the shepherds. Raimon fell silent. After a long while, he hesitantly said, I'll listen to you. It does sound like fun, and I could use something to pass the time. In the ordinary course of events, once the family decided which child would become a shepherd, they would dispatch him to a certain shepherd's location to assist between the ages of 15 to 18. There, he would learn the ropes of shepherding. Three years later, the youngster would officially become a shepherd and seek employment elsewhere. Seventeen-year-old Raimund, however, had found several reasons to postpone this matter for over two years. If his circumstances did not alter, he would have to start learning how to herd next year. 
Come on, Lumian said, patting Raimon's shoulder. Is your father in the fields or at home? Recently, there hasn't been much work. Lent is approaching swiftly. He's either at home or at the tavern. Raimon let out a voice of envy. You don't know anything about this? You're definitely not a farmer. You have a fortunate sister. Lumian put his hands in his pockets and sauntered ahead, disregarding Raimon's lamentations. As they approached the rundown tavern in the village, a person emerged from the side street. This individual was dressed in a lengthy dark brown coat with a hood. A rope was tied around his waist, and he wore a pair of brand new, supple black leather shoes. Pierre? Pierre of the Berries? Raimon cried out in surprise. Lumian halted in his tracks and turned to look. That's me, Pierre Berry replied with a wide grin and a wave of his hand. He was a scrawny man with sunken eyes and greasy, curly hair. His stubble suggested it had been quite some time since he last shaved. Why are you back? Raimond asked in confusion. Pierre Berry was a shepherd and it was only the beginning of April. He should be tending to his sheep in the fields beyond the mountain pass. How in the world did he find himself in the village? He had only just begun his journey, and even if he had gone to Lenberg or the north of Fainapotter, it would take him a month to return to the Dirige Mountains. With his warm, smiling blue eyes, Pierre exclaimed joyfully, Isn't it almost Lent? I haven't celebrated it for years. I can't miss it this year. Don't you worry. I have a companion to help me look after the sheep. That's the beauty of being a shepherd. Without a supervisor, as long as I can find someone to help me, I can go wherever I please. I'm free as a bird. Lent was a widely celebrated festival throughout Entis. People welcomed the arrival of spring in different ways and prayed for a fruitful harvest for the year. Although it had nothing to do with the Church of the Eternal Blazing Sun or the Church of the God of Steam and Machinery, it had already turned into folklore and didn't involve the worship of pagan deities. Therefore, it had gained the tacit approval of the Orthodox factions. You want to see who'll be chosen as the spring elf this year, don't you? Lumian teased, flashing a grin. In Cordu, the people selected a gorgeous girl to play the role of the spring elf for Lent. It was all part of the celebration. Pierre laughed along. I hope it's your sister Aurora, but she definitely won't agree, and she's not the right age either. All right, he said pointing towards the tavern just a stone's throw away. I'll head to the cathedral to pray. Drinks on me later. Raimund absentmindedly replied, No need. You don't have much dough. Ha ha, as the good lord himself has said, even if there's only one copper coin, we have to share it with our poor brothers. He recited an adage that was well known among the shepherds in the Dirige region. Lumian beamed at Raimund, saying, Pierre's loaded. He's definitely treating us to a drink. He pointed to Pierre Barry's spanking new leather shoes. Pierre Barry was thrilled. My new boss is not too shabby. He gave me a few sheep and some wool, cheese, and leather. The shepherds were compensated with food, a small sum of money, and communal animals, cheese, wool, and leather. The amount they received was dependent on the agreement they had signed with their employer. For shepherds who had to travel long distances, having a good and suitable pair of leather shoes was the most pressing and practical desire. As Lumian watched Pierre Barry strut towards the town square, his gaze gradually became solemn and filled with suspicion. He silently muttered to himself, going away for a week or two or maybe even a month just to attend Lent. Lumian paused for a moment, his eyes scanning the area before he turned and strode towards the local watering hole with Raimund. The tavern was a nondescript establishment with no fancy moniker to speak of. The townsfolk affectionately referred to it as Old Tavern. Upon entering, Lumian's eyes darted around the room in their habitual manner. Suddenly, his gaze came to a halt. There, before him, was the foreigner who had departed so hastily the night before. She was alone, not in the company of Ryan, Leah, and Valentine. Her dress was a long, flowing orange garment, and her locks were a rich brown, tousled in gentle curls. Her piercing, sky-blue eyes were fixed on the scarlet-hued drink that graced her delicate hand. 
beautiful and languid, she seemed out of place in the seedy, dimly lit tavern. Chapter 5 Card Kirsch As expected of someone from a big city, Lumian's gaze eventually landed on the glass in the lady's hand. The distilled spirit made from sugar and fermented cherries had a color and texture that appealed to the ladies. Of course, they could replace the cherries with other fruits, but it would alter the taste only slightly. Koru's old tavern had a limited stock of high-grade wine, including Kirsch, which Madame Puales fell in love with during her visit to the provincial capital, Bigor. Madame Puales was the wife of Beast, the local administrator and territorial judge. Her noble ancestors had lost their title during Emperor Roselle's reign. Lumian knew that she was also one of the mistresses of the Padre, Guillaume Benet, but not many people in the village knew about it. Lumian shifted his gaze away from the lady and walked towards the bar counter. A man in his forties wearing a linen shirt and trousers of the same color was sitting there. His brown hair was no longer lush, and his face was creased from years of hard labor. He was none other than Pierre Gregg, Raymond's father. Another Pierre. At least a third of the people at the bar would answer to the call of Pierre, Lumian had joked earlier in front of Leah, Ryan, and the others. In the village, when people talked about Pierre or Guillaume, they had to specify which family they were referring to. Many families had fathers and children with the same names, making it impossible to tell them apart without adding Pierre, Ain, or Junior to their names. Raymond sauntered up to his father's side and asked, Papa, why don't you go to the square and chat with the others? The men in the village always convened under the ancient elm tree or in someone's abode, where they'd spend the day playing dice, cards, chess, and swapping all sorts of rumors, the tavern cost money, after all. Pierre Gregg, with a glass of rich red wine in hand, turned to his second son and said, We'll go later. There shouldn't be many people at the square now. That's right. Where did all the men in the village go? Lumian was immediately perplexed. He had noticed the absence of the village men at the square. Monsieur, I want to ask you something, Lumian said bluntly. Pierre Gregg immediately turned alert. A new prank? The story of the boy who cried wolf does indeed have a basis in reality. Lumian turned his head, gesturing for Raymond to speak. Raymond hesitated for a moment gathering his thoughts. Papa, how long ago did the warlock legend you told me happen? The one where it took nine bulls to pull the coffin. Pierre Gregg gulped down a mouthful of wine, his brow furrowed in puzzlement. Why are you asking this? You know, your Pepe told me this when I was just a wee lad. The Ristin province, where Cordu was located, and the neighboring provinces of Ale and Suet were located in the south of the Intus Republic. They were famous grape producers, and the wine here, especially the inferior ones, was very cheap. In some years, people could even drink wine like water. Raimon was disappointed because it had been a long time since his grandfather had passed on. Suddenly, Pierre Gregg chimed in, your Pepe claimed that he saw it with his own two eyes when he was but a young man. It spooked him so much that he became deathly afraid of owls. He was convinced that their evil talons could snatch his very soul away. Lumian and Raimon's eyes sparked with excitement, almost in unison. Murd, there were actual clues. The legend of the warlock, it was something that someone had actually experienced? Did Pepe mention anything about where the warlock lived or where he was buried? Raimon asked eagerly. Pierre Gregg shrugged. Who cares? Not one to be deterred, Raimon persisted determined to glean any shred of information. Before he could speak, Lumian intervened with a gentle touch on his shoulder as he spoke loudly, the river awaits us. Raimon was just about to take his leave with Lumian when Pierre Gregg suddenly remembered something. Hold up, Raimon. You'll soon be a green watcher, won't you? There's something you need to be aware of. Green Watchers had the crucial responsibility of patrolling the highland pastures around the village and nearby fields to prevent any illegal grazing during the prohibited period or livestock from ravaging the saplings. Lumian didn't pay much heed to the conversation and made his way to the tavern's washroom. As he exited the restroom, he took a detour to the female foreigner who was sipping on Kirsch. 
it was impossible to discern her age. Although he had no intentions of striking up a conversation, he observed her with great detail. It might come in handy in the future, just like how he had used Ryan, Leah, and Valentine to infiltrate the Padre's scandalous scene. After a few subtle glances, Lumian was poised to head for the entrance of the tavern to wait for Raimond when the languid lady in the orange dress looked up. Before Lumian could retract his gaze, his eyes met hers. Lumian felt a little awkward as his thick skin couldn't protect him from the unexpected encounter. Many thoughts immediately surfaced in his mind. Maybe I should take a cue from the Padre and administrators of the church and praise her beauty? Or perhaps I should switch gears and hit on her? Alternatively, should I show my inexperience and hastily turn around to leave? As Lumian made up his mind, the lady interrupted his thoughts and said with a smile, Been having dreams, have you? Lumian was hit by a bolt of lightning. His thoughts went numb and his mind froze. After a moment or two, he managed to force a smile and asked, Dreaming isn't unusual, is it? The woman touched her cheek with one hand and sized Lumian up. She chuckled and said, Lost in a misty dream, perhaps? How could she know? Lumian's pupils dilated instantly, and his expression betrayed a hint of fear. Despite having experienced many things, he was still young, and for a moment, he couldn't control his emotions. Stay calm, Lumian. Stay calm. He repeated to himself, trying to relax the muscles on his face, before asking, Did you hear the tale I told those three foreigners last night? The woman didn't reply. Instead, she pulled out a stack of cards from her orange purse, which sat on the chair next to her. She cast her gaze at Lumian once again and broke into a radiant smile. Draw a card. Perhaps it can aid you in unlocking the hidden secrets of that dream. W.H., Lumian was taken aback, his guard instantly raised. He was both enticed and wary. He looked down at the card she presented him and furrowed his brows. Tarot? The card resembled the tarot cards created by Emperor Roselle for divination. The woman looked down sheepishly and offered a self-deprecating smile. My apologies, I must have grabbed the wrong one. She swiftly returned the twenty-two tarot cards to her medium-sized handbag and pulled out a different deck. This is also tarot, but it's from the minor arcana. You don't have the privilege to draw from the major arcana pack, and I don't have the authority to let you. The minor arcana consisted of fifty-six cards divided into four suits, each representing chalices, wands, swords, and pentacles. What is she talking about? Lumian was bewildered by her words. This woman was stunningly beautiful and sophisticated, yet there was an air of eccentricity about her that suggested she was not entirely sane. Draw one, she urged, waving the minor arcana cards in her hand. It's complimentary, so there's no cost to try. It may be the solution to your dream predicament. Lumian chuckled. My sister once said that free things often come at the most hefty price. That may be true, the lady said after some thought. She laid down the minor arcana card with a delicate touch, careful not to upset the glass of kirsch that sat beside it. But as long as you don't pay, no matter what, how can I, a foreigner, expect to make you pay in Cordu? That's right. Perhaps it's worth a try. It wasn't easy for me to get a hint about that dream. I gotta give it a shot, but what about the warlock's curse? Maybe I should get Aurora's help? Lumian's mind raced with conflicting thoughts and he couldn't decide what to do. The woman didn't seem to mind his hesitation. After what seemed like an eternity, Lumian finally made up his mind. Slowly, he leaned forward and reached out his right hand. Carefully, he shuffled through the stack of minor arcana cards and extracted one from the middle. Seven of Wands. The languid woman's eyes drifted towards the card. The image depicted a man in verdant attire, standing atop a mountain with a determined expression on his face. In his hand, he held a wand, poised for battle against the six wands representing his enemies that were attacking from the foot of the mountain. What does this mean? Lumian asked. The woman's lips curled into a smile. I shall interpret it for you. It symbolizes crisis, challenge, confrontation, courage, etc. 
However, what really matters is that this card now belongs to you. When the time comes, you will discover its true meaning. You're giving it to me? Lumian's confusion grew with each passing moment. Could this card truly be cursed? The woman ignored his query and started to put away the remaining cards. She picked up her glass and finished the remaining curse in a single gulp. With graceful strides, she made her way towards the staircase on the side of Old Tavern and ascended to the second floor. It was obvious that she lived there. Lumian felt the urge to follow her, but something held him back. His thoughts were in disarray. Is this really an ordinary card? She gave it to me. Does that mean she'll never be able to use that deck again? Aurora might be able to shed some light on this. At this moment, Raimund approached Lumian. What's the matter, my friend? Nothing much. That foreigner was quite the looker, isn't she? Lumian said patronizingly. I reckon your sister, Aurora, is far more beautiful. Raimund then lowered his voice. Lumian, my Pepe has been gone for ages. What should we do next? Lumian, who was in a hurry to leave, pondered for a moment before answering, Firstly, we could track down an elder around your Pepe's age who's still kicking. Alternatively, we could head to the cathedral and examine the registry. Ah, but that's something to consider at a later time. Lumian remembered his recent altercation with the Padre and decided it was better to avoid the cathedral unless it was absolutely necessary. As the only cathedral in Cordu, it held significant power, even acting as a government entity. It recorded all significant events, including deaths and marriages. Before Raimond could ask any further, Lumian interjected, let's split up and see who fits the bill. We'll inquire tomorrow. Agreed. Raimond immediately agreed. In the semi-subterranean two-story building, Aurora listened intently to Lumian's tale, her piercing gaze fixed on the wand card in his hand. It's an ordinary card, we. Oui. I detect no malice or enchantments. Aurora, ah, grande sir, what do you make of the foreigner's intentions? How did she know of my dream? Lumian asked. Aurora shook her head. Now that she has shown us her hand, we can only wait and see. I will keep a watchful eye on her for the next few days. Oh. And take this card. It may cause change. But have no fear, I will be watching. All right. Lumian tried his best to relax. In the dead of the night, Lumian deftly tucked the wand card into the garments draping over the back of the chair, then slipped under the covers and shut his eyes. Before long, a dense, ashen mist once again enveloped his vision. Without warning, he jolted awake within his reverie. He sensed his mind clearing and a newfound lucidity taking hold. Yet, the dream world swathed in that same murky haze lingered on. Chapter 6 Ruins Lumian's subconscious gaze darted around the room, taking in the familiar sights of the table, the chair, the bookshelf, the wardrobe, and the bed. It was his bedroom, but it was cloaked in a thin, gray fog. Is this some sort of lucid dream? I'm having a lucid dream? His pupils dilated as the realization dawned on him. A lucid dream was a rare occurrence where one's mind could think and remember like in a state of wakefulness while still in a dream state. It was a skill that required specialized training to master. Aurora had tried various methods to induce lucid dreams in order to unravel the secret of Lumian's gray fog dream and help him eliminate the latent danger it posed, but she had failed. But now, Lumian found himself inexplicably conscious in his dream. As the shock of the situation passed, he began to consider the possibility of why this had happened. Could it be because of the tarot card that represents the Seven of Wands? That woman said it would help me unlock the secret of the dream. Therefore, its function is to allow me to enter a lucid dream state and explore the area enveloped by the gray fog? Hmm, compared to my previous impression, the gray fog seems to have faded a lot. A lot more. With these thoughts racing through his mind, Lumian rose from his chair and strode to the side of the room. He placed his hands on the table against the wall and gazed out the window, where a completely unfamiliar landscape greeted his eyes. 
this dream did not replicate the core to where he lived. Under a thin, ghostly fog, a towering mountain peak caught Lumian's attention. It rose up 20 to 30 meters into the air, constructed from brownish-red stones and reddish-brown soil. Buildings surrounded the mountain, now in ruins, either fallen or charred beyond recognition. They resembled crypts, a disordered cemetery surrounding the mountain's base. The ground was marred by holes and scattered with gravel. Not a blade of grass or a single weed could be found in this barren wasteland. The fog in the sky thickened to an impenetrable white, with no indication of a sun. Lumian could only see as if in the dead of night, under the light of the stars. After a moment of observation, he murmured to himself, that's it. This is the dream that's been haunting me for years? But soon he refocused his thoughts on a more practical question, where is the dream secret hidden? On the peak, or in one of these shattered buildings? Lumian did not rush to leave his bedroom and explore the dream. Instead, he stayed put, scanning the area from his vantage point. Suddenly, he caught sight of a figure darting through the ruins of the buildings surrounding the mountain peak. Despite the fog's thinness and the two-story house's limited height, Lumian couldn't shake the sense of its presence. He wondered if he was hallucinating. Taking a deep breath, Lumian muttered to himself, Stay calm. Be patient. Stay calm. Be patient. From what I can see, this dream is shrouded in secrecy, and it doesn't feel entirely my own. Lumian knew that blindly exploring it could lead to danger. Yes, I will search for that woman tomorrow and see what information I can find. Then, I will make a decision. Lost in thought, Lumian withdrew his gaze and prepared to exit the dream to rest in peace. However, he didn't know how to wake himself up while being awake. After numerous attempts to awaken, he laid in bed and attempted to clutter his thoughts, trying to recreate the state he was in while sleeping. After an indeterminate amount of time, Lumian abruptly sat up and noticed the faint glimmer of golden sunlight filtering into the room through the curtains. I'm finally awake. As expected, sleeping within the dream restores my disoriented state. Then, I can escape. Lumian breathed a sigh of relief and whispered to himself. In that moment, a knock reverberated through the door. Aurora. Lumian's heart clenched, fearing the worst. It is me, Aurora's voice infiltrated the room. Lumian sprung from the bed and rushed to the entrance. He grabbed the handle and pulled it open. Lo and behold, it was Aurora standing outside. She donned a white silk nightgown, and her long tresses of golden hair cascaded elegantly down her back. How did it go? She appeared certain that Lumian had just awoken. Lumian held nothing back and recounted every detail that had occurred. Aurora nodded pensively. The purpose of the card was to facilitate a lucid dream. She inquired, What are you going to do next? Lumian grunted curtly. I shall grab a bite to eat before visiting the woman and attempting to gather more information to discern her true intentions. Very well. Aurora offered no objection. She added, I shall also pen a letter to someone inquiring about the dream you recounted and the symbols therein. At this juncture, she glimpsed Lumian's suddenly apprehensive expression and smiled. Fret not, I shall make adjustments. I shall not jettison everything at once. After all, I am the one who instilled in you the principle of gradual progress. Well, when you converse with that woman, do not be aggressive. Endeavor to be amicable. It is not that we are fearful of her, it is simply better to acquire another ally than an additional adversary. Understood, Lumian replied solemnly. Cordu, Old Tavern. Lumian strode into the Cordu, Old Tavern and approached the bar counter. He leaned in and spoke to Maurice Benet, the tavern owner who also doubled up as a bartender. Which chamber does the foreign madam occupy upstairs? Old Tavern, the only inn in the village, boasted six rooms on the second floor for guests to rest their weary heads. Maurice Benet was not a burly man. Like most in the village, he had raven locks and blue eyes, but his nose was always red, a consequence of his heavy drinking. He was related to the church's Padre Guillaume Benet, but the two were not close and were merely distant cousins. Why the inquiry? 
Maurice Benet inquired, his curiosity piqued. What business would a big city woman have with a country bumpkin like you? There was an obvious look of inquiry on his face. Maurice had a sixth sense for these things, especially when it came to men and women. Lumian scoffed, aren't you a country bumpkin and a hillbilly yourself? He casually made up a reason, the lady lost something last night. I found it this morning. Just trying to return her property. Maurice Benet didn't buy it for a second. Is that so? Eight out of ten things that came out of Lumian's mouth were lies. What else? Do you think she'll fall for me? Lumian said, undaunted. That's true. Maurice Benet was convinced. She's in the room by the square, opposite the washrooms. After Lumian left, Maurice polished a glass, eyes tracking him. He whispered, just barely audible to Lumian, impossible? Not always. Sometimes people want to try something new. Lumian found the washroom on the second floor, the only spot of light in the dim, narrow hallway. But his eyes were drawn to the door across from it. A piece of paper hung from the brass handle, stark white against the dark red wood. Scrawled on it an intus, currently resting. Do not disturb. Lumian read the note for a few seconds. Instead of rushing forward to knock on the door, he took two steps back and stood against the wall. He planned to wait here until the lady came out. Life on the streets had taught him hard lessons. When an opportunity appeared, you seized it with both hands, no hesitation, no second thoughts, no fear. Otherwise it slipped through your fingers, and you were right back where you started. So he would wait as long as it took, the minutes ticking by endlessly as he ignored the eyes he felt tracking him, the whispers in his mind. He stood there without a hint of frustration, probably capable of passing off as a statue. Finally, a soft creak. The woman had changed into a pale green dress with white edges. Her brown hair was swept into a tight bun. Those light blue eyes flicked to Lumian before moving to the paper sign on the door handle, a smile dancing at the corner of her mouth. How long did you wait? she asked, not at all surprised to see him there. Lumian took a step forward and said, that's not important. He tried to keep his tone even, to appear less eager. What do you want to ask, the woman said, cutting straight to the point. Lumian glanced around the empty hallway. Here? The lady replied with a smile, if you don't mind, I don't mind either. Lumian had already noticed that the other occupants of the tavern, including Ryan and Leah, were nowhere to be found. There was no one else on the second floor except for him and the woman in front of him. Lumian asked, organizing his thoughts carefully. What's the secret in that dream of mine? The lady laughed involuntarily. That's for you to answer, not me. She paused for a moment before saying, All I can say is, you'll find extraordinary power there. Extraordinary power. His pulse roared in his ears. What's the point, if it's just a dream? Won't change anything out here. The woman's lips curled into a smile. Who's to say what's possible, in the realm of the extraordinary? Perhaps, it can. After everything, the power I crave is there for the taking? Lumian's breath caught. The grin slid away as the lady added seriously, but danger lurks there too. Die in the dream, you die out here. Die in the dream, die for real? Lumian didn't understand, but he chose to believe it. That dream clung to Lumian like a shadow, as it had for years. But it was different, somehow. Special. And Aurora's voice whispered in his memory, careful's never a bad idea. Lumian preferred to view the situation as challenging and the consequences as severe. He couldn't afford to underestimate the danger or be careless. After a few seconds, he asked, if I stay out? What then? Theoretically speaking, there won't be any consequences. No one will force you, the woman said thoughtfully. But as time passes, I can't be sure that the situation won't change. And the probability of things going wrong is much higher than things going right. How much higher? Lumian pressed. 90% to 10%? No, 99.99% to 0.01%. 
The lady added seriously, of course, this is just my personal judgment. You can choose not to believe it. Lumian felt a wave of uncertainty wash over him, his mind racing with conflicting thoughts. Recently, I'm becoming convinced that the dream is a hidden danger. Not caring is the worst choice. But if I really want to explore it, there's a very high chance that an accident will happen without any knowledge. Should I wait for Aurora to gather more information from her pen pals before making an attempt? But if I do, Aurora definitely won't allow me to use the dream exploration to obtain extraordinary powers. Wasn't my investigation of the legend to seek extraordinary powers? It's too risky. It can lead to death. Perhaps I should do a preliminary exploration at the edge of the dream ruins to gather information and not take the risk of entering? Hmm, I can tell Aurora about the conversation, but I can't reveal the possibility of obtaining extraordinary powers. Once his thoughts had settled, Lumian gazed at the woman across from him and asked in a low, serious tone, Who are you exactly? Why did you give me that tarot card and the opportunity to explore the dream? The woman smiled enigmatically. I will tell you once you have unraveled the mystery of the dream. Chapter 7 Naroka Once Lumian had departed from the old tavern, he found himself standing on the uneven road, uncertain of where to go next. The morning sun beat down upon him, albeit with a slight chill in the air. As he deliberated his next move, Raimon Greg emerged from the side. I was just looking for you. Lumian quickly regained his composure and queried, What's the issue? Raimon appeared taken aback. Have you forgotten? Today, we're supposed to seek out the elderly, around the same age as my Pepe, and inquire about the legend of the warlock. Lumian groaned, pressing his hand against his forehead in agony. Is that so? Why can't I recall? Or is this just your imagination? Raimon's expression shifted from one of concern to one of fear. Just as he was about to inquire further and confirm whether he had imagined the events of the previous day, Lumian's face lit up with a mischievous grin. You rascal, you're playing a joke on me again. Raimon cursed, unable to contain his annoyance. You need to work on your cursing, Lumian chided, shaking his head in disappointment. Even Ava can curse better than you. Ava Lizier, the beautiful daughter of Court of Village's renowned shoemaker Guillaume Lizier, was now a goose herder. Raimon's expression shifted as he muttered, Ava. He then looked at Lumian. She's our friend, right? Lumian nodded with a smile. Indeed she is. The trio, along with Guillaume of the Berries and Ava's cousin Azema Lizier, were inseparable teenagers who often spent their days together. Why don't we bring Ava on board to help us uncover the truth behind the legend? Raimon suggested. As you know, her father always said, why must a dowry be paid when a woman gets married? How many good families have fallen like this? It pains her to hear it. She might be relieved if she could get some treasure or reward from the investigation. I've also heard the heads of several families in the village say similar things, including our padre, Lumian added with a sly grin. They wish their brothers would stay at home forever. Even if they get married, they won't venture out alone to establish a family. That would require them to split the assets and give them their deserving share. Lumian shot a furtive glance at Raimund and continued, Therefore, many families prefer to let one of their children become a shepherd. This way, he won't get married and will have a certain income. Most of the time, he can support himself. Raimund's expression gradually darkened as he considered the implications of this issue. He had never thought too deeply about it before. This was precisely why he enjoyed spending time with Lumian. Although most people in the village believed that Lumian had a poor character and enjoyed lying and playing tricks, he was actually more knowledgeable than anyone his age. Raimund, on the other hand, felt like he didn't know much and spent his days in a daze, simply following through with his family's arrangements. It's good that you know. Lumian thought to himself before skillfully steering the conversation back to their investigation. It's too late now. We must hurry up and ask around. We will get Ava tomorrow. Yes, we can also bring Guillaume Jr. and Azema on board later. Not only will this potentially lead to gains, 
but it will also be a fascinating activity that can train our abilities. Bring Guillaume Jr. and Azema too? Raimund grumbled begrudgingly. The more people involved, the less his share of the rewards would be. Furthermore, if he included them, he would have fewer chances to win over Ava's affections. Lumian regarded him with a touch of kindness and pity in his gaze. Silly child, do you think Ava will fall for you? Her eyebrows are very high, and she only wants to marry into a good family. She clearly has a certain favorable impression of me, a villain, yet she can control herself. In the Dirige region, having high eyebrows meant having high standards, and they wouldn't settle for just any average bloke. My sister always said there is strength in numbers, Lumian explained simply. Who are the old croakers that we need to visit? You didn't investigate? Raimund asked in surprise. How could I have the energy to investigate after the incident with the wand card? Lumian smiled and quipped, of course I investigated. I am just testing your ability to gather information. Raimund had no doubts. There are nine elders who are still alive in the village. They are about the same age as my Pepe, or a little older. Six women and three men. Ladies do live longer. Lumian listened quietly, deep in thought. There's no need to visit the last two. They're from another village and came here through marriage. Let's start with Naroka. She's the oldest and might have been an adult when the warlock incident happened. Naroka's real name wasn't actually Naroka. It was a title of respect for her. In Riston province, married women from prominent families or those who were the actual heads of households were entitled to the title madam. More than that, their names were marked with an A to proclaim their femininity, and prefixed with Na to signify their authority as madams reigning over their domains. Madame Puales's family had been in decline for a long time, and at home she dutifully deferred to her husband Biest, the provincial administrator. Therefore, she didn't have a Na prefix or an A suffix. She could only be addressed as Madam. Naroka had been widowed early on in life, and as a result, she took over the family's accounts. Despite her two sons coming of age, getting married, and having children of their own, she kept her hand positioned squarely on the purse strings of the family fortunes. This was a rare occurrence in Cordu, where men usually took charge of the family's affairs. In families where the father was absent, the eldest child would naturally take back the authority to manage the entire family from their mother once they reached adulthood. Okay, Raimund acquiesced without questioning Lumian's decision. As they walked by a few buildings, Lumian spotted four old women basking in the sun as they chatted casually in front of a two-story house. They sat very close to each other, catching lice on each other's bodies which was a form of entertainment in the countryside of the Antis Republic that served to bring people closer and express affection. Do we ask her now? Raimon hesitated, concerned that their pursuit of the truth behind the legend might spread throughout the village. Let's wait a little longer, Lumian replied solemnly, knowing that many rumors in the village were generated and spread through such gatherings. After a while, the other three old women left one by one because they still had work to do at home. Good morning, Naroka. Lumian immediately walked over. Naroka's hair was grizzled, and her eyes were slightly turbid. She wore a dark dress made of rough cloth, and her hands were covered in a layer of chicken skin with obvious patches on her face. When will Aurora join us? Many people in the village miss her, Naroka asked with a smile. The men, I suppose. Lumian entered a state where he spoke his truth while the other talked about another matter and asked curiously, Naroka, have you really seen a real warlock? The one whose coffin nine bulls couldn't move. Naroka's visage shifted ever so slightly. Who told you that? His Pepe came back one night to tell him. Lumian began to spout nonsense. Naroka was stunned. Can souls really return? My papa told me that Pepe had mentioned it when he was alive, Raimund interjected, unable to watch Lumian deceive the elderly woman. Naroka's expression fell. After a moment of contemplation, she spoke up. Before he passed, none of us knew he was a warlock. He acted perfectly normal. Just like how you don't know that Aurora is a warlock. Lumian thought to himself. Until he suddenly died and that all flew over. 
Naroka trailed off, lost in her memories. The rest of her tale mirrored the legend. Lumian pressed further. Where did that warlock reside at that time? Naroka glanced at him. It's where you and Aurora are dwelling now. After that warlock was laid to rest, the Padre and a few others ransacked the place and burned it to the ground. For two or three decades, no one dared to approach that site. Eventually, the matter was forgotten. Later, Aurora came and purchased the land to rebuild the house. Our place? Lumian's heart skipped a beat. This answer was completely beyond his expectations. In a flash, he realized that there were a multitude of problems he had previously overlooked. With Aurora's knack for making money and her mysterious, unearthly abilities, why on earth would she settle down in the rural countryside of Cordu? Cities like the provincial capital, Bigor, the bustling textile center of Suet, or even the capital itself, Trier, would be far better options. Even if Aurora was seeking a place with fresh air and a pristine environment, these urban centers boasted plenty of areas that would suit her needs. Aurora once told him, the best way to hide is to hide in a big city. Lumian's mind raced as he struggled to calm himself. Today, he learned that the land Aurora had chosen for their home, the land where their house stood, had once belonged to a powerful warlock. Where is the warlock buried? Raimon interjected, unable to contain his curiosity. With no hope of finding riches in Lumian's home, he could only hope that the warlock's body held some sort of valuable secret. Naroka said with amusement, this was quite the affair. It undoubtedly sounded the alarm for the Padre. In the old days, nine bulls were gathered to pull the coffin to the cemetery beside the cathedral. The Padre performed a ritual to purify it. Eventually, the body was cremated and the remains were buried in a grave. Raimon couldn't conceal his disappointment and muttered, I see. Why do you inquire? Naroka scrutinized Raimon's face before questioning. Lumian cackled and spun a tale that sounded more like a fabrication. We seek the warlock's treasure. Kid, don't waste your time daydreaming, Naroka warned. Understood, Lumian replied meekly. Lumian and Raimond bade Naroka farewell and hit the road toward the town square. There ain't no hope, Lumian. None at all, Raimon muttered, his spirits sinking as they circled a building. Indeed. All that could have been burned, has been burned. All that could have been taken, was taken decades ago, Lumian replied, nodding in agreement. Despite the bleakness of their situation, Lumian wasn't disappointed thanks to the opportunity in his dream. Raimon agreed. I, you're right. Of all the tales, only that blasted owl still remains. Lumian's eyes lit up as he turned his gaze to the forest beyond the village. Owl, he murmured. Raimon recoiled in horror and added hastily, but it must have died years ago. He wasn't one for consorting with the likes of owls and other evil creatures. Down south in Intus, owls, nightingales, and ravens were thought to be sinister beings that served demons, stealing away human souls and bringing only misfortune. Chapter 8, Owl The idea hit Lumian like a bolt of lightning, but he didn't particularly fancy going through with it. Ignoring the fact that years had flown by since the warlock's demise and that the lifespan of owls was measly compared to humans, the sheer number of birds in the mountain was enough to make Lumian reconsider. There were too many of the damn things. That owl doesn't have any distinct markings. No, in the legends, there was no mention of anything specific about the owl. Naroka didn't disclose everything. We didn't inquire deeply enough. He snapped out of his thoughts and flashed a reassuring smile at Raimond. An owl tied to a warlock could live for a hundred years. As Raimond trembled with fear, he reassured him in a calm voice, Don't fret, Manami. This is my last resort. I do not wish to encounter a monster. Perhaps we should consult another old sage. Naroka may have overlooked a vital clue. The man's tone turned seductive as he continued, If I were a warlock, I would not keep all my treasures with me or in my home. I would stash some away in case the Inquisition attacked me. I would not have the luxury of time to collect my belongings. When I must flee, I would be left destitute. 
the Inquisition of the Church of the Eternal Blazing Sun was notorious for hunting down warlocks and witches. Their heroic deeds were celebrated throughout the countryside. Raimund's face lit up with excitement as he exclaimed, You are right. He said with a yearning expression, It's a shame. Too many years have elapsed. The church's discovered riches must have been spent ages ago. Manami, that's a dangerous thought, Lumian teased. Undeterred, they continued their visits to Pierre Pere, Neferia, and other elders of the Mori family. Although their responses mirrored Naroka's, Lumian and Raimund, with their newfound experience, managed to extract more details. For instance, the owl was of medium size and resembled its kind. It had a pointed beak, a feline face, brown feathers with scattered spots, brownish-yellow eyes, and black pupils. However, it was larger than the average owl, and its eyes appeared to spin. It was not as rigid or dim-witted as its kind. All these peculiarities made the owl seem even more sinister in their descriptions. Seems like we've hit a dead end, Lumian stated to Raimund as they traveled to the town square. We must focus on other legends. Raimund was not as discouraged as he had been earlier. Agreed. But which one should we pursue? This fellow is so proactive and hardworking. Lumian silently praised Raimund's enthusiasm and diligence and ready to reward for him. He nodded and said, Take your time and reflect on it. We shall discuss tomorrow. I shall impart combat techniques to you this afternoon. Marvelous! Raimund exclaimed, overjoyed by the unforeseen instruction. Aurora was a skilled fighter. After all, how else could she handle the savage and rough men in the village? Her younger brother was likely to be just as proficient. After bidding farewell to Raimund Greg, Lumian veered onto the trail leading to his home. As he walked, he spotted a group of men approaching him. The leader was in his prime, not towering above 1.7 meters in height. He wore a white robe and had light black hair. With a regal demeanor and decent facial features, the tip of his nose curled slightly in undisguised disgust and malice as he glared at Lumian with his blue eyes. None other than the Padre of the Eternal Blazing Sun Church in Cordu, Guillaume Benet. I have been awaiting your arrival for quite some time, Guillaume Benet bellowed in a baritone voice. Did you deliberately bring those foreigners to the cathedral? Lumian attempted to explain himself as he furtively took a step back. I thought you were sleeping inside. He had noticed Pons Benet, the Padre's younger sibling, standing beside Guillaume Benet. Pons was in his early thirties, muscular, domineering, and a bully. The other individuals with them were the Padre's henchmen. Guillaume Benet signaled Pons with a glance as Lumian retreated. Pons Benet's grin turned sinister as he lunged forward, bellowing, Rascal, E T E S times that you learn who E S Z father here. Before he could complete his sentence, Pons had already hastened his steps and pounced on Lumian. The other brutes followed suit. In Cordu, a place where logic held no sway and apologies fell on deaf ears, brute force was the only language that could command respect. Guillaume Benet, the Padre, knew this all too well, having resorted to violence countless times before. So, when he learned that the outsiders had been ushered into the cathedral by Lumian, the priest wasted no time in making his move. He was determined to get hold of the ruffian and pummel him into submission until he lay bedridden for a month. The Padre was keen to show Lumian the error of his ways and wouldn't rest until someone paid the price for his insolence. Of course, he had to avoid Aurora. Regarding the law, he only needed to notify the administrator and the territory judge, Beast. The city sheriffs were unlikely to investigate such a minor issue in the countryside. As an outsider, Beast would not offend a local-born padre unless there was significant conflict of interest. Guillaume Benet felt fortunate that the foreigners had not divulged his affair with Madame Poalis, the administrator's wife, to anyone. He was still unaware of this. Despite their speed, Lumian was quicker. Just as Pons spoke, Lumian pivoted and dashed away. He was familiar with the Padre's character and methods. Previously, a villager had accused Guillaume Benet of having multiple mistresses and embezzling offerings from the eternal blazing sun. He had also bullied others relentlessly in the village, hardly behaving like a man of the cloth. 
Subsequently, the villager had mysteriously died one afternoon. Thud thud thud. Lumian raced like the wind. Wait for your papa, eh? Attends ton pair. Pons shouted while chasing him. His pace was not sluggish either. The thugs pursued closely behind him. Instead of fleeing along the main road, Lumian darted into the nearest house. The family was preparing lunch in the kitchen when they suddenly saw a stranger burst in. With a swoosh, Lumian darted past them and leaped out of the kitchen window at the back. By the time Pons and his cronies entered, the homeowner had regained his senses. He stood up to confront them and inquired, What is going on? What are all of you doing? Get out of Z way, old man. Pons shoved the homeowner aside with force, but it slowed him down. When they reached the window and jumped out, Lumian had already vanished into another trail. After pursuing him for a while, they lost sight of Lumian entirely. Sacred Blue, C.S. Chien's foes. Pons spat on the roadside. Outside the semi-subterranean two-story abode, Lumian gasped for breath before finally opening the door and entering the house as though nothing had happened. One, two, three, four, two, two, three, four. A series of rhythmic shouts reverberated in his ears. Lumian gazed at the empty space on the other side of the kitchen and observed Aurora's blonde hair tied in a ponytail. She wore a flaxen shirt, tight white pants, and dark sheepskin boots, leaping around and drenched in sweat. In Cordu, the kitchen occupied most of the space on the first floor, serving as the family's core. Cooking and dining occurred here, as did receiving guests. She's exercising again. Lumian was accustomed to Aurora's eccentricities and was unfazed by her exercise regimen. Aurora often did strange things without giving any reason when probed. At the very least, exercising is beneficial, and it's quite a feast for the eyes. Lumian observed silently. After a while, Aurora stopped and squatted to turn off the black tape recorder. She took the white towel from Lumian and instructed him as she wiped the sweat from her forehead, remember, we have combat practice this afternoon. I have to study and learn combat. Aren't you demanding too much of me? Lumian grumbled nonchalantly. Aurora glanced at him, smiling, and retorted, You must remember that our objective is the comprehensive development of the five educations one of morality, intellect, physique, aesthetics, and labor. The more she spoke, the happier she became, as if recollecting something beautiful or amusing. I have already failed moral education. Lumian muttered under his breath. He queried, what kind of combat? One of the things he failed to comprehend was that Aurora, who seemed delicate and frail, was an expert in combat. She mastered numerous fighting techniques and could easily overpower him. Aurora pondered seriously, leaned forward slightly, and gazed into Lumian's eyes. She then laughed heartily and declared, self-defense. Ha! Huh. Lumian exclaimed in astonishment. Isn't that supposed to be for girls? Aurora stood tall and shook her head gravely, saying sincerely, boys must protect themselves when they are out. Who says boys don't encounter perverts? The smile on her lips was no longer hidden. Lumian was unsure if his sister was joking or serious, so he remained silent as he retrieved the white towel and headed towards the stairs. Suddenly, he felt something tighten under his foot, as if he had tripped over an obstacle. He stumbled forward. In midair, Lumian hastily contracted his abs, extended his arm, and leaned on the chair beside him. He somersaulted and barely landed on his feet. Aurora retracted her leg and chuckled. One of the fundamental combat principles is to be vigilant at all times. One cannot be complacent. Remember that, my novice brother? Her right hand had already clutched Lumian's back, but when she saw that he had regained control of his body, she let go. It's because I trust you too much. Lumian grumbled. He contemplated the matter and realized that this trust was meaningless. He had lost count of how many times he had been at the mercy of Aurora. Aurora coughed and restrained her expression. How did it go with that woman? Lumian provided a brief summary of their conversation before declaring, I intend to wait for your friends to respond before delving into the dream. 
smart decision, Aurora affirmed. Lumian changed the subject. What's for lunch? We still have some leftover toast from this morning. I'll roast four more lamb chops for you, Aurora replied after contemplating for a moment. What about you? Lumian inquired. Aurora casually said, I'll just have truffle bamboo chicken shreds topped with some cheese and onion soup. I tried it last time and found it to be quite. Before she could finish speaking, she suddenly froze. The next moment, she raised her hands to cover her ears. The muscles on her face gradually contorted, making her appear somewhat ferocious. Lumian observed silently, his eyes filled with anxiety and apprehension. After a while, Aurora exhaled deeply and returned to her usual self. Her forehead was drenched in sweat once more. What happened? Lumian asked. Aurora smiled and responded, the ringing in my ears is acting up again. You know that I have this old problem. Lumian didn't probe further. Instead, he said, all right, then I'll prepare lunch. Rest well. Every time this occurred, his yearning for extraordinary abilities grew stronger, as it became a pressing matter. Chapter 9, Magazine As the night settled in, Lumian finished dealing with his neighbors who had come to borrow the oven. He made his way up to the second floor, entering the room that served as Aurora's study. In Cordu, many folks were destitute and couldn't afford their own ovens or large stoves. When they needed to toast bread or smoke meat, they had to borrow it from others and use it on the spot. Aurora had always been lenient and accommodating when it came to this. Anyone could borrow her oven, but they had to pay the fuel costs or bring their own coal and wood. Currently, she had donned her white silk nightdress and was curled up in a reclining chair, her focus solely on the book she held under the bright battery-powered lamp on the desk. Lumian didn't wish to disturb her, so he nonchalantly pulled out a thinner book from the bookshelf and took a seat in the corner. Hidden Veil What kind of magazine is this? Lumian pondered, gazing at the cover that was adorned with cryptic symbols. He swiftly flipped through the pages, and the more he read, the more he was taken aback. This magazine delved into the very existence of the human soul. It discussed how all beings had a spirit, and through secret methods of communication between different spirits, one could obtain various kinds of aid. Even if one wasn't devout, even if they only attended the eternal blazing sun cathedral to pray and partake in mass occasionally, two words couldn't help but flash through Lumian's mind, sacrilege. Taboo. As a warlock who would undoubtedly be burned at the stake by the Inquisition if her true identity was exposed, it was customary for Aurora to have such books at her residence. However, Lumian could tell that this magazine had received the government's permission for publication. Can such a thing be openly published? Didn't they say that publication censorship had always been very strict? Or is this a fake permit? Lumian looked up at Aurora and inquired, Is this a prohibited magazine? Aurora took her eyes off her book and glanced at her brother. She responded in a nonchalant tone, in the past, it was underground fiction. Later on, for some reason, it cleared the censors and was officially published. The Eternal Blazing Sun Church actually didn't care and tacitly agreed. Fiction? Lumian was taken aback by his sister's choice of words. Of course, it's fiction. You're not taking it seriously, are you? Aurora laughed. If what's written is true, do you think it can still be published? If you follow the method written on it, other than making yourself mentally weak and neurotic, there won't be any additional gains. Yes. There will occasionally be something real, but without the corresponding ritual language, it'll be a waste of effort no matter how hard you try. This was the professional evaluation of a warlock. All right. Lumian couldn't hide his disappointment. I just find it strange that this can be published. Aurora took a deep breath, her puffed-up cheeks accentuating her pondering. I don't know why either. Perhaps it's because the world has been seeing an influx of supernatural events lately, and it's becoming increasingly difficult to conceal them. The public is becoming more aware of their existence, and the government is slowly easing its grip on such topics. That's why books like these are being published. 
and Trier, Psychic, Lotus, and Arcane are the most popular magazines. I have them all on my bookshelf. If you want to come up with more realistic stories for the tavern, you should give them a read. We, Lumian responded eagerly, his interest piqued. Simultaneously, he let out a wistful sigh deep in his heart. Aurora's hoard of books was truly impressive and diverse. Thanks to these tomes and Aurora's occasional elucidations, Lumian, a lad who had forsaken his schooling, had managed to acquire a reasonable comprehension of the world, continent, and nation he called home. The world was divided into two great continents, one to the north and one to the south, separated by the treacherous Berserk Sea, where raging hurricanes battered any who dared to sail its waters. But the truly mysterious lands lay to the east and west, on the legendary eastern and western continents. No one had ever set foot there, and some wondered if they even existed at all. Lumian and Aurora lived in the Intus Republic, a land situated in the heart of the northern continent. It was a nation bordered by the Fog Sea to the west, the Faisak Empire to the north, and the Hornasus Mountain Range and the Lowen Kingdom to the east. To the south lay the Fainapotter Kingdom, Lenberg, and Mason. The small countries nestled between the Fainapotter Kingdom and the Lowen Kingdom, such as Seeger, together with Lenberg and Mason, were collectively known as the countries of the South Central region. They shared a common faith in the God of Knowledge and Wisdom. The southern continent had already fallen under the dominion of the various powers of the northern continent. Whether it was the Balam Empire, the Pas Kingdom, the Hajeni Kingdom, or any of the other nations, they had all but lost their autonomy. Yet still, a fierce resistance against colonization burned in the hearts of the conquered. In addition to the Berserk Sea dividing the northern and southern continents, there were other great seas, the Fog Sea to the west of the Intus Republic, the Sonia Sea to the east of the Lowen Kingdom, the North Sea to the north of the Faisak Empire, and the Polar Sea to the south of the southern continent. They were collectively known as the Five Seas. Of all the nations of the northern continent, the Lowen Kingdom was the strongest, with the Intus Republic close behind. The Faisak Empire, defeated in the last war, had fallen to fourth place. The Fainapotter Kingdom had risen to third place. And among the countries of the South Central region, Lenberg reigned supreme. Compared to the simple folk in Cordu who only knew of the Intus Republic, the Fainapotter Kingdom, and Lenberg, Lumian was practically a cartographer. It was no surprise really, considering the Cordu village shepherds only traveled to their neighboring kingdoms of Fainapotter and Lenberg. They only had a limited understanding of these lands. The people in the northern villages of the Dirij region were just as provincial. Other than the surrounding settlements, they could only name Trier, Suet, and a few other metropolitans. Lumian was often baffled. How did Aurora come by such vast knowledge? All the textbooks he read were penned by Aurora, and all his practice exams were prepared by her. Aurora had an answer for every question in the books he read. But what stunned him even more was her expertise in various forms of combat. It was simply mind-boggling that a woman in her twenties could accumulate so much wisdom. Some people couldn't amass that much knowledge even after living fifty or sixty years. Could it be that these are the building blocks of a true warlock? Lumian looked up again and gazed at Aurora, lost in thought. As Aurora patted her cheeks while reading, she hardly seemed like a scholar or a warlock. Aurora caught Lumian's gaze and demanded, What are you ogling at? Lumian quickly changed the subject, Last time you mentioned that I possessed the knowledge required to pass the college entrance examination? Aurora pondered for a moment before responding, In theory, you could gain admission to any university, but since I never took that particular exam, I can't say for certain what questions will be asked. Roselle sure did a number on the populace. Sigh, I guess it's a good thing. Undoubtedly, Emperor Roselle's reign spawned the college entrance examination, and it has remained a fixture of academic life to this day. Aurora's mind suddenly shifted gears. She shot Lumian a sly grin and inquired, Why did you not make your usual stop at the tavern today to regale the patrons with your tales? I'm not truly an alcoholic, Lumian replied while flipping through his magazine. Reading at home is equally enjoyable and it helps to calm my nerves and ease my mind. Lumian silently added. 
Aurora nodded and glanced over at Lumian's spot in the corner of the room. Why are you sitting so far away, putting on an act of pitifulness, weakness, and helplessness? Come closer. You need proper lighting to read at night, otherwise, your eyes will suffer. Aurora sure has a way with words, Lumian mused. Although I understand the meaning behind pitifulness, weakness, and helplessness, it's still an odd combination. Supposedly used to her idiosyncrasies by now, Lumian retrieved a chair and moved closer to the desk where Aurora sat. The two of them spent the evening reading in silence, occasionally chatting, as the sound of their breathing mingled with the rustling of pages and the soft breeze that wafted in from outside the window. Peaceful and soothing. As he bid Aurora good night, Lumian slipped back into his quarters. He peeled off his coat and draped it across the back of the chair. He couldn't risk bringing the wand card to bed with him, that would only raise suspicion, and his sister had sworn to keep a watchful eye on him at all times. Just as he was about to approach the bed, Lumian froze, his heart skipping a beat. His sharp eyes darted around the room, and he adjusted the chair that was usually positioned at a diagonal angle to face the window. Then, he crawled into bed and extinguished the kerosene lamp resting on the cabinet next to him. As he drifted off into the depths of slumber, Lumian was suddenly startled awake. The bedroom was shrouded in a dense, gray fog. Lumian, who was already mentally prepared, calmly took in his surroundings and made a realization. The chair that he had meticulously arranged before retiring for the night was still positioned at an angle in his dream, just as it had been in reality in the past. This suggested that the dream world he had entered was not an exact reflection of reality. Perhaps it was a manifestation of his deepest subconscious desires. Although Lumian couldn't decipher its meaning, he knew that it was something to be remembered. He walked over to the window, placed his hands on the sill, and gazed out. The mountain made of brownish-red stones and reddish-brown soil, and the collapsed buildings that surrounded it, were still present. The eerie silence of the place was deafening. Time quickly passed. After much contemplation, Lumian made a firm decision. He would embark on a preliminary exploration of the area tonight. His past life on the streets had turned him into a man of action. He didn't rush downstairs, however. Instead, he opened the cabinet and began to pile on clothes. He didn't need them to keep warm, but he wanted to increase his defense ability in this way. He grabbed a cotton shirt, cotton pants, and a leather jacket, stretching his body to feel the fit. Any more clothing would only hinder his agility, and that was crucial in a situation like this. As he adjusted to his current state, Lumian had a sudden thought. This is my dream. Can I get whatever I want? With that intention, he muttered to himself, I want a breastplate and a revolver. I want a breastplate and a revolver. The room was still shrouded in a thin, gray fog. This won't do. This dream is special. His disappointment was palpable, but he quickly regained his composure and made his way to the bedroom door. Stepping out into the corridor, he found himself in complete darkness. It was murky and dim. Lumian pushed open the door to Aurora's bedroom and then her study. The layout was slightly different from reality, but he recognized it immediately. The biggest difference, of course, was that Aurora was nowhere to be found. The entire scene was frozen in shades of gray. The first floor was no different. Lumian scanned his surroundings, searching for a weapon to defend himself. He knew his home better than anyone else and quickly found two viable options. The first was a two-meter-long fork made of steel. Aurora had said that it was effective and outstanding as long as the target didn't have a long-range weapon. The second was a sharp, iron-black hand axe. Ah, why not both? Lumian couldn't help but think of Aurora's oft-repeated phrase, but he quickly dismissed the idea. Today was all about reconnaissance. He needed to be sly, hidden in the shadows. Lugging around a cumbersome weapon would only hinder his movements and give him away. Taking a deep breath, Lumian stooped down to retrieve the axe. He rose to his full height and set off towards the door, barely visible in the misty haze. With a deft hand, he opened the door, not making a sound. Chapter 10, Blood 
As Lumian stepped out the door, he felt as thought he was transported to another world. Before him lay no longer the familiar Kordu, but a dark red mountain peak and the collapsed buildings surrounding it. Together, they formed a strange ruin. The fog in the sky was thick and pale, making it difficult for light to enter. The ground was shattered, and there were many rocks. Lumian gripped his axe tightly and inched forward carefully, his heart pounding in his chest. Along the way, he couldn't find a place to hide. There were no weeds or trees. Lumian walked in fear, his every sense on high alert. All he could do was hunch his back and comfort himself. At the very least, if there was any danger in this area, it would be obvious at a glance. He could discover it in advance. Finally, he arrived at the ruins, a half-collapsed building that had been wrecked by fire. Lumian surveyed the area for a moment and tentatively confirmed that there were no other creatures lurking about. Satisfied with his assessment, he cautiously made his way inside the building, being mindful of the charred wood that could fall at any moment from midair. As he searched the room, his eyes landed on a broken pot in the corner of the house. There was a hint of gold shining through the cracks. Lumian approached the pot slowly and realized that it was a gold coin. Can it be true? There's actually treasure in the ruins of my dream? He picked up the gold coin and wiped it against his body. The patterns on the surface of the coin were revealed. The coin featured a man's portrait carved on the front. His face was thin, and his hair was parted thirty to seventy. There was a mustache on his lips, and his gaze was rather firm. On the back was a bunch of sweet iris flowers surrounding the number twenty. Lumian recognized the man depicted on the coin. It was none other than the first president of the Intus Republic, Levanx. It's actually a Lewis door. Lumian was rather surprised. Firstly, he couldn't believe that the currency in this strange dream ruin was actually the currency of the Intus Republic in reality. And secondly, he had casually picked up something as valuable as a Lewis d'Or. He knew that in the present day, the legal currencies of the Intus Republic were Verl d'Or and Coppet. One Verl d'Or was equivalent to 100 Coppet. Coppet existed in the form of copper coins and silver coins. The copper coins were divided into three categories, one Coppet, five Coppet, ten Coppet, while the silver coins had the denominations of 20 Coppet and 50 Coppet. Verldor could be found in the form of silver coins, gold coins, or banknotes. In silver coins, there were denominations of 1, 5, and 10 Verldor, while gold coins came in 5, 10, 20, 40, and 50 denominations. The denominations of banknotes were even more varied, ranging from 5, 20, 50, 100, 200, 500, 1000 Verldor. In reality, the people of Intus still clung to the old currency units. For example, the most widely used five Coppet copper coins were known as Lick. Similarly, gold coins worth 20 Verl were commonly referred to as Louis d'Or. In the old currency era, Louis d'Or had been known as Roselle. But after the Republic was established, the name was changed to Louis d'Or in order to erase Emperor Roselle's influence. As Lumian understood it, even in the rural area of Cordu, a Louis d'Or could sustain a poor family with fields for an entire month. He knew that without Aurora's high income, he might never have even seen what a Louis d'Or looked like. In fact, in the entire village of Cordu, only the siblings and the family of the administrator had ever seen or owned a Louis d'Or. To any villager, this Louis d'Or was an incredibly valuable gain. Unfortunately, this is just a dream. Lumian couldn't help but feel a pang of disappointment. This was something ordinary, making it unlikely he could bring it out of the dream. But even so, he handled the Lewis door with great care and respect. Having spent much of his life wandering, he knew the value of every coppet. And he knew that one Lewis door was equivalent to 2,000 coppet, which was equal to one gold pound in the Lowen Kingdom, though slightly less. According to the papers he had read, 24 Verl d'Or could only be exchanged for one gold pound. Lumian continued his search for any written information that could shed light on the ruins and their history. He wanted to see if this place corresponded to a certain location in reality, and whether a village in the Intus Republic had been transported into this dream world. 
the appearance of the Lewis door had only fueled his curiosity. As Lumian moved cautiously through the ruined building, his eyes fell upon a spot where a stove had once stood, now stained with a dark red color. Blood? His pupils dilated as he quickly made a guess. Immediately after, he made a judgment. Although it wasn't fresh, it hadn't yet turned black, it looked as though it had just dripped there two or three days prior, or perhaps even more recently. As his heart began to race, Lumian suddenly felt the light around him dim, as if something had silently blocked the light filtering through the dense fog from above. The memory of past attacks flooded Lumian's mind like a turbulent wave, causing him to react instinctively. Without a thought, he lunged forward and wrapped his body in midair, rolling on the ground to avoid any potential danger. Thump! A loud thump echoed through the air as something heavy fell behind him. Lumian quickly rolled to the left side of the dilapidated stove, using a nearby rock to leverage himself around. As he rose to his feet, axe at the ready, he saw an additional figure standing where he had just been moments before. The dim light made it difficult to discern whether it was human or some kind of humanoid creature. The figure hunched in front of Lumian was unlike anything he had ever seen before. It was a monster, with no clothes or shoes to speak of. Its skin had been peeled off, revealing the red muscles, blood vessels, and yellowed fascia beneath. Sticky liquid dripped from its body, yet it didn't fall to the ground. It was a monster. Its eyes seemed to be embedded in its face, and its mouth hung open with all its might, revealing uneven teeth and a long drool of saliva. Despite all the ghost stories Lumian had fabricated in the past, he never expected to encounter such an evil spirit in real life. Whoosh! The stench of blood filled Lumian's nostrils as the panting of the monster filled his ears. Instinct took over Lumian as he dodged to the side, narrowly avoiding the blood-red monster's attack. Lumian knew that he had Aurora's guidance and years of experience fighting on the streets to thank for his quick reflexes. Without them, he might not have been able to react in time. Taking a deep breath to calm himself, Lumian charged after the monster that had pounced on him. With his sharp axe in hand, he swung with all his might and struck the monster in the back. Bang! Lumian's axe felled the monster mid-turn, sending a spray of pus and blood in every direction. Without a moment's hesitation, Lumian knelt down on one knee and raised his axe again, ready to strike another blow. Bang! 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 Again and again, Lumian swung his axe with precision and force, each strike slicing through the monster's flesh and leaving deep, wide cracks on the back of its head, neck, and back. Finally, the monster lay still, defeated by Lumian's fierce barrage of blows. Huff! Puff! You don't act as terrifyingly as you look. Lumian heaved a sigh of relief, his voice tinged with a hint of mockery. He wiped his face with his left hand, then used it to wipe off the blood on his other hand. Is this monster's bodily fluids poisonous? For the time being, there's no pain of the fluids eating at me. Lumian began to worry about another problem. Just as Lumian mustered up his courage and was about to search the monster's body, he was caught off guard by a sudden movement. The skinless, blood-colored monster propped itself up with both hands and bounced up again, as if it were still alive. It isn't dead yet? Despite being slashed to such a state, it seemed that the monster was still alive. Lumian was shocked and afraid. Fear and trepidation took hold of Lumian. If Lumian had been facing normal humans, beasts, or monsters, he would not have been so afraid, even if he couldn't defeat them. But this monster in front of him seemed unkillable, rendering Lumian's every move useless. Taking advantage of the monster's brief disorientation, Lumian made a quick decision. He propped himself up with his feet, exerted strength on his knees, and ran wildly. Thud! 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 He ran with all his might, but he could feel the monster's breath on the back of his neck, and the sound of its heavy breathing echoed in his ears. The monster followed closely behind him. Despite his fear, Lumian gritted his teeth and allowed his fear to push himself to run even faster, surpassing his previous limits. To his delight, he soon realized that the distance between him and the monster was no longer shortening. Thud! 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 
Lumian finally reached his semi-subterranean two-story building as he pulled open the unlocked door and jumped inside. With a loud clang, he slammed the door shut and quickly made his way to the stove, where he picked up a steel fork that was leaning against the wall. Then he focused on the door. But then, he heard the sound of the monster's running footsteps fading away. He waited, but the monster didn't try to slam through the door. It knows that I'm lying in ambush here. Lumian couldn't believe that the monster had higher intelligence. He slowly moved towards the window near the door and peeked out. Suddenly, a face appeared on the glass, a bloody, skinless mess with uneven teeth. Lumian froze for a moment, his heart almost stopping. To Lumian's surprise, the monster didn't try to break the glass or attack him. Instead, it simply met his gaze. Lumian snapped out of his daze and retreated, brandishing the long fork with both hands. The monster left the window. Lumian watched cautiously, observing its movements as it lingered in the light fog for a while before finally retreating back to the ruins. Lumian was at a loss. He had been prepared to trap the monster and make a quick escape from the dream, but the creature had simply left without attacking. After some thought, a possibility occurred to Lumian. Perhaps the monster is afraid to enter my house? Yes, there's no signs of damage to the house at all. In the dream, this is an absolutely safe place. With this realization, Lumian felt a sense of relief wash over him. Lumian was hit with a wave of exhaustion the next second. The short chase had taken more out of him than an entire afternoon of combat training. Lumian made his way upstairs to his bedroom, clutching the pitchfork and axe tightly in his hands. As he lay down on the bed, Lumian attempted to fall asleep. Lumian opened his eyes, feeling disoriented and groggy. Outside the curtains, it was still dark, and the room was shrouded in shadows. For a moment, Lumian couldn't tell if he was still in the dream world or if he had somehow returned to reality. But then he noticed the lack of gray fog and the fact that he was wearing his pajamas, and he realized that he must have woken up. I woke up early because of the fright, Lumian muttered to himself, subconsciously patting the pocket of his pajamas. But when he didn't feel the weight of the Lewis door, he felt a pang of disappointment. It confirmed another fact, that money couldn't be brought out of the dream world. Lumian took a deep breath and composed himself, his thoughts turning to a serious problem. How was he supposed to deal with that unkillable monster? While Lumian knew that he could bypass the area and enter stealthily, he also knew that this was not a long-term solution. The possibility of encountering similar monsters in the future was always there, and he couldn't afford to risk his life by being unprepared. Chapter 11 Madame Puali's the azure sky was speckled with fluffy white clouds, gently blown by the spring breeze that carried with it the fragrance of the forest. White geese pecked at the lush grasses, grazing beside the meandering river. A lass, draped in a grayish-white frock, stood intently observing them with a long pole in her hand. Her countenance was bathed in the golden sun rays, exposing her thin, downy hair. The girl's brown tresses, elegantly tied in a white cloth, revealed her youthful and lively features. Glancing at Lumian sitting under a tree by the river, Ava Lizier scrunched her face slightly. Are we not here to discuss which legend is easier to investigate? Why have you turned into a stone statue reminiscent of the ones from the cathedral? Ava was the daughter of Guillaume Lizier, the shoemaker. Being one of the few youths in the village, she had an amiable relationship with Lumian and Raimond. I'm contemplating a problem, Lumian responded, still gazing at the white geese and the rippling waters. What problem? inquired Raimon Gregg, who was tending to Ava's flock of geese. Lumian pondered before replying, What if you come across a beast with a thick hide that your weapon cannot pierce, what would you do? Obviously, I'd find a way to flee. The mountains are teeming with wild beasts. We need not hunt it, Ava replied, feeling that there was nothing to worry about. Lumian grunted in disagreement. What if that beast is exceptionally rare, and the lords in the city adore it, and are willing to pay a hundred Louis d'Or for its carcass? A hundred Louis d'Or, two thousand verl d'Or. Raimon breathed heavily. He had never seen a Louis d'Or before, nor had he used one. 
his instinct was to convert it into Verldor first. With such a hefty sum of money, he could start a small business in Darish. He wouldn't have to fret over shepherding anymore. He quickly thought and suggested, borrow a shotgun? The beast's skin cannot be penetrated, Lumian rejected flatly. Even though she knew the prey was just a figment of imagination, with no value in the real world, she couldn't help herself. Is it a powerful creature? Fierce? Lumian paused to consider her question. It's about as fierce as me. That was all the assurance he needed to continue his hunt. Raimund, who had been holding his breath, let out a sigh of relief. Good. Go back to the village and round up some people. We'll surround the beast and drain its strength. Once it's down, we'll tie it up. He knew that Lumian could fight, but that was all. In that case, we can only expect to get ten Louis d'Or, or even less, Lumian reminded. Ava, with her stunning lake blue eyes, had an idea. I've seen them hunt before. Maybe we can dig a trap and make it fall. That way, we won't have to worry about it getting back up. Lumian nodded his approval. That's a good idea. Realizing that Ava and Raimund had little to offer in terms of planning, Lumian took control of the conversation. Which legend do you think we should target next? he asked. Ava shook her head. Neither of them fit the bill. They're either centuries old or were only seen by one person, who is long dead. Raimund agreed. That's right. If you don't ask the right folks, how would you know there ain't no clues? Lumian clicked his tongue and chuckled. You lot don't have any grit. If you want to give up at the first sign of trouble, you might as well be tending geese and sheep for the rest of your days. Ava and Raimund were fuming at Lumian's words. When it came to riling people up, Lumian was one of the best in all of Kordu. Ava blurted out, I don't think any of them are suitable cause there are more suitable ones. What is it? Lumian's eyes sparked with interest. As soon as Ava spoke, she regretted it, but she'd been planning to bring up this issue. She just didn't want to reveal it to Lumian and Raimund so easily. After a few seconds of tense silence, she glared at Lumian. There's a real witch in the village. Who is it? Lumian's heart tightened. Could it be Aurora? If Ava found out that Aurora was a warlock, he and Aurora would have to flee Kordu and go somewhere else to avoid the Inquisition's wrath. Ava looked around nervously and lowered her voice. Madame Puales. Madame Puales, the administrator's wife and the Padre's mistress? Lumian found it hard to believe. Are you serious? If Puales was indeed a witch, how could Lumian have missed it when he found out about the lady's affair with the Padre? No way? Raimon was exceptionally surprised. Ava tiptoed and looked in the direction of the village entrance. I'm not certain, but Charlie, the administrator's valet, let it slip once. He told me that Madame Puales is a sole messenger who can talk to the dead and help them return home. He also said that she can create secret medicines and charms. Lumian listened intently but remained skeptical. With magazines like Psychic, Lotus, and Hidden Veil flooding the market, it wasn't uncommon for the administrator's wife to be familiar with such terms and trick the servants and villagers. We should go to the cathedral and snitch, said Raimund, his eyes wide with excitement. Lumian paused before responding, if Charlie knows that Madame Puales is a witch, then the administrator should know as well, right? We, agreed Ava. Lumian continued, Madame Puales is also the Padre's mistress. If we go to the cathedral and snitch on her, we will probably be sent straight to the administrator. What? Madame Puales is the Padre's mistress? Ava and Raimon were shocked. I saw it with my own eyes. Lumian chuckled. Pretend you don't know. Don't tell anyone. Otherwise, you might disappear one day. Ava and Raimund agreed in unison, their expressions unusually solemn, their fear of the Padre and the witch intertwined. If we can confirm that Madame Puales is a witch, we'll go to Darige and tell the bishop at Mass, Lumian assured them. We, Raimund nodded fervently. They had to be sure before they snitched. Otherwise, they would be in trouble if Madame Puales was innocent. 
After discussing these matters, Lung Mian, who didn't want to waste any time, stood up and said to Ava and Raimund, I'm off, back to my studies. Otherwise, Aurora would be chasing me with a wooden stick. You two take care of the geese. Okay. Raimon was thrilled at the prospect of being left alone with Ava. Ava looked displeased. As Lumian approached Kordu, he began to hide his tracks, constantly paying attention to whether there was anyone nearby. He had to be careful, especially now that the Padre and his crew were on his tail. According to his observations, the Padre, Guillaume Benet, was not one to forgive easily. He made his way towards Old Tavern, trying to stay as inconspicuous as possible. Suddenly, he heard the sound of bells ringing in the distance. Lumian turned to see Ryan, Leah, and Valentine approaching Naroka and the others. The bells on Leah's veil and boots rang clearly and melodiously. They've been wandering around the village for the past two days, chatting with people and asking questions. I don't know what they are up to. Lumian was puzzled and a little weary. As he thought about the deserted town square and the shepherd, Pierre Barry, who had returned to the village unexpectedly, Lumian knew that something was about to go down. Is something about to happen in the village? He needed to speak to Aurora, his smart and knowledgeable sister, and get her opinion. Lumian managed to sneak into Old Tavern and spotted the woman who had given him the tarot card sitting in her usual spot, eating. Lumian leaned over and took a glance. Amelette Olard? Don't you find it a little too cloying? In Darish, this dish was the go-to for ordinary folks to impress their fancy guests. Lumian, however, had his doubts about it being too greasy and heavy for city women. The lady savored a slow bite of the golden omelet and shut her eyes to savor it. It's a real gem. It's got this local flavor that's just exquisite. You're having lunch so early? Lumian asked, seated across from her. The lady's light blue eyes betrayed a hint of exhaustion as she smiled and replied, It's breakfast. What time is it? Lumian didn't dare let slip his thoughts. He scanned the nearly empty old tavern and hushed his voice. I saw ruin in my dream and came across a monster. Oh. The lady didn't bat an eye. Her expression even held a hint of teasing mischief that Lumian couldn't quite decipher. Lumian composed himself and recounted his tale. How do I vanquish this monster? The lady beamed and encountered, is it dead or alive? It's still kicking. I can't seem to kill it. Lumian trailed off then answered on reflex. He pondered in earnest for a beat before replying slowly, I can feel it breathing. So, it's gotta be alive. If it's still breathing, then try harder. Lop off its head. Or pour oil and light it up. Bury it alive, even. Who knows? It might just kick the bucket, the lady suggested nonchalantly while relishing her meal. When you've exhausted all options and still come up short, then come to me. But I'm not your nanny who'll coddle you through every little problem. If you want to learn, you've got to figure it out on your own. She's quite the charmer. Lumian wasn't crestfallen or dispirited. It seemed the lady was hinting that she'd lend a hand if things got truly dire. And a monster like this wasn't even worth mentioning. But what's trivial can be a real headache. Lumian felt a migraine coming on. He resolved to heed the lady's advice. He'd start by trying to behead it, burn it, bury it alive, and anything else he could think of. Chapter 12, Undercurrents as Lumian left Old Tavern, he resumed his surreptitious ways, skulking down the path he always took home. Sure enough, he spotted one of Pons Benet's goons hiding behind a tree, spying on passersby. The Padre doesn't know when to quit. Lumian muttered to himself. But Lumian couldn't retaliate. His personal abilities were limited, and he couldn't risk bringing attention from the Church of the Eternal Blazing Sun in the Dirige region. The Inquisition would be all over him in a heartbeat, which could spell doom for Aurora. Unless Lumian was pushed to the brink and had no other choice but to abandon the town, his only option was to expose the Padre's unsavory activities and force him to retire to a cloister. But that was easier said than done. Lumian needed to be careful and cunning, 
just like when he let the foreigners discover the Padre's affair with Madame Puales. Lumian didn't want to make a big fuss about it. He knew that Beast, the administrator and territorial judge, was a stickler for his reputation. If Lumian brought Madame Puales's predicament to light, he wouldn't get any favors in return. No, it would be more likely that Beast would turn on him, filled with bile and vitriol. That would leave Lumian with little choice but to flee Cordu, with both the Padre and administrator hot on his heels. He proceeded with caution, taking a detour through a narrow alley that weaved between several houses. Along the way, Lumian relied on his wits and the surroundings to conceal himself. He ducked behind walls, slipped through doors, and took refuge behind trees whenever necessary. As he neared the end of the alley, he heard the sound of voices. Guillaume, why we waste our time chasing Zach Keat all day? Let's go to Aurora's house tonight and catch him. We have a Z advantage of numbers, and Aurora's fighting skills ain't enough to stop us. We can even get reinforcements from Z City if needed. Guillaume. The Padre is here too. Lumian stopped, retreating into the corner to eavesdrop on their conversation to see what plans the Padre had for him. Guillaume Benet's voice was mesmerizing. Surely, you don't think that's the extent of Aurora's capabilities? I wouldn't be surprised if she had supernatural abilities beyond mine. Ah. Pons Benet was obviously surprised. A witch, you say? Guillaume, maybe it's time for you to venture to Dirige and seek out Z Inquisition. If you can catch a true witch, Z Church will undoubtedly grant you a great reward. And with that, you may finally attain Z extraordinary strength you've been yearning for all these years. Imbecile, Guillaume Benet scolded his brother. Don't you know what's happening in this village? The Inquisition has noses like hounds. They won't overlook any anomalies. When the time comes, we'll be in hot water. Even if Aurora desires to deal with us, I have other solutions, he said. We mustn't arouse the Inquisition's attention. So, what is happening in the village now? Lumian took this seriously and was curious. Combining his observations of abnormalities, he sensed that something terrible was brewing and developing in the village, like a turbulent undercurrent under the calm sea. To Lumian's dismay, Pons Benet didn't elaborate on the topic. Instead, he focused on something else. Do you have any way to deal with a witch? You don't need to know, the Padre, Guillaume Benet, responded in a hushed tone. Next, we can put aside dealing with Lumian, but we still have to maintain appearances. We can't let anyone suspect my desire for revenge. That will provide the connections the foreigners need and have a negative impact. What you need to do now is to remind each relevant person and scare those yokels who might notice. Don't let them spill the beans in front of those foreigners. Guillaume, you mean that those foreigners are heir to investigate that matter? Pons Benet appeared fearful and concerned. Look at you. All brawn, no brains. You're nothing like your brother, a natural-born leader. Lumian mocked Pons Benet inwardly. Despite his disdain for the Padre, whom he saw as a crude and greedy stallion rather than a man of the cloth, Lumian couldn't deny that he had a certain rugged charm. His direct, domineering style and clear mind won over the masses in the countryside, making it easy for them to idolize and rely on him. Guillaume Benet sneered. No need to worry. So long as those foreigners don't find any real evidence, I'll still be the Padre of Cordu. Pons, you need to understand that ruling through fear and intimidation won't lead to peace or prosperity. The church doesn't want a ruined town that can't pay taxes. We need friends and followers to maintain control. By offering them protection, we can gain their support. The church trusts us locals with our relatives, friends, and followers to handle matters here and doesn't bring in outsiders who could make a mess. As long as there's no solid evidence, the higher-ups will continue to believe in me. All right, I'm off to the cathedral. That does sound logical and persuasive, but your wisdom and insight are limited to Darish. Aurora told me that when the church confronts villages that are overrun with evil gods, they obliterate them entirely and raise the land to the ground. They don't just slay the adults, but even the kids. Lumian found himself almost swayed by Guillaume Benet's words. 
Luckily, Aurora had warned him about the fearsome reputation of the Church of the Eternal Blazing Sun and the Church of the God of Steam and Machinery. After the Padre departed, Lumian took a different path and made it back home unscathed. Aurora, clad in a pristine apron, bustled about the oven. What are you up to? Lumian inquired with curiosity. It was still two hours to lunchtime. Aurora tucked a strand of her blonde locks behind her ear and beamed, trying out a new toast recipe. Rice bread. You don't have to go through all this trouble. Lumian was moved to his core. He believed Aurora was going out of her way to make something special just for him. Aurora giggled and retorted, What are you thinking? Can you be any more self-absorbed? For me, baking is a form of amusement. It's a great way to pass the time. You get it? Then why don't you like going out? There's plenty of fun out there, Lumian probed. He always felt Aurora was a homebody because she was too concerned about the risks her warlock status posed. Aurora swiveled her head and shot him a withering glare. You mean drinking and gambling? Remember, I'm my own person, not relying on or attaching to others. Lumian grasped the first half of her statement but was at a loss with the latter. Ah. Uh, could you expound on that? Aurora gave him a deadly glare. Long story short, your sis is a major introvert most of the time. What do you mean by most of the time? Lumian queried, confused. Humans are walking contradictions, Aurora mused, turning back to the oven. Don't you recall? Sometimes, I'm a chatterbox, eager to venture out and listen to the old lady's gossip. Other times, I'll play with the kids and regale them with tales. Every so often, I'll cut loose and ride Madame Puali's horse around the mountains, hollering at the top of my lungs. At the time, you shone like a dew-kissed rose, luring people in only to prick them. Lumian couldn't help but grumble to himself. Since Madame Puali's was mentioned, Lumian decided to change the subject. Aurora, ah, uh, grande sir, I heard a rumor about Madame Puali's. What is it? Aurora did not hide her curiosity. She's a warlock who can talk to the dead. Lumian related to his sister what Ava had divulged. He also brought up the anomaly he'd observed and Guillaume Benet's comments. Aurora halted her work and listened to her brother's account intently. Her mien grew noticeably graver. After Lumian had finished, Aurora offered him a smile and assuaged his fears. Don't fret too much. Those three foreigners must be here for something that the Padre and his comrades did in secret. It might have to do with Madame Puali's. Don't mess with Madame Puali's for now. I'll keep an eye on them. Explore the village more, mingle with those foreigners, and try to suss out what's going on. Hehe, <laughs> compared to that, the lady who gave you the wand card is far more intriguing. If things do deteriorate, we must contemplate departing Kordu. We can start making arrangements now. Okay. Lumian nodded in agreement. After a brief silence, he inquired curiously, Aurora, if we must depart Kordu, where do you envision moving to? Trier. Aurora declared without hesitation. Trier was the capital of the Indus Republic, the apex of culture and art across the continent. Why? Despite considering Trier himself, Lumian posed the question casually. Every intention coveted a chance to visit Trier. In the eyes of the Triers, there were only two types of individuals in Intis, Triers and Outsiders. Aurora responded nonchalantly, a prophet once said, as long as Trier endures, mirth and glee will never falter one. Chapter 13 Attempt It was the dead of night, and all was quiet. Lumian stirred in his dream once more. The first thing he glimpsed was a faint gray mist. On impulse, he reached into his shirt pocket with his hand. The frigid sensation of cold, hard metal immediately registered in his mind. He retrieved the object he'd felt. A glint of gold illuminated his eyes. It was a gold coin. A Lewis door. It's still here. Lumian sat up and peered down at himself. He still donned the cotton attire, pants, and leather jacket from his last expedition. 
The nearly two-meter-long steel pitchfork and sharp, iron-black axe rested within arm's reach. This was precisely the same condition as when he'd exited the dream. In other words, this dream is persistent. It doesn't reset with each entry. Lumian fiddled with the Lewis door and slipped it into his cotton shirt's inner pocket. Though it couldn't be actualized, it was still a joy to have. Lumian rose from bed and gazed out the window for a spell, ensuring the red mountain peak in the ruins hadn't changed. He hoisted his axe and pitchfork, departed his chamber, and entered the dimly lit corridor. Aurora's bedroom and study doors remained ajar. Lumian studied them briefly, then suddenly conceived an idea. In the dream, my room is practically identical to reality. It contains all the expected elements. Aurora's room appears the same at first glance. However, can I locate her witchcraft notebook, secret potion formula, or learn how to become a warlock in her quarters? This notion was akin to a devil's whisper, causing Lumian's heart to race. He was tempted to try. Compared to exploring the unknown, hazardous, enigmatic ruins, sifting through Aurora's room was the simpler, safer option. No, no! Lumian shook his head vigorously and cast the idea aside. He'd rather take his chances than violate Aurora's privacy. He wouldn't venture into her bedroom without her approval. This was due to his respect for Aurora. If it weren't for Aurora, he would have perished as a child on the streets five years ago. Lumian withdrew his pained gaze and made his way to the stairs. If the occupant of the room wasn't Aurora, he would have already delved into search for useful information. Once downstairs, Lumian didn't hasten his departure. Instead, he inspected the provisions in the kitchen. The olive oil, corn oil, and animal fat that Aurora had amassed were neatly arranged in buckets and cans, just like in reality. Almost instinctively, Lumian lifted the bucket of corn oil and positioned it near the stove. His sole reason for selecting it was that animal fat and olive oil were pricier. Then he adeptly kindled a blaze in the hearth with coal and wood, and fashioned a couple of torches to ignite. He was preparing to incinerate that monster. Naturally, it would be preferable if there were other options. That was a last resort. After completing these tasks, he retrieved his axe, opened the door, and departed. Lumian then observed something unusual. The faint gray mist that suffused the dream felt more humid than before. The ground beneath his feet was also slightly muddy. It rained? This place persists and develops naturally according to certain laws when I'm absent or dreaming? Lumian was somewhat taken aback, but he had an inkling that it was only fitting. Recalling Aurora's bizarre tales, he suddenly had a notion. This can't be the real world, can it? My dream is connected to the genuine world. That tarot card enables me to traverse the barrier between dream and the ruins while conscious. Lumian swiftly surveyed his surroundings and realized that an endless gray fog bordered both sides of the ruins, on the dream's periphery. I'll check later. I won't venture into the ruins. I'll stroll out of the gray fog and see if it's a surreal and irrational dream after passing through the gray fog, or if there's tangible land, sky, village, and town. If it were the former, it signified that this place was still a dream. If it wasn't, Lumian had to confirm which world this was. He surmised that based on the usage of the Lewis d'Or, this place still appeared to be in the Intus Republic, but it might not be the present era. It could be a location that had vanished decades or centuries ago. However, Lumian sensed that there was a high likelihood that he wouldn't be able to exit the encompassing gray fog. He gathered his thoughts and proceeded toward the ruins. He didn't forget that the purpose of entering the dream was to attempt to contend with that monster. After traversing a hundred to two hundred meters in the muddy wilderness riddled with gravel and crevices, Lumian abruptly halted. He thought of a problem. He'd overlooked something in his preparations earlier. Previously, his two-story abode lacked any flames. It was quite secure in this world cloaked in gray fog. But now, it had a blazing furnace that emitted light. Would it draw on a swarm of monsters and render the safe zone unsafe? Lumian instinctively turned his head and peered in the direction he'd come from. 
he observed that a scarlet gleam had been etched on various glass windows at the base of the half-submerged two-story structure in the faint gray mist. It was akin to a beacon in the dark world. Considering that a considerable amount of time had elapsed, it was evidently too late to attempt to extinguish the fire. Lumian hastened his pace and entered the ruins, taking refuge in the building that had crumbled due to a conflagration. He clipped the axe to the back of his belt and agilely scaled the wall, concealing himself in a shadowy nook separated by bricks and timber. Lumian gazed at his home on the other side of the wilderness. As time ticked by, he didn't witness any monsters lured by the fire. Seems like the fire won't trigger any changes. At the very least, my house won't be besieged by monsters. Lumian breathed a sigh of relief. This meant that even if he encountered any peril, as long as he could flee home promptly and slumber as soon as possible, he could successfully elude it. He began to contemplate how to entice and eliminate the previous monster. From their brief skirmish, he deduced that its strength, speed, reaction time, and agility were similar to his, but he could sense that it fought on instinct. It lacked sufficient experience, expertise, or corresponding intelligence. That's why he'd been able to counter and slay it when it ambushed him. It'll also be bewildered and taken aback. It's not dissimilar to humans. Other than combat techniques, I have two other advantages over it. Firstly, I possess superior intelligence. Secondly, I know how to wield weapons and utilize tools. This is the greatest advantage humans possess over such monsters. As long as I'm cautious, defeating it again won't be arduous. The most crucial aspect is how to eradicate it completely. Just as Lumian was about to deliberately stir up some commotion to see if he could lure over some monster, he spied a figure stealthily approaching the utterly ruined house on the side. The figure was crimson and devoid of skin. Its muscles, blood vessels, and fascia were exposed. It was the monster from last time. Unlike before, this monster was wielding a manure fork. A manure fork. It knows how to wield weapons too. Lumian's countenance stiffened as his expression turned grim. Unwittingly, his confidence waned a bit. As the monster drew closer and turned, Lumian perceived exaggerated wounds on its back, neck, and the nape of its neck. However, the fissures were no longer oozing pus, and it appeared to have mostly mended. It's indeed the one I encountered previously. Its self-healing ability is many times superior to that of ordinary humans. Lumian gasped soundlessly. He compelled himself to compose and expeditiously assess the situation. In the twinkling of an eye, Lumian arrived at a determination. This was a prime opportunity, and he had to seize it when he encountered it. He couldn't let it slip by. He silently retrieved a stone brick beside him and awaited the monster's arrival at the desired location. In just a few strides, the monster entered Lumian's kill zone. Lumian abruptly hurled the stone brick at the ground behind the monster. Thud! The stone brick clattered, causing the monster to swivel around and scrutinize the assailant. Upon beholding this, Lumian seized the axe with both hands and pounced fiercely from the wall towards the monster. Bang! The axe descended heavily onto the monster's neck, cleaving it in two. With twin thuds, Lumian and the monster plummeted to the ground simultaneously. Lumian sprang up nimbly, seized his axe, and darted over, delivering weighty slashes to the monster's neck. Once, twice, thrice. The monster didn't even get a chance to resist before its head was lopped off. As the head rolled aside, the skinless body convulsed twice and ceased movement. Lumian didn't halt there. He took a diagonal step, rotated his axe, and pulverized the vicious head with its thick back, reducing it to fragments. Subsequently, he pivoted and hacked at the exposed muscles, blood vessels, and fascia, crushing the heart and other vital organs. After accomplishing all of this, Lumian took two paces backward and surveyed his handiwork. He panted and chuckled softly. I thought you were truly invincible. Who'd have thought you possessed so little ability? Amidst the subdued laughter, the decapitated cadaver abruptly jolted upward. Lumian's pupils contracted, and he instinctively wished to pivot and flee. 
he forcefully quelled this impulse and strode forward once more, brandishing his axe. After the corpse bounced twice, it reverted to immobility, as if it had writhed in vain. Lumian scrutinized it a while longer and ultimately verified that the monster was wholly deceased. How tenacious! Lumian sighed inwardly. Then, he leaned over and crouched down. He employed his axe to pry open the muscles and fascias and scrutinize the corpse. The monster's bodily structure wasn't dissimilar to a human's, but its muscles were evidently more animated. Even though it was already dead, some of its incisions were still wriggling slightly. There's no treasure, nor is there any supernatural power transferred into my body. Lumian assessed his present state and felt somewhat disenchanted. The adage that one grows stronger with each monster they slay indeed only existed in Aurora's tales. He then relocated the monster's corpse and head into the ruined building and entombed them with bricks and timber. Subsequently, he scoured the burnt-down house, hoping to discover something. Chapter 14 Different Monster After a bout of searching, Lumian stumbled upon a considerable number of gold coins, silver coins, and copper coins. In total, there were 197 Verl d'Or and 25 Coppet. Among them, Louis d'Or alone constituted five. As for the paper bills, he only discovered some suspected remnants. Aside from money, Lumian also discovered a small blue book. The book had a grayish-blue cover and measured approximately 21 by 28.5 centimeters, a typical size found in Intus villages and towns. It was an almanac mixed with the religious teachings of the two major churches. It had a rather positive effect on guiding farmers and herders to farm, produce, and graze to enrich their spiritual lives. Naturally, even though it had been nearly two centuries since Emperor Roselle advocated compulsory education, there were still a large number of farmers, herdsmen, and workers who knew no more than a handful of words and were illiterate. They could only rely on the explanations of certain people around them to obtain the instructions they needed from the Blue Book, literally known as Lever Blue. Lumian flipped through a few pages nonchalantly and realized that the Lever Blue was no different from his own. It was just that it appeared a little older overall. There's the lever blue and so much for door, this family is undoubtedly well-to-do in the countryside. There are more than five such families in Cordu. Lumian discarded the lever blue and placed the gold coins, silver coins, and copper coins into different pockets. Some were stashed deep in the cotton shirt's pocket, some were tucked into his pants pocket, and some were haphazardly stuffed into the pocket of his leather jacket. Even though Lumian knew that this wealth couldn't be brought to reality, he couldn't resist collecting it for safekeeping. These little trinkets of gold, silver, or copper were simply irresistible. During his days as a vagrant, he cherished every coin he came across, even if it was just a coppet or a lick. He often fought with others for them and took risks to obtain them. After scouting the area, Lumian hoisted his axe and crept towards the collapsed building closer to the reddish-brown mountain peak. He proceeded deeper and deeper. Every time he traversed the empty space in the center of the ring, he was apprehensive that dozens of monsters would suddenly ambush him in an area without cover. In the faint gray fog, Lumian crouched down and sneaked behind a half-collapsed stone wall. He squatted there and utilized it to conceal his form. He cautiously poked his head out and surveyed the area ahead. It was a narrow strip between two rows of destroyed buildings. There were no trees, no weeds, just gravel crevices, and dirt. Suddenly, a figure jumped into Lumian's line of sight. It stood in the opposing building, staring at something. This figure was garbed in a black robe with a hood. From the back, there was nothing peculiar. It appeared to be an ordinary human. Lumian's heart constricted as he became even more watchful. In such a dream ruin, the appearance of a regular person was far more terrifying than the appearance of a monster. As if sensing that someone was observing him, the figure swiveled around slowly. Lumian snuck a quick glance before retracting his head hastily. He leaned against the wall and didn't dare to budge. With just one look, he had the impression that he had descended into hell or an abyss. The figure was indeed a human, but he had three faces and six eyes. 
The face in front had cloudy eyes, sparse eyebrows, and numerous wrinkles. He was evidently an old man. The left side was a chiseled face with sharp-looking blue eyes and a thick, black beard, making him appear like a burly man. The skin on the right side was smooth and delicate, like a peeled egg. The blue eyes exuded obvious innocence and ignorance. It didn't seem a day over five years of age. What kind of monster is this? Lumian attempted to regulate his breathing to prevent his heart from racing. Such a monster had never surfaced, even in Aurora's horror tales. Only in the deepest and most absurd nightmares could it be encountered. Although it was not good to judge a person by their appearance, Lumian instinctively sensed that the three-faced monster was far more powerful than the skinless monster from earlier. Furthermore, there was a high probability that it had exceptional abilities. Eternal Blazing Sun Great Father, please protect me from being discovered by it. Upon witnessing this scene, Lumian couldn't help but pray to the eternal blazing sun. If he weren't still clutching an axe in one hand and was in a perilous environment, he would have extended his arms, a gesture symbolizing the adoration of the sun. At that moment, time appeared to stand still. Lumian believed he might be hallucinating. It was as if someone's stare pierced through the wall and landed on his back. His back stiffened instantly and felt somewhat warm. In just a second or two, the illusion vanished, and heavy footsteps receded into the distance. Lumian waited a while until the footsteps dissipated completely. Then, he gradually straightened his knees, turned around, and poked his head out to survey the area ahead. The monster was farther away, having arrived behind the collapsed building whose two sides still stood. Half of its body was visible in the faint gray mist. It still had his back to Lumian, as though it had transformed into a statue. Lumian breathed a sigh of relief. He didn't have the confidence to confront such a monster. It's definitely impossible to venture deeper into the ruins from here. Should I circumvent it? Won't there be comparable monsters elsewhere? The closer I approach that mountain peak, the more potent the monsters that emerge? Lumian retracted his body and deliberated for a while before deciding to conclude the night. He intended to inquire with the woman who gave him the tarot card after daybreak to see if there was a means of dealing with the three-faced monster. If there was no alternative, he would consider taking a detour. He arched his back, detached from the wall, and headed in the direction he came from. At that moment, he had a notion. If I slumber in these ruins, will I be able to escape the dream? Considering the possibility of numerous monsters in the vicinity, he suppressed the urge to experiment, for now. On the way back, he hastily searched every destroyed building he passed, but he couldn't unearth any useful written information. There were only a few coins. After retreating for a while, Lumian conceived a notion and decided to take a detour. He approached the burnout house that he encountered first from the side, where he had buried the skinless monster. He wanted to see if the monster's demise would be detected by its kin and if it would result in any changes. After locating the spot and concealing himself, Lumian poked his head out from the side and scrutinized the target area. In the following moment, he caught sight of another figure. The figure was half human and half beast. Its legs were bent forward as it squatted there and inspected the skinless monster's cadaver. It had already removed the stone bricks and wooden blocks that Lumian had stacked. It wore a dark jacket and relatively snug muddy pants. Its black hair that hung to its neck was unkempt and greasy, and it carried a shotgun on its back. A shotgun! Lumian averted his gaze hastily and withdrew his head. These monsters are truly absurd. They actually know how to wield a shotgun. At that moment, Lumian felt like he was a hunter hunting in the mountains with his weapon and comrades, only to discover that the rabbit opposite him was clutching a water-cooled machine gun and targeting them. He considered it ridiculous and immersion-breaking, as well as disappointing. As time elapsed, he waited patiently for the monster with the shotgun to depart. Finally, he discerned a faint sound of movement, gradually receding. Lumian stuck his head out cautiously once again and examined the monster that was half-human and half-beast. It moved like a cat towards the back of the building. Initially, Lumian's heart eased, but then his eyes widened. 
he realized that the path the monster took was precisely the same as the route he took when he ventured deep into the ruins. It's tracking me. It has an extraordinary tracking ability. Lumian made a subconscious evaluation. He was exceedingly grateful that he had opted for a detour when he returned. Otherwise, he would have certainly collided with it and might have even been ambushed. As soon as the monster vanished, Lumian sprang up and dashed towards his house. The crimson fire that reflected in the glass window on the ground floor of the house was akin to sunlight that could dispel darkness. Lumian sprinted all the way to his two-story building, yanked open the unlatched door, and rushed inside. After locking the door, he gazed at the ruins through the window. Far from the gray mist, at the edge of the ruins, there stood a faint figure, but it didn't approach. Phew. Lumian exhaled and planned to extinguish the fire, ascend upstairs to slumber, and exit the dream. He glanced at the still-burning fire and murmured to himself, it can still burn for a while. I can experiment and see if it continues to burn until it extinguishes after I depart the dream, or if it is frozen in time the moment I leave. Lumian had previously verified through the rain that the wilderness where the ruins were located was undergoing natural development. It had nothing to do with whether he was dreaming or not, but whether the same situation was transpiring in his house or the so-called safe zone remained to be verified. He acted on his notion. He added a few more coals to the fire and fiddled with them. Then, he carried the axe and steel fork to the second floor and entered the bedroom. When Lumian arose, it was just after daybreak. He inspected his shirt like pajamas. As anticipated, he was disheartened to discover that the gold coins, silver coins, and copper coins did not accompany him into reality. Lumian exited the bed and stretched his body. He sauntered to the desk and extended his hand to draw the curtains. Amidst the sound, a mild and refreshing radiance trickled in. As the window opened, fresh and organic air invaded Lumian's nostrils. He couldn't help but extend himself, feeling that waking up early was quite pleasant at times. Of course, this was also owing to the patriotic public health campaign that Emperor Roselle had launched. It was also thanks to the subsequent rulers who had preserved it and only altered its name. He surveyed his surroundings, sometimes gazing at the far-off forest, sometimes scrutinizing the orange-red clouds in the sky, and sometimes observing the weeds outside the house. Suddenly, Lumian's stare froze. He spied a larger bird perched on an elm tree not far away. It had a pointed beak, a feline face, brown feathers with scattered spots, brownish-yellow eyes combined with black pupils, giving it a sharp appearance. It was an owl. It appeared to be observing Lumian. Chapter 15 Getting Information That owl? That owl from the warlock legend? His mind raced with possibilities, trying to comprehend the gravity of the situation. His blood seemed to freeze. It was worse than facing the three-faced monster. After all, this was no longer a dream. This was reality. Even if his demise in a dream led to the same in reality, it was different psychologically. What should I do? Will Aurora be implicated? As Lumian racked his brain for a countermeasure, the owl remained still, observing him with a piercing gaze. After a few seconds, the owl spread its wings and flew towards the distant forest. Its graceful glide carried it down, down, until it vanished into Kordu. Only when the owl had completely vanished did Lumian's mind snap back to the present. He slumped into a chair and lifted a hand to his forehead. He was drenched in sweat. Is it truly the owl of the warlock legend? Has it truly lived for so many years? In any case, it was unlike any other owl with dull eyes. It almost looked human. If it's really that owl, why did it choose to fly just outside my window? Is it because I want to uncover the truth about the warlock legend? But we've already given up. It left after a few moments of observation. I wonder if it will return and cause trouble for Aurora. Despite wanting to observe the situation further since nothing had happened yet, Lumian knew he couldn't keep it from his sister any longer. After leaving the room, he saw that Aurora was still asleep. He went downstairs to prepare breakfast, all of which were his sister's favorite dishes. 
sunny side up, meringue cookies, ordinary toast with jam. I have to make noodles later. This time, I'll add meat sauce. Lumian mentally noted that the noodle compartment was empty and decided to refill it sometime in the next two days. It was Aurora's favorite dish. Aurora descended the staircase in a flowing nightgown, her golden locks tousled. The breakfast spread was readied. Morning, she mumbled, stifling a yawn. Lumian grinned at her. It's not getting early. Don't you always say a day's planning starts early in the morning? That's right. My plan is to sleep. Aurora settled into her seat and tucked into her breakfast with a glass of milk. Lumian sat across from Aurora at the table that could fit six. As he nibbled on a pancake, he casually said, I've been in the village for the past few days trying to find out the truth about those legends. Why? Aurora asked. Lumian was very frank. You didn't want to help me get supernatural powers, so I decided to find my own way. Those legends might contain clues. It's almost impossible, Aurora commented, her tone casual. The legends have been twisted beyond recognition over the years. Or hallucinated by some loony. It's meaningless. Yes, it's also possible that someone specially made up a story as an excuse. Hehe, <laughs> and the contributions of rubberneckers like you. What? Lumian didn't understand what Aurora meant by rubbernecker. It wasn't even intision. It means people who can't help but get involved in drama they have no business in, Aurora explained simply. And judging by how you are suddenly raising this matter, I'm guessing you've caused some trouble and now have no choice but to come home to ask your sister for help. It can be considered an accident, but it's not to the extent of causing trouble, Lumian said, undaunted. Lumian organized his thoughts carefully. My first target was the warlock legend. What warlock legend? Aurora's confusion was palpable. Lumian couldn't believe it. You've never heard of it. A long time ago, a person in the village suddenly died. When he was buried, an owl flew over and stopped by his bed. It only flew away when the corpse was lifted. After that, the corpse became very heavy. It took nine bulls to pull the coffin. Only then did the villagers know that the person was a warlock when he was alive. Aurora was listening intently. I really wasn't aware of such a legend before. It doesn't make sense. Lumian was incredulous. Aurora may have been a homebody, but she still made time to socialize with the other old ladies in town. She loved telling stories to the children and was always up to date on the latest court of gossip. It was hard to believe she hadn't heard about the warlock legend that had been circulating for years. But what was even more intriguing was the fact that her house was built on the very spot where the warlock's home once stood. Lumian had a hunch from the start that Aurora's decision to settle in Cordu was driven by the allure of the warlock's treasure, the key to unlocking extraordinary power. And then? Aurora asked calmly. Lumian answered truthfully, we did some digging around and we got confirmation from the village elders. This wasn't some tall tale. The warlock really did exist, but that was decades ago. The church burned the house down, and now the land belongs to you. Is that so? Aurora was obviously a little surprised. I knew it. There's always a catch. Why else would they sell me this land at a price lower than the norm? I thought it was because of my gift of gab, when it came to old ladies. She thought for a moment and asked, so, the church burned the warlock's body? Lumian nodded. Yes. His ashes are buried in the cemetery beside the cathedral. He continued, we've given up on this matter because all the clues led to a dead end. But this morning, I saw an owl outside my window. It looked just like the one in the legend. Aurora's expression became serious. Are you certain? I can't say for sure but it didn't look like any ordinary owl, Lumian responded objectively. Aurora pondered for a moment before saying slowly, don't leave the village for now. And after dark, don't step outside until I've finished investigating the situation. She gave a sour smile. I've warned you before about the dangers of seeking supernatural power. But look, trouble has already found you. 
Unfortunately, it seems that the other party doesn't have any malicious intentions. The problem should be resolved relatively easily. I'm glad you're on guard. Lumian lowered his head and said straightforwardly, Grande sir, I was wrong. He changed the subject. Did your pen pals write back? How can it be that fast? It's not like we're sending e, a, uh, post. Aurora scoffed. Lumian was puzzled. Isn't post already referring to letters and packages sent through the post office? He was not too concerned. After all, Aurora often used strange words. At the entrance of Old Tavern, Lumian stood there and surveyed the area. He knew that the woman who had given him the tarot card wouldn't be awake yet, so he was looking for the three foreigners, Ryan, Leah, and Valentine. As expected, the trio was enjoying a lavish breakfast at a table inside the tavern. Lumian observed them for a few seconds, taking in a spread of trout rolls, wine, and mayonnaise bread, before leaving without disturbing them. Some time later, as Ryan and the others prepared to continue strolling around Cordu and chatting with the locals, Lumian approached them with open arms and a bright smile. Good morning, my cabbages. Valentine's face twitched, and between Ryan and Leah, one looked slightly embarrassed while the other looked amused. Ah, they're dressed exactly the same. Did they not bring many changes of clothes despite being out? Lumian noticed that Leah was still clad in a snug pleated cashmere dress, a small white coat, and a pair of Marcelin boots, each adorned with a small silver bell. Her veil, which doubled as a hat, also had bells attached to it. Ryan was still sporting a drab duffel coat and pale yellow strides, topped with a rough dark bowler hat. And Valentine still had powdered hair and makeup on his face. Good morning, Lumian. What brings you here? Ryan asked calmly. Lumian looked aggrieved as he responded, Well, you guys are my friends, and I have nothing to do. I thought I'd come visit. He then questioned them, I noticed that you've been chatting with people in the village for the past few days. Is there anything you want to ask? You can come to me if you have any questions, my cabbages. I'm your friend. We can't trust your answer, Valentine interjected. Ryan shot him a look, signaling him to calm down. Lumian smiled. So you can completely trust the others? Leah was at a loss for words, while Ryan thought for a moment before responding, actually, we can't completely trust anyone. We have to make a comprehensive judgment based on the answers we get from different people and the situation we observe. That's more like it. Lumian spread his hands. Well, then it wouldn't hurt to hear my answer. At least it's a reference. Ryan was silent for a moment before glancing around. The early morning in Cordu was bustling with people heading to the farmlands, but there was hardly anyone near Old Tavern. Here's the deal, he said finally. We're here to find someone. The Padre? Lumian asked with a smile. Ryan shook his head. No. We visited the Padre to find this person. Who is it? Lumian asked with interest. I know everyone in the village. I should be able to help. Ryan did not show any joy. Actually, we don't know who this person is, how old they are, or what they look like. We received an unsigned letter some time ago, and we're trying to find the person who wrote it. Lumian couldn't help but wonder if the letter was from an informer. He feigned puzzlement. Did the person who wrote the letter not reach out to you after you arrived in the village? No, Leah replied for Ryan. Perhaps they don't feel safe and don't trust you. Lumian suggested eagerly. Can't you glean any clues from the contents of the letter? Lumian was curious about the letter's contents. If it was targeting the Padre's crew, he'd be happy to help them. But if it involved Aurora, he'd urge his sister to move. After all, Aurora communicated with her pen pals frequently, and if any of them were caught, she could be implicated. The letter could be a crucial clue. Chapter 16 Letter Ryan shook his head. The letter was just two simple sentences. It seemed like a man in deep trouble was seeking our help. Did he not mention what kind of trouble he was in? Lumian breathed a sigh of relief. 
There was no way a letter from Aurora or her pen pals could be that short. Nothing, Ryan replied with a soft sigh. Lumian couldn't help but mock them in his heart. It's just a letter asking for help, and you're here? Aren't you afraid this is just a prank? Even the people from the Inquisition aren't as enthusiastic as you. Isn't this too nice, too kind, and too missionful? Normally, he would have voiced these thoughts aloud, but he needed to get information from them, so he held his tongue and forced himself to be patient. Despite his reservations, Lumian knew that Ryan wouldn't reveal the entire situation to him. They must have other considerations or reasons for coming to Cordu and searching for the person who wrote the vague letter. Ah. Uh. Lumian stroked his chin and suggested tentatively, why don't you show me the letter? Perhaps I can identify the writer from their handwriting. Valentine, with his powdered hair, gave Lumian a look that said, do you think we're fools? Leah chuckled. Do you know how to appraise handwriting? Barely, Lumian admitted sincerely. He then added inwardly, being able to appraise auroras in my own handwriting is also considered a form of appraisal. It's useless, Ryan interjected, shaking his head. Every word in the letter came from a lever blue, and the entire sentence was comprised of cut slips. Lumian couldn't help but wonder why the writer was being so cautious. Why hide their identity in such a way when they were asking for help? Were they afraid of interception and retaliation, or was there something wrong with them that they didn't want to be exposed? Lumian tried to analyze the writer's mentality. Lumian put on a look of realization and said, So you've been chatting with people in the village to see if anyone else has experienced similar damage to their lever blue? But the person who wrote the letter could have purchased a new lever blue without anyone knowing, or even thrown it away after using it. That's just one of the leads we're following, Ryan explained calmly. Lumian didn't treat himself as an outsider at all and asked, Are there any other leads? Well, if someone is asking for help, then something must be happening, and there will always be some traces left behind, Ryan responded after some thought. That makes sense, Lumian said, looking troubled for Ryan and the others, as if he could empathize with their situation. He promised solemnly, My cabbages, I'll keep an eye out for you. Hopefully, we'll find some clues. Thank you, Ryan replied politely. Leah had regained her composure and asked Lumian, since we're friends, I have a question for you. Go ahead. Lumian smiled. Why did the villagers in the tavern laugh when you called us cabbage? Leah was rather intrigued. Although it was embarrassing, cabbage was a common local slang term, and it shouldn't have been a cause for laughter. Lumian explained sincerely, in slang, cabbage means darling or beloved. It's mainly used between intimate friends or between an elder and a junior. My bunny and my chicks are similar. He emphasized the word intimate as he spoke. Then, with an innocent expression, he added, I just wanted us to be intimate friends. Lumian's innocent expression suggested that he had no idea what intimate meant. More like you want to be our senior. Leah finally understood why the villagers were laughing. While Lumian's explanation may not have been entirely truthful, it was logically convincing. Ryan nodded in agreement. Is there anything else? Nope, Lumian replied, not wanting to appear too eager and arouse suspicion about him and Aurora. His sister couldn't undergo an investigation. After watching Leah and the others leave with the sound of the tinkling bells, Lumian sat at the entrance of Old Tavern and waited for the lady with the mysterious background to wake up. After a while, Lumian's friend, Raimon Gregg, approached him. Lumian, have you decided which legend to investigate next? Raimon asked. In the past two days, Raimon had been even more proactive than Lumian in this matter. After all, he didn't have any strange dreams or other ways of obtaining treasure. Not yet. The owl had already come knocking on his door. He couldn't risk investigating the legend without confirming the situation first. I'll think about it after the Lent festival, Lumian explained, trying to sound casual. Okay, that makes sense, Raimon agreed. I don't have to be a green watcher for the time being then. I'll head out after Lent. Even if there are grazers in the meantime, it won't cause much damage. Do you mean you don't have to leave the village for the next few days? Lumian asked Raimond. 
Raimon nodded in confirmation, and Lunian smiled. What a coincidence. I can't leave the village for the next few days either. Raimon was confused. Why not? he asked. Lumian lowered his voice and spoke with a serious expression. This morning, I met the owl from the warlock legend. It said that if it weren't for the cathedral and the gaze of God in the village, it would have taken my soul and thrown it into the abyss. Raimon was shocked and frightened, and his entire body trembled. Is that for real? I told you not to provoke such an evil creature. Raimon suddenly saw a smile appear on Lumian's face. Dot. Only then did Raimon remember his good friend's nature. You're pulling a prank on me, it's a lie, isn't it? He asked, feeling both angry and anxious. He was angry at himself for falling for Lumian's deception yet again. He knew what kind of person Lumian was and had been fooled by him many times before. You believe such a ridiculous thing? Lumian chuckled. Quietly, Lumian added to himself that he had made up the story to prevent Raimon from going straight to the cathedral to repent when he couldn't withstand the pressure. Raimon relaxed and breathed a sigh of relief. Phew. Lumian offered some advice to Raimon. Although I made up that story just now, it's true that pursuing the truth of a legend can be dangerous. Try not to leave the village or the cathedral's protection if you can. Silently, Lumian added to himself, and that's the truth. Although most of the story was fabricated, half of it was true. I wouldn't have reminded you and shared Aurora's advice in a different way if I didn't need your help with many things in the future. Whether someone lives or dies has nothing to do with me. Raimond recalled the feeling of fear and nodded in understanding. All right. He changed the subject and asked, Who are you going to vote for to be the Spring Elf? The Spring Elf was the symbol of spring and the start of many celebrations during Lent. In the Dirige area, the whole village usually voted for an unwed, beautiful girl to play the role. Ava, Lumian replied nonchalantly. Hasn't she always wanted to be the Spring Elf? I'll choose her too, Raimon said, secretly relieved. Yesterday, Ava had hinted to him that she wanted him to vote for her, so he felt the need to help her canvas for votes. Outside a house not far from Old Tavern. Ryan, Leah, and Valentine weren't in a hurry to find someone to chat. Valentine raised his hand to cover his mouth and nose. Is it really okay to say so much to that guy just now? he asked. The air around them was filled with the faint smell of poultry feces. Leah fiddled with a silver bell above her head. I don't know if there's a problem. All I can confirm is that my divination results tell me he's of help. Ryan explained his intention. If we can't turn the situation around, leaking some information and instilling fear in the relevant people could be effective. Next, we'll observe him more closely and see what he'll do or who he'll find. After Raimon left, Lumian entered Old Tavern and saw the lady who had given him the tarot card in her usual spot. She was wearing a white blouse and a pair of baggy light-colored pants, and beside her hand was a round straw hat adorned with a few yellow flowers. She really has a lot of clothes in her suitcase. She changes them every day, unlike Leah and the others who look so shabby, Lumian thought to himself as he moved closer and sat opposite her. During this process, he casually glanced at her breakfast, which consisted of a plump mince pie with a thin sauce, a few dario less, cubed seasonal fruit, and a light-colored transparent drink with some impurities. This isn't something Old Tavern can provide. Lumian pointed at the drink on the table and asked the lady, as though they were close friends, what is this? It doesn't look like wine. It's called Venus Sacred Oil, the lady replied casually. It's made from sugar and cinnamon water soaked in vanilla and mixed with poppies. It was invented by a bar in Trier. The word Venus came from Emperor Roselle. He mentioned in a story that she was a woman comparable to a goddess of beauty. Lumian was intrigued. Where did you get it? Did you concoct it yourself? He asked, suspecting that the nearest city, Dirige, couldn't provide something similar. The lady smiled. As a traveler, it's my professional instinct to obtain suitable things at the right time. Lumian was honest. I don't understand. He then said, I've finished the previous monster. This time, 
I've encountered two even more dangerous ones. He went on to describe the monster with three faces and the one with a shotgun on its back. I feel that they all have powers that surpass ordinary humans. They're not something I can deal with. Is there any way to deal with them? The lady took a bite of the dariole and rolled her eyes. She smiled and said, I'm not sure about the three-faced monster, but you are more than capable of dealing with the one with the shotgun, as long as you use what's special about yourself. Lumian was both surprised and confused. A special trait. What's so special about me? I don't even know myself. The lady smiled at him and said, that's your dream. As the owner of the dream, you naturally enjoy special treatment. It's just that you haven't realized it yet. Chapter 17, Suspect Lumian was on edge, his mind racing with excitement and fear. What is it exactly? The woman took a leisurely sip of Venus sacred oil before replying in a calm, unhurried tone. You have to ask yourself that. Having said that, she lowered her head slightly and focused on enjoying her breakfast, giving the impression that she had no intention of continuing the conversation. Why do you keep parts of the matter untold and only answer at the next opportunity? Isn't this a waste of everyone's time? He couldn't help but feel inferior to her ability to infuriate others. Taking a deep breath, he forced a smile and bade farewell. Lumian obediently spent the rest of the day at home. This wasn't out of fear of the owl to the point of not daring to step out during the day, nor was it because he had nothing to do but to avoid arousing suspicion. Lumian was determined to get to the bottom of the help-seeking letter that Leah and her companions had in their possession. He needed to find out what was written and who wrote it. The key to his investigation was to flip through every lever blue in the village and find the one with words cut out. As a villager, Lumian was best suited for this task, but he was hesitant to proceed after talking to the three foreigners. It could attract someone's attention and cause unnecessary trouble. This was a matter of life and death, survival or doom, and Lumian knew that even with Aurora's protection, he couldn't guarantee that the other party wouldn't take any risky actions against him. In the past two years, he had become better at figuring out the threshold required for pranks. This was due to his rich experience. He planned on visiting every family in a few days, using the excuse of pursuing the legends related to Lent. After dinner, when it was dark, Aurora returned to her bedroom to finally write a manuscript that was long overdue. Lumian entered the study planning to find some books related to dreams to read, hoping to gain some special inspiration for his dream. As they only had one battery-powered table lamp at home, which was being used by Aurora, he had to light up the kerosene lamp that had a pungent smell and was not great for illumination purposes. Carrying the kerosene lamp that emitted a dim yellow glow, Lumian quickly swiped his other hand across the backs of the books. Occasionally, he would choose a book and clamp it under his armpit. After a while, he returned to the table with three selected books. Just as he placed the books in his hand, Lumian saw the lever blue at home. It was quietly placed in a corner of the desk as usual, and the gray-blue cover seemed a little dusty. Upon seeing this lever blue, Lumian instantly thought of the book he had obtained in the dream ruins and the book that had been cut and meshed into a plea for help. He reached out and picked up the lever blue in front of him, planning to flip through the content to see which words were suitable for cutting and piecing into useful sentences. After flipping through a few pages, Lumian's gaze froze. There was an obvious hole in the notes attached to the current calendar page. A word had been cut out. No way. Lumian whispered, extremely shocked. He quickly flipped through the lever blue in his hand and found more than ten words cut out. No way. Lumian whispered again, his reaction almost the same as before. The lever blue that Ryan, Leah, Valentine, and the others were searching for turned out to be the one at home. Not only had they not expected it, but Lumian had never even fathomed this possibility. It didn't even cross his mind. Amidst the indescribably complicated emotions, Lumian frowned. Could it be Aurora who requested help? Why did she seek help from the officials? Why didn't she tell me? 
Based on Leah and the others' behavior, their habitual choice to discuss matters with the Padre as soon as they arrived, and other details, Lumian made a preliminary judgment that they were officials. They could be from the government, Dirige's Eternal Blazing Sun Church, or the God of Steam and Machinery Church. Lumian hesitated, his expression constantly changing. Finally, he made up his mind. He took the lever blue and walked out of the study to Aurora's bedroom. He planned on asking her directly and chose to believe in Aurora. Knock! 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 Lumian bent his finger and knocked on the door. Come on in. Aurora's voice sounded. Lumian turned the handle and pushed open the door to enter. Under the bright light of the table lamp, Aurora, who was wearing a two-piece cotton pajama set, had bound her golden hair with a headband and was engrossed in writing a story. Did you cut this? Lumian asked, interrupting his sister before she could speak. Ha! Huh. Aurora turned around in confusion, her eyes blank and distant, as if she was still deep in thought. Lumian handed over the lever blue, which had been flipped to the corresponding page, and stared into Aurora's eyes. You didn't cut this? Aurora gazed at it carefully for a few seconds before looking up in amusement. Would I be so bored and childish? I'm steady, mature, and broad-minded, unlike you. Aurora's reaction was natural, and she didn't seem surprised or flustered that her secret had been exposed. Lumian didn't hide his confusion and asked, but who would have cut out words from the lever blue? Wasn't it you? Aurora sized up her brother. After reading my novel, you plan on mimicking what you read and cut out words from books and newspapers to create a random letter to play a huge prank on the village. But before that, you wanted to see if you could fool me? Are you testing my deductive abilities? This really doesn't seem like Aurora's doing. Lumian's gaze was fixed on Aurora's face, not letting go of even the slightest change in her expression, but his sister's performance was flawless. It wasn't me. Lumian frowned. Who could have done it? Aurora smiled. Go on and play your little game of deduction. I have a manuscript to finish. If I have time tomorrow, I'll help you figure out the truth. Using extraordinary means? Lumian tersely acknowledged her words and stopped disturbing his sister's creation. He took the lever blue and returned to his unlit room, sitting on the chair behind the desk. Who could it be? Under the illumination of the crimson moon, Lumian muttered, trying to make deductions. We are a family of two. Aurora is a warlock with extraordinary abilities. She won't let others ransack our home. If it's really not her, and in her words, when you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. So, in the case of having only two choices, I'm actually the one who did this. For a moment, Lumian found it absurd and funny. So I'm the criminal? Why don't I know that? Lumian couldn't help but turn his body and look at the full-body mirror attached to the wardrobe. Under the crimson moonlight, his mirror reflection was wearing a linen shirt and brown pants. His handsome features didn't have a smile on them, and his expression was abnormally heavy. He was very sure that he had never cut out the content from the lever blue. To eliminate the possibility, he recalled his experiences in the past month. Although many details were already a blur, he was still very certain about what he had done. Bathing in the crimson moon's light that seeped in through the windows, Lumian muttered to himself, Could it be that I did it when I was unconscious? While having that dream, I can sleepwalk in reality. No, that's impossible. Aurora said that she would watch me. If I really sleepwalked and cut the lever blue, she would have pointed it out just now. Moreover, the letter must have been sent during the day. I'm very awake during those times. Lumian eliminated himself and thought of other possibilities. Someone else who came here, perhaps. Although their family had few guests usually, it did not mean that they did not have any. Firstly, poorer neighbors would come to borrow the stove or oven to smoke meat or make bread. Secondly, Lumian's friends would come to his house from time to time to find some simple novels to read or listen to his stories. Lastly, Naisley, Madame Puales, and a few other ladies visited Aurora from time to time to have a chat with her. Among them, Madame Puales came the most. 
She even lent Aurora a pony so that Aurora could ride freely in the mountains. They were quite close. After all, in a village like Cordu, only an author like Aurora was worthy of Madame Puali's friendship. Madame Puali's appeared very amiable on the surface, often basking in the sun with the other women and chatting with them, and even catching lice with them. She had a good reputation in the village. Although Madame Puali's and Aurora could be considered friends, Lumian did not like her at all. Madame Puali's would often introduce one of her relatives to Aurora and persuade her to get married and have children as soon as possible. It would be fine if Madame Puali's relatives were nice, but every time Lumian asked around in Darige, he found that the other party either had bad character or was not very capable. They were about to fall into poverty, and none of them made the cut. The first time might have been a coincidence, but with it happening every time, Lumian bore a hatred for Madame Puali's. It's definitely impossible for those who come here to smoke meat or bake bread. There's always someone watching them. They won't be allowed to go up to the second floor. Raimund, Ava, and the others are also unlikely suspects. I'll accompany them the entire time. Madame Puali's, Naisley, and the other ladies have a certain chance. Every time they come, Aurora will keep them in the study to read while she prepares some snacks. If Madame Puali's is really a witch, then it's understandable that she needs to hide her identity from the authorities. Also, she is very careful to use other people's lever blue to avoid being traced back to her. Did she discover something when she was having an affair with the Padre? Did she have to protect herself in this way? The more he thought about it, the more excited he became. He felt like he was about to lock onto a suspect. He stood up, paced a few steps, and suddenly walked downstairs. He didn't want to question Madame Puali's, nor did he plan to pry into her actions now. Instead, he planned to find Raimund or Guillaume Jr. and use their lever blue as a comparison to determine which words had been cut out and what sentence could be formed. This way, Lumian could recreate the exact content of the request for help. He rushed down the stairs, through the kitchen, and opened the front door. The crimson darkness outside rushed in, instantly calming him down. Ah, Grande Sir said that before we figure out the owl's situation, I shouldn't go out after dark. Lumian muttered. He took two steps back and closed the door. Anyway, there was no hurry to borrow the lever blue. It would be more natural to do it tomorrow. After doing a stretch, Lumian walked towards the staircase. Ding 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 ding. The doorbell rang, the sound echoing through the house. Who is it? Lumian turned around in confusion, calling out as he walked towards the door. A slightly magnetic and gentle female voice sounded from outside. It's me, Pualis de Roquefort. Chapter 18, Straightforward Madame Pualis Lumian was shocked to see Madame Pualis standing outside his door. He had the illusion that someone had come to his place to silence him, but knowing that his sister was upstairs and had superpowers, he calmed down significantly. Exhaling slowly, Lumian walked over and opened the door. There were two women standing outside the door. The one in front was wearing a pure black and exquisite corset dress. She had a shawl of the same color on her shoulders, fishnet gloves on her hands, and a lady's round hat that was slightly slanted. She was dressed in black, with only a diamond necklace and laid with gold hanging on her chest. Her eyebrows were slightly thin, framing her bright, smiling brown eyes. Her long brown hair was tied into a high bun, and her facial features were not outstanding, but when combined, they had a clean and charming beauty. Coupled with her elegant temperament and graceful posture, it made the night at Lumian's door that was dyed a little red seem much fresher because of her. There was also a faint fragrance coming from her. Madame Puali's, the wife of the court of village administrator and the territory's judge, Beast. Lumian knew he had to add words like the mistress of the padre, suspected witch, help seeking suspect, and the fair naked body in the cathedral in his heart. However, these were not suitable to be said out loud. Otherwise, Madame Puali's would definitely change her expression on the spot. If he succeeded in angering her, disaster might follow. Madame Puali's, what's the matter? 
Lumian deliberately looked out at the sky, hinting that it was not appropriate for Madame Poalis to visit at this time. Madame Poalis's red lips were a little moist as she spoke softly, I'm here to discuss something with your sister Aurora. From her appearance alone, she did not look like a woman in her thirties with two children. She was at most in her late twenties. Lumian deliberated for a moment and made way. Aurora is upstairs, writing for her newspaper column, he informed the entering Madame Poalis. Poalis nodded and said to the lady's maid beside her, Kathy, wait for me downstairs. Yes, madam. Dressed in a black and white lady's maid outfit, Kathy took a few steps towards the warm stove. Lumian led Madame Poalis through the kitchen and towards the stairs. Madame Poalis stopped at the corner. What's wrong? Lumian turned around and pretended to be confused. Madame Poalis asked with a smile, Did you deliberately bring the three foreigners to the cathedral? She's finally here to question me. Lumian didn't panic but instead calmed down. Lumian's previous experience of pranking and infuriating people had taught him that at such times, he could not directly answer the other party's question, nor could he defend himself. The best choice was to blame the other party for making a certain error. Of course, this still depended on the situation. Turning around and running was an alternative. Lumian revealed a furious look as he gazed at Madame Poalis and said, You guys were actually having an affair in God's Cathedral. He then spread open his arms and seemingly gestured as though he was embracing the sun. Dot. My God, my Father, forgive the sacrilege of this guilty man and woman. Madame Poalis watched him quietly, the ends of her lips curling beautifully. I think God will forgive us. I read a book once that said, a lady who shares a bed with her true love is cleansed of all sins, for love legitimizes pleasure, as though from the purest of hearts. I'm very happy with Guillaume Benet. Therefore, the eternal blazing sun wouldn't be angry about this. It's not a sin. What kind of books are you reading, madam? Lumian couldn't help but inwardly criticize. But, Madame Poalis continued, this is indeed disrespectful to Saint Sith. Every region of Entis had one or two guardian angels or saints, recognized by the Church of the Eternal Blazing Sun or the Church of the God of Steam and Machinery's canon, or they had made special contributions in Entis's history. They were well known and respected by the two churches. In the Dirige region, the saint in charge of the Eternal Blazing Sun Church was Saint Sith. Every Eternal Blazing Sun Cathedral here could actually be called Saint Sith Cathedral. However, to differentiate them, only the largest and core cathedral was called that. Others had other names in place. Therefore, Madame Poalis and the Padre having an affair in the cathedral was equivalent to Saint Sith's butler secretly bringing someone home and doing the deed in his master's bedroom. It was a great disrespect to the patron saint. That's right, Lumian nodded solemnly. Isn't the Padre ashamed? Madame Poalis burst into laughter. After laughing, she said to Lumian, back then, I also persuaded him. I said, oh la la, how can we do such a thing in the cathedral of Saint Sith? Guess what the Padre said? He said, oh, then Saint Sith might have to put up with it a little. Lumian, who was inexperienced in such matters, was momentarily at a loss for words. He's blaspheming the saint. He finally managed to force out this sentence. Madame Poalis looked like she was reminiscing. That's how he is. He's bold and direct, like a bandit who breaks through the door to your soul while swearing curses. He's completely different from the gentleman in Dirige. Perhaps that's why I slept with him. That's just the normal behavior of some men in heat. Not to mention Saint Sith, even if a deity was there, he would make him wait. Despite his lack of experience, Lumian had read enough novels written by Aurora to know a thing or two about human desire. This belongs to having his mind controlled by his lower body. No, his head was already empty during that period, filled with another liquid. Madame Poalis smiled. I know that's the reason, but he did appear very charming in that situation. Haha, <laughs> you're indeed an inexperienced young man. Don't you know that the same words will make people feel differently in different environments and moods? I remember the first time I had sex with the Padre. He stood there, looked me in the eyes, 
and said to me, Pualis, I want to go deeper in understanding your body and mind. If it were any other time, I would only find him a crude and vulgar pervert. I would have called for help to stop him, but at that time, my body went limp. The mood was just right. Madame Pualis smiled charmingly. It's like, if I had my eye on any man, I'd say to him, how does my place tonight sound? If he really comes, I'll bring him straight into the bedroom and tell him, I want to make love with you. I love you. Lumian, as a man, how would you answer at a time like this? Lumian usually told dirty jokes to the men in the village. Although he was a little uncomfortable, he managed to keep his composure. He tried his best to recall the stories his sister had written and the novels written by other contemporary authors. After some deliberation, he said, Madam, you are my sunshine. Very talented. Madame Pualis complimented. As she spoke, she leaned forward, her eyes becoming moist. A warm breath immediately blasted Lumian's ear, and a slightly magnetic and gentle female voice sounded softly. I want to make love with you. At that moment, Lumian's heart couldn't help but tremble. His body felt numb, as though he had received an electric shock from touching a broken electrical lamp. He immediately took a step up the stairs and said to Madame Pualis, Aurora should be waiting for you. Indeed. Madame Pualis straightened her back with a smile on her face. It was as if nothing had happened. This woman. Lumian suddenly felt a little afraid of this woman. He turned around and reached the second floor in a few steps, with Madame Pualis following at a steady pace. Aurora was already waiting outside the bedroom when she heard the doorbell. What took so long? She looked at Lumian. Lumian explained vaguely, we talked about the cathedral. Aurora understood immediately. She gave her brother a look that said, pray for good luck from the eternal blazing sun. Dot. She turned to Madame Pualis, who had just arrived on the second floor, and asked with a smile, what's the matter? I wanted to talk about the preparations for Lent. I might need your help with a celebration, Madame Pualis said with a smile. You caught me at a bad moment. Aurora found an excuse to decline. Madame Pualis pointed at the door and said, How about you hear it first? All right. Aurora remained polite. Watching his sister and Madame Pualis enter the study and close the wooden door, Lumian nodded indiscernibly. Acting normally without showing any trace of returning to the crime scene. Suddenly, an idea struck him like a bolt of lightning. There is a high chance that Madame Pualis is a female warlock. Can I get supernatural powers from her? It would be much more convenient and safer than facing that all head-on while searching for the truth of the warlock or exploring the dangerous dream ruins. After all, I have to unlock the secret as soon as possible to eliminate any hidden dangers. It's less risky once I obtain superpowers. But Lumian soon became vigilant and shook his head. He then self-reflected, how can I think that way? I don't even know if Madame Pualis is a friend or foe. How can I seek supernatural power through her? Yes, her actions didn't paint her to be a good person just now. She even made me feel a sense of danger. What's wrong with me recently? Am I too hasty and rash in pursuing superpowers? It's as if I'll die if I don't obtain them quickly. It had been nearly two years since Lumian discovered that his sister was a warlock. Though he had tried to obtain supernatural powers before, he had never worked as hard as he had in the past few days. No matter if the opportunity was good or bad, or if there was danger, as long as there seemed to be hope, he could not wait to come into contact with it. It was as if he was not picky with food after starving for ages. Phew. Thank goodness I sensed the problem in time. Otherwise, I might end up taking a more deviated and dangerous path. Lumian let out a long sigh, relieved that he had regained his normal state of mind. But he knew it was impossible to stop pursuing supernatural powers. He just needed choices. After all, the dangerous dream had already revealed itself, and the undercurrents in the village were getting more and more turbulent. Chapter 19 Meditation Madame Pualis and Aurora didn't talk for long. Ten minutes later, they walked out of the study. 
Lumian walked Madame Puales out of the door with his sister. He looked at his sister and asked, What did she want you to do? Aurora pouted and replied, She wanted me to be the lead singer at the praise celebration, but I refused. Cordu Village's Lent Festival had three segments, Spring Elf Blessing Tour, Waterside Ritual, Praise Celebration held in the cathedral. The last segment mainly consisted of playing musical instruments and choral singing. In the Dirige region, the lead singer was often from the cathedral choir, but Cordu could only seek out singers who were good at singing as alternatives. As for musical instruments, the villagers didn't worry about it. In villages with shepherds, music or musical instruments were indispensable in their daily lives. Shepherds lived in the wild all year round, either in shacks or pits. Other than their companions and sheep, the most common thing they interacted with was the flute they carried with them. Apart from grazing, playing cards, and chatting, playing the flute and using music to comfort oneself was something almost every shepherd would do. It was precisely because of this that the phrase used to describe a shepherd in a difficult and impoverished situation was he doesn't even have a flute. With so many shepherds around, it was inevitable that the other villagers of Cordu would be affected. When they gathered and chatted in the square, there would always be someone playing an instrument, causing the melodious melody to reverberate. Lumian was pleased to see his sister being steadfast. Okay, he said with satisfaction. Joining in the celebrations was enough. If one wanted to take center stage, it would be a waste of time and could attract unnecessary attention. In order to protect his eyesight, Lumian read for a while, then decided to wash up and turn in early. He considered how to safely test what was special about him in the dream. The lady's suggestions had proven accurate several times in a row, making Lumian unconsciously believe her completely. In the dead of night, Lumian entered the dream again and woke up there. He checked his pockets and confirmed that the 217 Vril door and 25 Coppet were still there. Letting out a sigh of relief, Lumian picked up his axe and steel fork and headed downstairs to the stove. The fire had already been extinguished. The clock continues spinning when I'm not dreaming. Lumian frowned slightly. How could there be anything special about him in such a real dream? The clock continues spinning was a common saying in the Dirige region, meaning that time waited for no man and never stood still. In the bedroom he deemed safest, Lumian put down his tools and undressed. He walked to the full body mirror attached to the wardrobe and checked his body inch by inch to see if there was anything different from reality. Nothing out of the ordinary. Mentally special? Lumian wasn't in a hurry to put his clothes on. Instead, he walked back to the bed and sat down cross-legged, like his sister often did when meditating. Aurora had previously taught him some superficial meditation techniques that did not involve mystical elements to foster lucid dreams. Now, Lumian wanted to try and see if he could sense anything special about his mind and body in a completely quiet scene. The first step was to regulate his breathing. Lumian deepened his breathing and slowed down the corresponding frequency. As he took slow, long, and rhythmic breaths, Lumian slowly emptied his mind. At the same time, he outlined a red sun in his mind and focused all his attention and thoughts on it to eliminate other messy thoughts. Aurora had instructed him to choose objects that represented light during meditation, in case he was targeted by vile, evil things. As a believer in the eternal blazing sun, Lumian's first reaction was to visualize the sun. Gradually, his mind calmed down, and in his perception, the entire world seemed to have only that red blazing sun left. Suddenly, Lumian heard something. It seemed to come from an infinite distance yet was ringing in his ears. The sound was unclear but had inklings of rumbling thunder. Amidst the indescribable buzzing, Lumian's heart began to race. It was as if someone had inserted a chisel into his head and stirred it a few times. An intense pain erupted, and the blazing sun turned as red as blood and quickly dyed black. The scene in his meditation shattered. Lumian's eyes snapped open, and he gasped for air. He felt like he was about to die. After almost twenty seconds, he finally recovered from the near-death experience. He instinctively lowered his head and examined his body, noticing something strange on the left side of his chest. A symbol that looked like thorns, 
black as night, seemed to grow from his heart and extend out of his body, connecting one after another like chains. Above these thorns were patterns resembling eyes and worm-like, distorted lines, all bluish-black. At this moment, the tattoo-like symbols were slowly fading. Lumian was first shocked, then had many thoughts. He quickly got off the bed and went straight to the full-body mirror, aiming his back at it. Then, he tried his best to turn his head left to check the situation on his back. He could barely see the chain made of black thorns drilling into his body from his back. In other words, this chain of thorns sealed his heart and corresponding body in the form of a ring. Lumian analyzed what was special about him that was unlike reality until the symbols completely faded and disappeared. The black and bluish-black symbols are different, and the bluish-black one looks familiar. Yes, it's very similar to the old man I helped when I was wandering. It was also from that time that I began to have dreams with large amounts of fog. Lumian found the symbols to be special but meaningless, which left him feeling disappointed. The process of making them appear was extremely painful, pushing him to the brink of death. In a state that nearly knocked him out, what was the difference between facing the monster with a shotgun and delivering food to it? And if he waited until he had the strength to fight again, the special trait would have almost disappeared. It was cold in the dream, like early spring in the mountains. Lumian found it uncomfortable being naked, so he quickly put on his clothes. Just doing such a simple thing made him extremely tired, and his head hurt again. Obviously, he couldn't recover from the impact the meditation had caused him in a short period of time. Under such circumstances, Lumian decided to give up exploring for the night and not make any attempts. He would sleep well and focus on recuperating. The sky was still dark when Lumian woke up. Looking at the darkness in the house and the redness near the curtains, he carefully recalled what had happened in the dream. I've meditated many times in reality, but I didn't hear that strange sound or feel any pain. It's something special that only exists in that dream? Lumian sat up in puzzlement, planning to confirm. He followed the procedure and tried meditating again. The red sun quickly appeared in his mind, and the chaos in his mind gradually settled down. This was a familiar meditation experience for Lumian. There were no strange sounds, no intense pain, and no near-death experience. After a while, he ended his meditation, unbuttoned his shirt, and looked down at his heart. There was no symbol there. Indeed, that's the special trait of the dream. It can affect reality. Lumian didn't know if he should be happy or disappointed. He raised his head and looked at the curtain that blocked the windows. His thoughts scattered as he thought about whether the special trait in the dream could be exploited, and how. At that moment, he saw a small shadow outside the window. Lumian's pupils dilated, turning high-strung as his instinctive reaction was to call out to his sister. But then he remembered that he was at home and Aurora had said she would watch over him, so she should have sensed it. Slowly and carefully, he approached the window, waiting for his sister to call an end to his actions. But Aurora did not appear. Lumian came to the window, grabbed the curtain, and cautiously pulled open a crack. Outside the window was the quiet and dark night. The crimson moon hung far away in the sky. On an elm tree not far away, an owl, larger than most of its kind, with eyes that were neither dull nor stiff, stood quietly, facing Lumian's window. It looked at Lumian with an indescribable look of superciliousness. That owl, it's here again. Lumian's heart was in his throat. Just like the last time, the owl looked at Lumian for about ten seconds before spreading its wings and flying deep into the night. Dot. Lumian was speechless. After a while, he drew the curtains and cursed, Is there something wrong with your head? You would come and take a look every single time, not saying a word before leaving. Are you mute, or is there something wrong with your IQ? Have you not learned human language after so many years? In fact, Lumian had his own guesses about the owl's actions. He believed that his sister's existence made it afraid to do anything. After all, Aurora had said that as long as he didn't leave the building at night, she could guarantee his safety. If he had stuck his head out of the window on impulse just now, the owl probably wouldn't have flown away quietly. 
After cursing for a while, Lumian decided to close the curtains and catch up on some sleep. He casually glanced outside and suddenly froze. More than ten meters away, at the edge of a small forest, a figure was slowly walking over. She wore a dark-colored dress made of coarse cloth, and her hair was thin and pale white. Naroka. Lumian recognized the figure. It was Naroka who he had asked about the legend of the warlock. Naroka's face blended into the darkness, and her eyes reflected a strange light under the faint crimson moonlight. Her movements were abnormally stiff, like a wandering ghost. Chapter 20 Customs Lumian subconsciously held his breath and shrank back a little. Naroka did not come in this direction. Slowly, she entered the small forest and disappeared into the deep night. Lumian was slightly worried. She doesn't seem right. Did something happen? Recently, there had been more and more abnormalities in the village. He looked outside for a while, and the night had returned to silence. Only the swaying leaves proved the existence of the wind. What are you looking at? Aurora's voice suddenly came from behind him. Lumian turned around and was delighted to see his sister, who was wearing a two-piece pajama set. Did you also notice something wrong? No, Aurora replied, her blonde hair slightly messy and fluffy from just waking up. Then she added angrily, I don't see anything wrong. All I know is that there's a guy who's up in the middle of the night, loitering at the window. It'll be dawn in an hour tops. How can it be considered the middle of the night? Lumian muttered out of habit. Then he asked, didn't you come over because of the owl? Didn't you see Naroka outside? Naroka? Aurora revealed a rare blank expression. Lumian recounted everything from the moment he woke up and realized that there was a black shadow outside the window to the strangely behaving Naroka walking into the forest. As for the special trait he discovered while meditating in his dream, he planned to consult the mysterious woman first before considering how to tell Aurora or hide it for a while to prevent his sister from stopping him from obtaining superpowers. Aurora furrowed her beautiful blonde brows. Something might have already happened to Naroka. Go check on them at dawn. Lumian asked subconsciously, what could have happened? How would I know? I didn't see her, there's no way I can make an accurate judgment, Aurora snapped back. You really didn't see her? Lumian thought that his sister had been monitoring him the entire time. Aurora scoffed. Do you think you can see whatever you want? If you see something you shouldn't, you have to consider which graveyard to bury me in. I won't look outside for no reason. I'll just monitor your condition. I'll only wake up if something's wrong. Lumian was stunned for a moment and couldn't help but blink. Grande sir is taking such a huge risk to watch over me. Aurora added earnestly, that's why I'm telling you, don't look at what you shouldn't see and don't listen to what you shouldn't hear. Pursuing extraordinary power is a very dangerous thing. Got it. Lumian nodded solemnly. At the same time, he thought to himself, it's precisely because it's dangerous that I can't let you go at it alone. After breakfast, Lumian followed his sister's instructions and headed straight to Naroka's house. As he approached, he saw many villagers standing outside the door, including his friends, Ava's father Guillaume Lizier, Raimund's father Pierre Gregg, and the Padre's younger brother Pons Benet. What happened? Lumian carefully circled around Pons Benet and the few thugs surrounding him and went to Raimund's side. Raimund replied sadly. Naroka passed away. Ah. Lumian was prepared for something to happen to Naroka, but he didn't expect her to be dead. Raimund rambled on. Before dawn, the Padre came to give her the last rites. She was still fine and energetic two days ago when we asked her about the legend of the warlock. Why would she suddenly pass away? Before dawn? Lumian was alarmed. He realized that it was precisely that moment when he saw Naroka. The exact timing of the Padre's last rites didn't make much of a difference. Lumian's mind raced with thoughts. So, what I saw was actually Naroka's ghost. This happened after the owl flew over. Can it really take away a human soul? Yes, Naroka was one of the witnesses to the warlock incident that happened back then. 
If I hadn't listened to Grande, sir, and went out after dark, I might have been the one the Padre did last rites with. Heh, his version of it for me is probably spitting at me. Raimund didn't chat with him. He stood outside the two-story house and quietly mourned Naroka. After Lumian reigned in his thoughts, he saw Leah, Ryan, and Valentine walking over. Did something happen here? Leah asked before Lumian could even greet her. They saw many people gathered on the road. Lumian sighed and said, My cabbages, an honorable old lady has passed away. Then why are all of you standing outside? Leah asked without offering any condolences, not fully convinced by Lumian's explanation. She was still wearing the same clothes as before. Lumian made an obvious sizing up gesture, which made Leah panic. What's wrong? Ryan asked. Lumian smiled. You're definitely not Dirige locals. We're from Bigor, Ryan answered frankly. Bigor was the provincial capital of the Intus Republic's Ristan province, while Dirige was a city on the southern border of Ristan province. It covered a large area, including the village of Kordu. Lumian nodded. It's no wonder you don't know the customs of the Dirige region. He had initially thought that these three foreigners were officials from Dirige, but it turned out that they were from the provincial capital, Bigor. Lumian silently updated his judgment of Leah and company. Looks like their status is much higher than I expected. Leah asked with interest, what kind of customs? Can you tell us? Lumian planned on forging a good relationship with them, so he smiled and said, you're my cabbages. Why wouldn't I tell you? As you know, everyone has their own corresponding horoscope. And in the Dirige region, we also believe that every family has their own horoscope that determines the amount of providence they receive. The death and funeral of the family, especially the head of the house, will take away such good providence. In order not to affect the horoscope and retain the providence, we will place the deceased in the center of a family before burial, which is the kitchen. Then, we will trim off some of her hair and nails and keep them in the house forever without letting them be discovered by any guests. At such a time, if a person attending the funeral enters the house, it will affect the corresponding horoscope and take away a portion of their providence. Therefore, we attend the funeral by morning outside. At most, we will look in from the door and wait at the cemetery beside the cathedral. I see, Ryan nodded in understanding. It's the same as how every cathedral in every region has holy bones stored. The sage is forever where a part of their body is. He turned to face Naroka's house, removed his top hat, placed it against his chest, and began to mourn. Leah and Valentine also expressed their condolences. When they were done, Lumian said to them, I'm going to the door to look at her. I'll see you later, my cabbages. Okay, Ryan replied with a gentle nod. Lumian lowered his voice and added, I'll help you find that lever blue. Before Leah and the others could respond, he stepped to the side and smiled. Why do you wear the same clothes every day? We can't care too much about appearances when we are out in a foreign land for extended periods, Ryan explained simply, while Leah subconsciously touched the silver bell hanging from her veil. After bidding farewell to Valentine and the others, Lumian walked to Naroka's door. He had to queue for a while before it was finally his turn. Lumian stood by the door and looked at the kitchen ahead. Naroka's corpse had not yet been placed into a coffin. It was lying quietly on a simple bed made of a few benches. Her nails had been trimmed, and her thin white hair was much neater than before. Her face was pale, and her wrinkles deepened the lines on her face. Lumian didn't dare to look at her for too long. Compared to when I saw her before dawn, her face is even whiter, Lumian thought to himself as he made a slight bow before leaving the door. On the way to the cemetery with Raimund, Lumian suddenly slapped his head. Sacred Blue, I forgot to inform Aurora. What are you waiting for? Raimund asked, understanding the importance of keeping Aurora in the loop. Aurora didn't enjoy being out most of the time. She really wasn't kept in the loop if not for her brother. Lumian saw an opportunity and said, Coincidentally, this place isn't far from your place. Lend me your lever blue for two days. A few pages of mine had been gnawed away by rats, so I need to copy it. Okay, Raimund agreed. 
In any case, there was still some time before the burial. Lumian returned home and hid the lever blue before informing Aurora about Naroka's passing. She couldn't help but sigh. As expected, something happened. I wonder if it was caused by that owl. I suspect so too, Lumian agreed, echoing his sister. Aurora tersely acknowledged and said, You must not leave the house after dark. You have to find a way to warn the people who are seeking out the legend of the warlock with you. Lumian had already scared Raimund with Naroka's death, having just asked about the warlock legend two days ago, and instructed him not to go out after dark for the time being. All right, he replied. Naroka is a good person. I'll change my clothes and attend her funeral, Aurora said, walking towards the stairs. Do you want to come with me, or do you want to read some books and do a test set before going? Why am I still doing test sets at a time like this? Lumian couldn't quite understand his sister's train of thought. Considering that he had to compare the levers blue, he said to Aurora, I'll do a paper before I go. Very good. Aurora was rather pleased. After Aurora left, Lumian's expression darkened. He went up to the second floor and entered the study. He took out the lever blue that he had borrowed from Raimund and compared it to the one at home where part of the words had been cut out. Time slowly passed as Lumian pieced together the corresponding words one by one and wrote them on a piece of paper. He made adjustments according to the length of the two sentences, and soon the contents of a possible request for help appeared in front of him. We need help as soon as possible. The people around us are getting weirder. Chapter 21 Response Lumian fell silent, his eyes glued to the restored request for help. Although what he pieced together wasn't necessarily the content of the letter, after all, the words could create other sentences like, the people around us need help as soon as possible, we are getting weirder. He couldn't help but feel a weight pressing down on his heart. In the past, he might have dismissed it as a prank, but too many abnormal things were happening in Cordu, and those were only the ones he noticed. I can't pretend that I didn't see anything, nor can I pretend that nothing happened. Grande Sir said that a person with a normal heart and mind needs to know how to avoid danger. They shouldn't stand under a wall upon discovering that it's about to collapse. He snapped out of his reverie and made up his mind. He couldn't risk staying in Cordu a moment longer. He had to leave with his sister, and he had to do it now. Regarding the abnormality, the officials would undoubtedly handle it. The villagers of Cordu were under their protection, and Lumian had neither the duty nor the capability to take on such a responsibility. In addition, I have to speed up the exploration of the Dream Ruins and strive to obtain superpowers in a short period of time to deal with any accidents that might happen when I leave this place. The urgency of the situation filled him with a sense of imperative that he couldn't ignore. He needed to become much stronger if he wanted to protect his sister and ensure her safety. The last thing he wanted was for her to be implicated in any abnormalities that might erupt before they left Cordu. Keeping his mission in mind, Lumian carefully returned his lever blue to its original place. Then, he snatched up the piece of paper containing the words and sentences from before and strode purposefully down the stairs. He made his way over to the stove and tossed the piece of paper into the hungry flames. Once outside, Lumian wasted no time in making his way straight to Old Tavern. But as he approached the door, he found it tightly shut, a clear indication that the owner and bartender, Maurice Benet, had likely gone to attend Naroka's funeral. Still, Lumian knew that as a part-time hotel, it was impossible to lock all the doors during the day without inconveniencing the guests. So, he headed for a side trail and slipped in through the back door. Climbing up the stairs, Lumian scanned the hallway but saw no one in sight. Thud. 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 Lumian's footsteps echoed as he ascended the stairs to the second floor of the inn. He paused outside the door of the enigmatic woman's room, examining the doorknob for any sign of a do-not-disturb placard. Finding none, he inhaled deeply and exhaled slowly, steadying himself. With a bend of his finger, he rapped lightly on the door. Knock! 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 He knocked three times in a row, but there was no movement inside. Knock! 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 
No answer. Lumian tried again, rapping more firmly this time. He pounded on the door, but the room remained silent. She's not here? Lumian frowned. She went to attend Naroka's funeral? Without wasting a moment, he bolted down the stairs and out of the inn, making a beeline for the cemetery beside the cathedral. En route, he passed by Naroka's house, where the mourners who had said their farewells at the door had dispersed and headed to the cemetery to await the procession. Lumian surveyed the area, his eyes scanning the landscape until he spotted a figure emerging from the house. It was none other than Pons Benet, the younger brother of the Padre. W.H. Lumian's heart skipped a beat as he leaned against the nearby building, trying to remain inconspicuous. Wasn't it strictly forbidden to enter the house of the deceased as it could potentially influence the family's fortunes? Pons Benet stopped in front of Naroka's house and whispered something to Arnold Andre, the old lady's youngest son. After a brief exchange, Pons Benet departed, leaving Arnold to lock up the house and make his way to the cemetery. Naroka's death is indeed a little peculiar. Lumian frowned and muttered to himself silently. He now felt that perhaps the owl wasn't to be blamed for Naroka's death. It was more probable that the Padre's group has something to do with it. The owl might be simply adhering to its duty of taking souls from the dead in Kordu. It just happened to stop on the way and observed Lumian for a while. Of course, Lumian had an even more terrifying guess. What if the Padre's group and the owl are connected? Their peculiarities and clandestine activities could be attributed to the warlock's remains. Before exiting Kordu, I should find an opportunity to share my thoughts with Ryan, Leah, and company. I hope they'll uncover the truth and put an end to the issue expeditiously. Lumian averted his gaze and mumbled to himself as he headed towards the eternal blazing sun cathedral. Despite appearing somber and solemn during the funeral, Lumian kept a watchful eye on each villager, hoping to detect any abnormality in their demeanor. Alas, his efforts yielded no fruit. Nonetheless, he had a sneaking suspicion that some of the villagers were wearing a facade. Additionally, the enigmatic woman who had bestowed upon him the tarot card was nowhere to be found at the cemetery. As the evening descended upon the semi-subterranean two-story abode, Aurora fixed her eyes on her brother, Lumian, and demanded, Where's your script? Let me see it. Lumian's expression turned serious as he replied, I have something to tell you. Aurora scanned his face. Did some wild animal in the village chew your script again? No, Lumian whispered, his voice low. I found out something from those foreigners. Aurora's smile faded as she nodded, gesturing for him to continue. Lumian revealed how Ryan and his gang were snooping around, investigating a letter, and the peculiarity of the lever blue at home. He spoke of his suspicions regarding Madame Puali's and the letter's contents, which he had unearthed using Raimund's lever blue. Finally, he suggested, we have to leave the village as soon as possible and head to Darish. No, Big Or. We'll stay there for a while. Aurora didn't respond right away. She mulled over Lumian's suggestion for more than ten seconds. This is indeed the best choice for now. However, there's a problem. If we suddenly bolt from Kordu while the officials are investigating, won't it draw attention to us? Will they intercept us and make us the focus of their investigation? It's fine if I'm not a beyonder, but I'm an unofficial beyonder. I'll be captured and cleansed by the Inquisition. Lumian was out of his depth, an amateur in a sea of seasoned veterans. The problem at hand was a conundrum that he had never faced before, and for a moment, he was at a loss for words. He finally managed to stutter, so what's the plan? We break out and hide in another city, another country? Oh, Lumian, you are overestimating me, she said. Those three foreigners are more powerful than you think. If there was only one, I might be able to take them on, but three? And what if there's an ambush outside the village? Maybe they're just waiting for us to make a run for it. Lumian was speechless. He had to admit, compared to his sister, he was still green behind the ears. He just didn't have the same level of experience or the sharp attention to detail that she possessed. You're too impulsive, Aurora said, shaking her head. But I suppose that's to be expected. 
After all, what young man doesn't have a bit of fire in his belly? She paused for a moment. Tomorrow morning, you're going to do me a favor. Head over to the administrator's office and help me send a telegram to Novel Weekly. Ask them when their next author salon will be held. Aurora was a beloved columnist for Novel Weekly. Only the administrator and the padre possessed a telegram machine, reserved for emergency communications. The villagers could use it, but at a cost in Verldor. Aurora saw Lumian's confusion and quickly explained her plan. Novel Weekly has been begging me to promote my work in Trier, but I've always refused, including the most recent author Salon. However, if I ask them to invite me now, they'll jump at the chance and even reimburse our train tickets. Our departure will seem ordinary, and even if we're being watched, we won't be suspects. I can temporarily trick them when the time comes. As long as we don't let the abnormality corrupt us, our chances of slipping out of Cordu are high. Lumian breathed a sigh of relief. All right, he said. In just a few seconds, Lumian posed an intriguing question to Aurora. Aurora, ah, grande sir, is beyond a term for people with superpowers? Yes, Aurora replied, choosing not to elaborate any further. However, Aurora then flashed a sly smile and said, So, you're really going to abandon your friends and flee from Cordu? I must have missed the part where that's my problem, Lumian snorted in response. Keeping his sister safe was his top priority at the moment. Aurora clicked her tongue and laughed. Oh, Lumian, you're such a delight. Say that again, would you? How many times have you said that before? And yet, every time, you either quietly offer your help or give them a pretend warning, Aurora continued. Those were trivial matters, Lumian defended himself. However, the abnormality they faced now was a real threat to his sister's safety. Okay, okay, Aurora sighed, not wanting to argue with the kid. Let's get dinner ready. It's your turn to cook today. Lumian grunted tersely and headed towards the stove. The night was dark, the crimson moon obscured by thick clouds. Lumian finished washing up and lay down on the bed. A visible worry crept onto his face. Aurora's response wasn't bad, but Lumian was worried that the anomalies in the village would erupt at any moment while they waited for Novel Weekly's reply. Lumian was desperate to increase his strength and obtaining superpowers in the Dream Ruins seemed like the easiest option. However, he hadn't been able to find that lady all day and didn't have any corresponding suggestions. He was left with no choice but to try it out himself. The situation was like a knocked arrow, ready to fire, and Lumian couldn't afford to hesitate. Without hesitation, Lumian composed himself and slowly drifted off to sleep. Chapter 22 Arrangements Lumian awoke to the world shrouded in a faint, gray fog. With practiced ease, he bounded out of bed and rushed to the window. His gaze fell upon the mountain, a towering behemoth of brownish-red stones and reddish-brown soil that loomed in the wilderness beyond. Despite its modest size, a mere twenty or thirty meters tall, the mountain seemed to stretch endlessly upwards, piercing the very heavens themselves. Lumian found himself using the words mountain peak to describe it, so profound was its impact on him. Beneath its massive frame, the ruins of dilapidated structures encircled the desolate wilderness, stacked atop one another, layer upon layer. Judging by the shotgun-wielding monster's build, I'd say it's highly skilled in both running and jumping. It also appears to possess a degree of intelligence, capable of wielding a weapon as complex as a shotgun. It has incredibly strong tracking abilities, and I can't discount the possibility that it possesses some sort of superpowers, much like Aurora. As Lumian focused his mind, details of the target began to surface. His initial judgment was grim, if he attempted to face the monster with the shotgun, his chance of survival was a meager 10%. And if he tried to utilize his special trait, it would only hasten his demise. His meditation was a double-edged sword, it pushed him to the brink of death, making him vulnerable to even the slightest strike from the enemy. Sneak attacks and assassinations were not viable options either. The other party possessed an uncanny ability to track his movements, rendering any attempts at stealth futile. 
Plus, Lumian lacked the necessary equipment to mount a ranged assault. A revolver would have been a godsend. For the past two days, Lumian had racked his brains trying to come up with a plan. And finally, a solution presented itself, traps. He had ventured deep into the mountains with the village hunters, where he mastered the art of setting traps. Since then, Lumian had become a pro at pulling off a few practical jokes. Lumian's initial plan was to use oil as a weapon. His idea was to fill a large bucket with oil, tie a rope to it, and hide it somewhere high. When his target approached, he would yank the rope, causing the bucket to tip over, drenching the unsuspecting victim with oil. Then, he would light a torch and toss it at them. However, after some deliberation, he gave up on the idea. On the premise that the creature had strong tracking abilities, he knew he had to overestimate its sense of smell. The smell of oil was quite obvious, and if he used other stronger smells to cover it up, he wasn't sure if the other party would react differently. The monster might even be able to distinguish even the slightest abnormality, like wild dogs. In the end, Lumian chose to dig a deep pit and plant stakes at the bottom. He knew that there was a certain problem with this plan. With the tracking abilities displayed by the monster, there was a high chance that it would discover the anomaly in advance and see through the trap. Lumian's response was to find a way to exploit its blind spots and lower its guard. His weapons were inferior to the creatures, but he hoped his intelligence could give him the upper hand. As a human, he had one advantage, his brain. At least from our last encounter, it possesses a certain degree of intelligence, albeit not quite that high. Lumian comforted himself. But he refused to let this lull him into a false sense of security. He would plan assuming that the creature had the cognitive abilities of an average human being. Someone like Pons Benet. No, that guy's IQ is lower than a pile of rocks. If it weren't for all his goons, I'd have him bowing down to me and calling me daddy. After a moment of contemplation, Lumian raised his expectations of the monster. Yes, treat it like an uneducated padre. He gazed out the window again, his eyes fixated on the wilderness between his dwelling and the ruins. This place was closer to the safe zone making it the ideal location for his hideout. However, there was no cover, leaving everything exposed in plain sight, making it unsuitable for an ambush. It's fine to dig a trap, but if I use myself as bait, the other party will be able to spot me from a distance and shoot me. It won't need to come over at all. Lumian muttered, contemplating whether to take the risk of entering the ruins to set up a trap. His plan took shape rapidly, with one thing left to confirm. It would take a lot of time to dig a deep pit and plant stakes below. Lumian couldn't expect the other party to wait until he was done. After a moment's reflection, Lumian opened his arms and made an embrace the sun gesture. He prayed more fervently than ever before. My God, my Father, please bless me and aid me in dealing with that monster. Praise the sun. There was no 100% certainty for most things in the world. Lumian didn't hesitate for a moment. He grabbed the pitchfork and axe from the bedroom and proceeded to the study. Considering the target's weapon, Lumian knew he had to switch up his protection gear. He shed his cotton clothes and lashed hardbound books to his chest and back with a rope. This was makeshift paper armor. He vaguely remembered his sister warning him about the potential for internal injuries, but he couldn't afford to worry about that now. He stretched to make sure the weight of the books wouldn't impede his fighting abilities, then donned his leather jacket and headed down to the ground floor to gather materials for his trap. Not long after, Lumian's grip tightened on the shovel and bundle of ropes at his waist, one for climbing and the other for crafting rope nets to replace the tree branches. He breathed deeply, steeling himself for what lay ahead, and gripped the iron axe in his right hand as he opened the door. A faint gray fog crept through the wilderness as Lumian approached the mountain, the peak now dyed in blood. Lumian made his way through the eerie silence, creeping towards the edge of the ruins. With caution, he walked a distance to the side and tossed a shovel, pitchfork, ropes, and other gear into a dark corner of a collapsed building. With only his trusty axe in hand, he returned to the spot where he had entered the ruins. Moving quietly and deliberately, Lumian crept deeper into the ruins without drawing attention to himself. 
When he finally reached the spot where the three-faced monster had scared him off last time, he paused for nearly a minute before turning back. Halfway there, he began to detour, circling back towards the collapsed house where he had stored his tools. As he approached, Lumian scanned the terrain, searching for a suitable location to set up his trap. There's a relatively wide and short crevice here. With a little modification, it'll make an excellent trap and save me precious time. As for the other one, well, that might take a while. But I'll just have to hope the monster won't find me too quickly. Lumian retrieved his shovel and other gear, turned back to the chosen location, and set to work. After modifying the crevice, Lumian wielded his axe and sliced off a jagged piece of wood, then inserted it into the trap's base. He crafted a net from rope, draping it over the trap before covering it with soil, ensuring that it blended seamlessly with its surroundings. With everything in place, he began to mimic the monster tracking him. If this creature is as perceptive as I think it is, it will sense the trap and avoid it, perhaps leaping over it in a single bound. However, it would inevitably reach this spot. I need to be here, so it spots me the moment it arrives. Lumian measured the distance with his feet and confirmed his line of sight before settling on a relatively intact wall. He squatted there and confirmed his line of sight. Then he began to dig a second trap. This was a trap specifically designed for normal humans. Lumian knew that when someone had managed to track down their target and easily realized that the other party had laid a trap for them, only to discover that the enemy was lying in wait nearby, they'd probably get cocky. Their thirst for success would overwhelm them, and they'd ignore the possibility of a second trap, eagerly lunging at their prey. It was a classic flaw of people with pedestrian intelligence. Lumian just prayed that the monster didn't possess the average IQ of a human. If it did, he had no choice but to bolt. Odds were he'd be ensnared and left to die in the wild, with a slim chance of making it back to his house and hiding in the safe zone. Koru's abnormality had forced him to make a dangerous choice. With every passing moment, Lumian grew increasingly wary. Even though he had set up the second trap, the monster with the shotgun had yet to make an appearance. The same held true for the other monsters. At last, Lumian began to relax. After stowing away his shovel and other supplies, he stood tall, spreading his arms wide. Praise the sun, he exclaimed with renewed vigor. Lumian shrank back against the wall and fell to his knee, his eyes fixated on the first trap. There was no clear line of sight to the path he took, obstructed by a collapsed building looming in his way. He waited there, patiently, his heart thumping in his chest. Lumian could feel the adrenaline pumping through his veins, and the sensation was unprecedented. As a vagrant, Lumian had encountered his fair share of enemies who were bigger and brawnier than him. But they weren't looking to off him, they just wanted his grub, dough, and a decent spot to catch some Zs. Even if someone happened to die in the scuffle, it was chalked up to an unfortunate accident. But now, the adversary he was up against was a monstrous creature that didn't abide by human laws or morals. And it was exponentially stronger than Lumian. Hell, it might even possess a few superpowers. If his scheme went sideways, the outcome was all but certain. Thump, thump, thump. Lumian's heart was about to leap out of his chest. Everyone wanted to live the good life, and Lumian was no exception. Breathe in, breathe out. Breathe in, breathe out. Lumian tried to take deep breaths to steady his nerves, but it wasn't helping. Lumian hoped the monster would appear sooner, though he dreaded its arrival. On the one hand, it could bring a quick resolution to this situation, regardless of whether the outcome was positive or negative. At least then he wouldn't be as anxious as he was now, almost at the point of breaking down. On the other hand, fear gripped him tightly. Realizing that he couldn't go on like this, he reminded himself, I can't burden Aurora with my fears. With that, he attempted to meditate, focusing all his energy on the task. Although it proved more challenging than before, Lumian eventually managed to outline the crimson sun in his mind. The mere sight of it eased his nerves somewhat, yet he still trembled with fear. Suddenly, he heard a faint rustling sound. It was as if a shepherd was approaching quietly through a nearby pasture, hidden from view. 
Chapter 23 Combat Intelligence Lumian's senses were on high alert. He wasn't as scared as before now that things were finally happening. Despite his body still quivering, he felt more in control and less likely to collapse. I should have died five years ago. It's all thanks to Aurora that I'm still alive. These past five years were a free lunch. What's there to be afraid of? Lumian muttered to himself, gritting his teeth and mustering up courage. In the blink of an eye, the already dim light illuminating the first trap's surface grew even fainter. A shadowy figure emerged, blocking the light that pierced through the dense fog in the sky. The figure loomed in the distance, a hulking beast with blood-red eyes and greasy black hair. Half human and half beast, it was armed with a shotgun on its back, ready for anything. Its front knees bent as it surveyed the ground before it. A moment later, the beast, wearing a dark jacket and muddy pants, removed its shotgun and jumped, controlling the vertical extent of its jump to leap over the trap and land on the solid, cracked ground. It turned its greasy black-haired head and saw a slight movement. Then, the monster spotted Lumian, who had a panicked expression and was trying to hide behind a wall. With a low growl, the beast jumped up high again and pounced on its target. It landed a slight distance away from where Lumian had been, to prevent him from turning around and dealing a fatal blow before it could stabilize itself. Lumian fumbled his way around the wall, disappearing from view. As soon as the monster landed, the soil beneath its feet gave way, and it plummeted along with the dirt and rope net into a deep pit that had suddenly appeared. Thud! The sound of something heavy crashing to the ground echoed through the abandoned building, accompanied by a screech resembling that of a rat. Lumian, who had concealed himself behind the wall, couldn't suppress the thrill surging through him upon witnessing the sight. The first step had been accomplished. With most of his fear evaporating, he seized the pitchfork by his side and dashed towards the trap. The skinless monster's formidable tenacity had left an indelible impression on Lumian. Moreover, his quarry had a shotgun, so he refrained from exposing himself above the deep hole. Instead, he aimed the pitchfork from a distance and thrust it into the pit. In a sudden turn of events, the pitchfork plunged and halted abruptly. Immediately, an intense force reverberated through the pitchfork, yanking Lumian into the trap with brute force. Caught off guard, Lumian tumbled forward. He didn't bother inspecting the pit's bottom. Discarding the pitchfork, he spun around and lunged towards the still-standing wall. Bang! The impact hit Lumian like a freight train, knocking him off his feet. Blood, with a distinct metallic taste, surged up in his throat. With a thud, he hit the ground, tumbling a few times before he regained his footing. In the same instant, he caught sight of the monstrous creature, part human, part beast, emerging from the deep pit. It held a single-barreled shotgun in its hand, its body torn open, revealing a grotesque display of wounds. A sickening mixture of dark red and pale yellow liquid poured out, as its insides spilled out. Despite being badly injured by Lumian's trap, the creature had not lost its ability to fight. As it tumbled into the pit, it managed to contort its body just enough to avoid a fatal blow. The creature's legs and arms were also still functional, allowing it to break free from the trap. Without a moment's hesitation, Lumian bolted for the ruins nearby. It wasn't a spontaneous decision, he had a plan in mind. He knew there was a chance the trap wouldn't completely incapacitate the monster, leaving it with enough strength to fight back. In the event that the trap failed, Lumian's contingency plan was to use the environment to his advantage. He'd play a game of cat and mouse, buying time for the beast to succumb to its wounds. Its reaction time and strength would weaken considerably, and Lumian could strike when the opportunity presented itself. Bang! Another shot rang out, followed by the sound of soil splattering as leads appeared at the spot where Lumian had been standing. He quickly took cover behind a half-collapsed wall and crawled on all fours to the other side of the ruins. Suddenly, he heard the sound of wind blowing in the air. The monster had jumped over. Lumian swiftly pivoted and crawled back behind the half-collapsed wall through a gap. He made the most of the special conditions of the collapsed buildings, hiding at times and circling around at others, dodging the monster's attacks without engaging in a direct fight. 
Hide and seek was Lumian's forte, honed through past pranks where he used this innate ability to escape getting beaten up on the spot. As the cat and mouse game continued, Lumian gradually found himself panting, while the monster's running speed, jumping height, strength, and reaction speed had clearly weakened. Just a little longer, just a little longer. I still can't defeat it now. Lumian retreated back to his previous location, leaning against the half-collapsed wall and trying to control his urge to immediately counterattack. Bang! Suddenly, he felt a massive blow to his back, sending him flying forward. The half-collapsed wall and rocks behind him exploded into a million pieces, raining down around him as he crashed to the ground. The monster hadn't chased after him, instead choosing to body-slam into the obstacles in its way. The already shaky half-collapsed wall couldn't withstand the brunt of its full force and collapsed completely. Crimson blood gushed out of the creature's wounds, pooling on the ground in a grotesque display. Despite being caught off guard, Lumian's reflexes were quick. He rolled out of harm's way and sought cover behind a pile of rubble. Bang! The monster's shotgun blast missed him by a hair's breadth. Having slammed into the wall, the monster struggled to regain its footing. It fumbled with the cloth bag strapped to its waist, only to find it empty. With a snarl, it hurled the shotgun aside and lunged at Lumian. Lumian had already darted to a new hiding spot for a continued game of cat and mouse. Of course, he couldn't keep up this game forever. The monster might slip away if he waited too long, and the noise could attract others of its kind. As he circled around the area, he noticed that the monster seemed to be slowing down. Here's the chance. With a quick decision, Lumian pretended to make an escape towards a collapsed building. Once there, he stood firm, drew his axe from his back, and took a moment to catch his breath. In a flash, the monster rounded the corner and stood in front of Lumian. Without hesitation, Lumian raised his axe and charged forward. He stepped towards the creature, turning his body sideways and lowering his shoulder. He planned to body slam the monster, a move his sister had taught him, and then slash at its neck. Bam! Lumian took a step forward, leaning his body against the monster's chest, but the creature didn't budge. Lumian was surprised by its unyielding stance. He tried to push harder, but the monster remained like a thick wall. What? Lumian's heart tightened, and he bounced back. He was about to pounce to the ground and try to escape the monster's attack range. In a flash, the monster lunged forward and clutched Lumian's neck in a death grip. It didn't look like it was having trouble moving at all. Lumian gasped in shock as he was hoisted into the air, his neck throbbing with pain. Sacred Blue, I've been tricked! He exclaimed, his mind reeling. A creaking sound filled the air, and the world spun around him, making his head swim. His axe had missed its target and was now knocked off to the side. Lumian finally realized that he had been outsmarted by the monster. Despite being in dire straits, the creature had enough strength to fight. It had cunningly faked weakness, luring him into attacking instead of staying hidden. Lumian had underestimated its combat intelligence, and now he found himself in a desperate situation. The monster was clearly at the end of its rope, as evidenced by its inability to snap Lumian's neck. But this was just a temporary respite. The creature still had enough energy left to finish the job. As his neck threatened to snap and his breathing grew more ragged, Lumian felt his mind begin to go blank. Blank. As Lumian teetered on the brink of death, the lady's words suddenly resurfaced in his mind. She wanted him to use what's special about him in the dream. Special trait. His thoughts were nearly blank, and so he quickly seized the opportunity to meditate. The red sun instantly appeared in his mind. Unlike his previous attempt at meditation to calm his emotions, where the sun disappeared as soon as it was formed, this time he focused on keeping it in existence. Suddenly, a voice from above, infinitely high, pierced his skull. The pain was excruciating, and Lumian felt as though his heart might burst from his chest. He forgot about the monster's vice grip on his neck and the fact that he was struggling to breathe. Suddenly, he fell to the ground with a sickening thud. The strange sound that had accompanied his meditation disappeared, but the pain remained, almost unbearable. 
he was unable to take stock of his surroundings or even assess the damage done to his body. After an unknown amount of time, the near-death sensation subsided. Lumian didn't bother checking his neck, instead, he placed his hands on the ground and lifted his head. The beast was squatting nearby, half-human and half-beast, with its head drooping and its arms outstretched in front of it. Lumian noticed its wounds still seeping with blood mixed with a yellow liquid, and the creature's body quivered uncontrollably. What's wrong with it? Was it scared silly by the specialness I displayed? He picked up his fallen axe and took a step towards the monster. Without hesitation, he held the axe with both hands and swung it at the back of the beast's neck. The axe sank deeply into the creature's muscles and came to a halt at its bones. Lumian used all his strength to remove the axe, then continued his assault, slashing at the monster's neck once, twice, thrice. Finally, the beast's head detached from its body with a sickening splash, rolling to the side. The body held on for a moment longer, barely clinging to life. No resistance, just trembles. And then, with a sudden jerk, Lumian's body contorted, his hands releasing their tight grip, letting the bloodied axe slide down with a sickening squelch. Huff. Puff. Huff. He could finally catch his breath. Chapter 24, Gains Lumian didn't have the luxury of resting for too long. He had to keep moving, for fear that other monsters might come. After taking a moment to catch his breath, he endured the pain in his neck and back and slowly approached the monster's corpse. He held the axe tightly in his right hand, ready to strike again if the creature wasn't fully dead. After cautiously searching the body with his left hand, he found three copper coins called Lick and an empty cloth bag. That's it? Lumian muttered to himself, disappointed that he hadn't found anything related to superpowers. If it wasn't for that, would he have risked his life fighting this monster? If Lumian wasn't special in the dream, he would have been nothing more than the monster's meal. He propped himself up and looked towards the shotgun monster's head that had rolled to the side, praying that what he was searching for was there. In that moment, a deep crimson glow materialized over the monster's body. They resembled fireflies, gradually converging towards a single spot in an unyielding fashion. Lumian gawked in disbelief, as a sense of elation began to well up inside of him. This phenomenon had to be connected to superpowers. Without much delay, a sticky, dark red substance materialized on the monster's chest, and no additional light specks came into view. Lumian cautiously crouched down and made a grab for the blob. It was incredibly slippery, slipping through his grasp twice before he finally managed to hold it in his palm. It's remarkably lightweight, yet possesses a certain texture and elasticity. The surface feels as smooth as glass. What the hell is this? Lumian muttered to himself, realizing once more that he was completely illiterate when it came to matters of the mystical. In the midst of hushed whispers, Lumian caught a whiff of something strange and dark red that reeked of blood. His impatience grew, and an indescribable malice took over his body. For a moment, he wanted nothing more than to raise his axe and hack at the monster's corpse until his violent emotions were spent. But Aurora's warning about the dangers of pursuing superpowers echoed in his mind, and he quickly reined in his impulses. He had taken precautions to monitor himself and remain vigilant at all times, and he wouldn't let his guard down now. It affects my mind? Lumian tossed the dark red blob into the cloth bag he had found on the monster. The moment he lost contact with it, he felt a wave of calm wash over him, dissipating the remaining excitement of the death match. His body still trembled slightly, but he was back in control. As expected. Lumian whispered happily as he returned to his senses. He tied the cloth bag tightly and secured it to his belt buckle. After a moment's consideration, Lumian withdrew the cloth bag and stowed it safely in the inner pocket of his leather jacket. It provided him a sense of assurance and minimized the chances of losing it. As the buttons on his clothes were undone, the book that had been plastered to Lumian's back lost its support and hit the ground. It was riddled with potholes and in tatters, a far cry from its former state. 
Lumian recognized it as the mock examination papers for higher education admission exercise book that his sister Aurora had prepared for him. This was the same book that had saved his life by blocking a shotgun attack. Of course, this single book didn't deserve all the credit. Lumian picked up the exercise book and sauntered back to the monster's lifeless body, a wry smile on his face. See, knowledge is indeed power, he said, intending to throw it at the monster's face. But then he hesitated, recalling the countless hours Aurora had spent writing it. He couldn't bring himself to toss it away. Instead, he tucked the exercise book into his belt, dragged the monster's corpse to the trap, and flung it inside. Lumian kicked the monster's head for good measure. With the battlefield cleared, Lumian gathered his tools, including the empty shotgun, his pitchfork, and shovel, and retreated into the wilderness. He looked over his shoulder as he walked, ever vigilant. Eventually, he made it back to his house, climbed the stairs, and entered his bedroom. It was only then that he truly relaxed. The agony that had been gnawing at his body, the obvious discomfort, and the overwhelming exhaustion all erupted at once. He slumped down on the bed, taking a moment to recover. But he didn't want to sleep just yet. He needed to assess the damage. Lumian stripped off his clothes and walked over to the wardrobe, checking himself out in the full-body mirror. His neck was swollen, and the five bloody finger marks on it had turned an ominous shade of bluish-black. His back was bruised, and there were countless scrapes and cuts all over his body. Even some of my injuries are internal, just like Aurora had warned me. I wonder if I'll recover by the next time I come in. He couldn't help but reflect on the battle. It was a failure, but not a total failure. In the first half of the battle, he gave himself a pat on the back. Not only did he make full use of the monster's low IQ to lead it into the second trap, but he also followed his original plan to a T. It was a game of cat and mouse, and he played it to perfection. He dragged the monster out until it was on the brink of surrendering to its injuries. However, his lack of experience was his downfall. Instead of throwing in heavy rocks, he chose to stab the monster with a pitchfork at the bottom of the pit. In the second half of the battle, he was overconfident and underestimated the monster's intelligence. His insufficient combat experience made him fall into the monster's trap, which almost got him killed. That performance would have been a disaster. Thankfully, his earlier successes had pushed the monster to its limit, and it didn't kill him quickly enough. This gave him a chance to complete his meditation and summon his special trait. Before this battle, Lumian had not expected the special trait to have such a powerful effect. It caused the monster to descend into uncontrollable fear, one so unbreakable despite suffering attacks. He had worried that the near-death state brought about by summoning the special trait would make him vulnerable to attack. But it turned out to be special and very strong. As Lumian sighed, he had a revelation. The monsters in the ruins avoided his house and made it a safe zone because there was something even more terrifying inside. It could be the owner of the mysterious voice he heard when he summoned the special trait. Lumian gasped at the thought. His subconscious urged him to search every corner of the house for the terrifying thing, but he quickly dismissed the idea. Provoking the being that even the shotgun-wielding monster was helpless against was not an option. For now, all was calm and peaceful, and it was best to keep it that way. He had to maintain the current state of the safe house and not uncover the shroud. Each passing day was a day, and as for the dangers that may lie ahead, he would face them when the time came. Not until then, not until I become a beyonder and gain significant power. Lumian cast his gaze at the cloth bag in his left hand. Even as Lumian examined his injuries in the mirror, shirtless, he refused to let go of the source of superpowers. He had worked too hard to obtain it. How should I use this thing? He asked himself, opening the cloth bag and staring at the dark red blob within. The blob lay still at the bottom of the bag, its form unstable yet clearly not alive. Lumian, who knew nothing of mysticism, wondered if he should eat it, perform a ritual to merge with it or offer it to some secret entity. He only knew of the latter two options from reading Hidden Veil. Vale. In the past, he would have only thought of one thing, eat. Lumian didn't rush to make a decision. 
he intended to seek counsel from the enigmatic lady at Old Tavern first. He was convinced that the woman would provide him with clues on how to harness the power of the dark red sphere and gain superhuman abilities. Lumian sensed that the other party had a reason for doing so, despite not knowing what it was. If things didn't pan out, he could still count on his sister for help. After dressing leisurely, Lumian stowed the lump of crimson in his coat pocket, along with all the cash he'd acquired. Finally, he collapsed onto the bed, too drained to move. Despite the agony in his neck, back, and body, overwhelming fatigue seized him, and he drifted off to sleep in a flash. As Lumian opened his eyes, he was blinded by the sunlight that had already penetrated the curtains, illuminating the entire room. Slowly sitting up, he felt sore all over, as if he had been pummeled in a dream. I was indeed beaten up badly. The injuries in the dream really get reflected into reality, but there's an obvious level of weakening. Trying to move around, he felt his muscles aching a little but was ultimately relieved that he wasn't too affected. However, when he reached into his pockets, nothing. Nothing at all. Lumian failed to exit with the crimson blob. His expression became solemn, his brows knitted tightly. Lumian didn't know what to do. The crimson blob, an item that promised superpowers, hadn't followed him into reality. This was different from what the mysterious woman at Old Tavern had said. Lumian gathered himself, quickly changed his clothes, and left his room. As he walked down the hall, he noticed that the door to the washroom was wide open. Aurora was facing the mirror, brushing her teeth with a serious look on her face. Morning, Lumian greeted. It's not early anymore. You got up late. Aurora muttered incoherently. Splat. Her blonde hair, tied back into a ponytail, flicked about as she spit out the liquid in her mouth. She turned to look at Lumian. What did you do wrong last night? That owl is outside. How would I dare go out? Lumian responded calmly. That's true. Aurora dropped the topic and said, remember to take five Verldor to the administrator to send a telegram later. Lumian nodded. This was the key to their escape from Kordu and it was something he would never forget. After breakfast, Lumian headed straight to the village square where the administrator's office was located in a two-story building. Upon reaching the office, Lumian discovered that Administrator Beast had yet to arrive, but the rest of the staff had already commenced their day's work. Lumian paid the required fee and promptly sent a telegram. After concluding his business, Lumian turned on his heel and began walking towards the old tavern. It was highly unlikely that the enigmatic woman was already up and about, but Lumian was more than happy to bide his time. His pursuit of superpowers had been a prolonged one, so a few more ticks on the clock didn't faze him. Chapter 25 Sequences and Potions Lumian sauntered into Old Tavern, his sharp eyes scanning the dimly lit room. To his surprise, the mysterious woman was already seated in her usual corner, enjoying a lavish breakfast spread. She had changed her attire yet again, donning a long brown, pleated dress and a dark velvet hat that screamed high society. So early? Lumian approached her table, calming his racing heart. The woman looked up, meeting his gaze. Is there a possibility that I didn't sleep all night? Perhaps. Lumian knew this routine all too well, his sister, Aurora, often pulled all-nighters when deadlines were looming. But what was the reason for the enigmatic woman raising this up? As he glanced at her table, he found a delectable spread, with a cream souffle sprinkled with nuts, a muffin that looked scrumptious, a croissant, a cup of black coffee, and a cat tongue biscuit. What an appetite! Lumian thought, impressed. But how can Korda provide such luxurious cuisine? Only Aurora or the chefs and the administrator's family could whip up something like this. It's all dessert, Lumian said, taking a seat opposite her. The woman nodded, her expression serious for once. Intus's desserts are indeed not bad, and there's quite a lot of variety. Even if I have some for breakfast every day, it'll take me a month without repetition to finish them all, she said biting into the cat tongue biscuit and closing her eyes in bliss. That's one of the purposes of traveling. 
Lumian seized the moment to probe the woman's background. You're not from Intus, he asked. The woman smiled enigmatically. I'm from Lowen, but given the current situation, this isn't important. What else did Lowen have to offer besides steam machinery, factories, and a large army? Lumian, being an Intision, couldn't help but recall the mocking words that everyone used to taunt the Lowen kingdom, reclining chairs, mint sauce, fried fish and potatoes, and pure snake fruit beer. But he quickly brushed off the thought and turned his attention to the task at hand. I got rid of the monster with the shotgun. The woman took a sip of coffee and nodded approvingly. Not bad. Lumian sensed a strange emotion emanating from her eyes. He couldn't shake off the strange feeling that he had sensed in their previous interactions. There was something about her that he couldn't quite put his finger on, a mix of facetiousness and hidden emotions that intrigued him. Undeterred, he pressed on with the matter at hand. I obtained an abnormal dark red object from that monster. Holding it makes me irritable and filled with hostility. I think it involves supernatural powers, but it didn't follow me to reality, he explained. The woman smiled enigmatically. After going in and out so many times, don't you realize that other than your own physical condition, you can't bring anything else over? Lumian was taken aback. Didn't you say that supernatural things are excluded? He trailed off, realizing that he was out of his depth. Lumian couldn't shake off the physical discomfort that lingered from his dream, along with the vivid memories that refused to fade away. After careful consideration, he posed a question. You mean that after obtaining supernatural powers through the crimson blob and turning oneself into a beyonder, the corresponding state that is different from that of a normal person can be brought to reality? Not a lost cause, she replied nonchalantly, savoring the cream souffle. But won't the corresponding strength weaken because of this? Lumian pressed, his brow furrowing. The injuries I suffered in the dream are much lighter in reality. The conditions brought about by Beyonder characteristics won't change, the woman explained, meeting Lumian's gaze. This is why I said that extraordinary items are excluded. Beyonder characteristics. Lumian mulled over the term, trying to piece together what his sister had told him about Beyonders. Obtaining such characteristics would allow one to become a Beyonder, he surmised. And based on the woman's explanation, he had a hunch about the unique nature of his dream. That ruin, it's real. Or maybe it was once real, but now it's sunk deep into some big shot's dream and been left to fester. In my dream, it's like a secret passageway. A passageway that's only accessible through the symbols on my chest, and leads straight to that ruin. Based on my theory, my home in the dream is like a mark left behind by our interaction. It's a reflection of the place where I feel safest, deep in my subconscious. That's why it looks nothing like the wilderness or the ruins that surround it. It's like we're in two different worlds, me and the monsters. But those monsters, they can't come in. They're stuck in the real ruins while my home is a mix of dream and reality. Only those with the special symbols can pass through the corresponding barrier. The symbols only work for me, and they record the state of my body before I'm brought back to reality. When I wake up, the things that don't involve the supernatural will fade away, but the implications will remain. Even death will work the same way. So there shouldn't be anything scary waiting for me at home in the dream. But the origin of those symbols and the source of that terrifying voice, they symbolize something dark and horrific. Lumian sat in silence, watching the lady across from him leisurely devour her breakfast. She didn't seem to mind. Lumian finally asked, regaining his composure, may I ask how I should use that dark red blob? Is it the beyonder characteristic you mentioned? At the critical moment, he could not help but address her respectfully. The lady set down her coffee and looked at him. I can give you a potion formula. Just follow it. The generous gift made Lumian uneasy. Why are you helping me? The lady laughed. Would you believe me if I said it was arranged by fate? No. Lumian subconsciously replied inwardly. The abnormality in the village, the pressure of the impending storm, and the desire for superpowers all swirled around Lumian, threatening to overwhelm him. He pushed his unease down and spoke in a low voice, I do. 
opportunities like this didn't come around often, and Lumian knew he had to act decisively. He couldn't afford to hesitate or have second thoughts. The lady's smile grew wider, the unclear emotions he had detected in her eyes earlier intensifying. She pulled out a stack of post-it notes and a silver fountain pen from her black lady's purse and began writing. Finally, she stopped and tore off the top note and handed it to him. Lumian snatched it from her hand and read it quickly. Hunter Potion Formula, Main Ingredient, 100 Beyond Her Characteristic, Supplementary Ingredients, 80 milliliters of red wine, 1 red chestnut flower, can be a specimen or substituted with 10 drops of the corresponding essential oil, 5 grams of poplar tree leaf powder, 10 grams of basil, usage, drink it directly. Satisfied with his memorization, Lumian carefully folded the note and slipped it into his brown jacket. Done with that, he asked, unable to contain his curiosity, what does Hunter mean? Hunter in the supernatural sense? The corresponding sequence, the lady replied, taking a casual sip of her coffee. You do not know much about mysticism, so let me explain. There are 22 common pathways in the world. To access them, you must obtain ingredients with the corresponding beyonder characteristics and concoct potions. Each pathway has 10 sequences, numbered from 9 to 0. The lower the number, the higher the level, and the stronger the ability. The beyonder characteristic you obtain belongs to the Red Priest pathway. It can only be used to concoct the corresponding sequence 9 Hunter Potion. Lumian listened attentively and blurted out, then what sequence does my sister Aurora belong to? She's a sequence 7 warlock of the mystery prior pathway, the lady replied coolly. She did not mention how she knew. Aurora is already at sequence 7? That's true. She has already obtained supernatural powers for several years. I'll only be at sequence 9 after consuming the potion. I'm still quite a distance from her. I only hope that I won't be a burden when we escape Cordu in the future. Lumian couldn't help but ask, can I drink higher sequence beyond her potions directly? Or should I drink sequence 9 today and sequence 8 tomorrow? Theoretically, yes. The lady added after Lumian revealed a look of joy, however, most who attempt it end up dead or as a monster. Fewer than 1 in 10 million people succeed. Turn into monsters? Lumian was alarmed. The lady chuckled and said, Didn't your sister warn you about the dangers of the path to transcendence? After drinking the potion, if you can't control the power, you'll either die from a physical breakdown or transform into a monster. Why do you think the one you encountered was in human form? No wonder. Lumian finally understood what danger his sister was talking about. But he was willing to face it. Is there no way to reduce this danger? he asked. The lady considered him for a moment before answering, there is. You need a firm will, good physical condition, and some luck. As for the rest, you don't need to know. You're still on the first potion. Good physical condition. Lumian, who had planned on returning to catch up on sleep and drink the potion later, frowned. He was still seriously injured in the dream. The lady opposite him nodded slightly and said, Take your time. Wait until nightfall and your body has mostly recovered before diving back into your dreams. Ah. Uh. Lumian's mind raced with questions. So as long as my body in reality is almost healed, the injuries in my dream will completely recover? One had to know that his body in reality was only a little sore. It was completely different from the injuries in the dream. Yes. The lady confirmed Lumian's guess. She continued, there's much to learn about the potion and the paths of the divine. I'll tell you once you become a hunter. The paths of the divine. Lumian asked in puzzlement, why not tell me now? The lady laughed. If you die or become a monster, it would be a waste of my time to say so much now. Dot. Lumian was speechless. Lumian stood up and excused himself. But before he left, he asked one more thing. Do you know about the anomaly in the village? 